Hello and welcome to Hack Sussex 2023. We are here at our lovely Chichester building on the University of Sussex campus, home to our informatics department, of course. And today, of course, could not be possible without our lovely sponsors. We have EDF, as you can see from the flags behind us. We have Electric Square. BCS, the British Computing Society, have also donated as well as our university ourselves. We've also got help from GitHub, from Overleaf, and we've got some drinks coming from Red Bull. And of course, we are partnered with Hackathons UK and Major League Hacking this year. Now, my name is Josh. We are about to get started very, very soon. So real quick, I'm just going to tell you what to expect for today. We have our opening ceremony starting at 11 o'clock. Hacking begins at 12. Uh, 2 o'clock, we have our workshop with EDF, which is Energy Trading. I have forgotten half of the title of that workshop, but it does sound amazing. Um, then we have the SNCC Cybersecurity Workshop with MLH um, 3.30. 4.30, we have a cup stacking thing, which unfortunately people online can't take part in. It's very hard to set up little robots to move the cups around for everyone through Discord. So instead, we're just going to stream that for you. Following that, we have a Bob Ross MS Paint workshop, which is going to be disastrous fun, also with MLH on that one. Then we have our Minecraft servers opening at 10 o'clock. The stream today will end at midnight, and we'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 8. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon at the opening ceremony. I'm one of the organisers for your hackathon this year. Um, this is my second year running Hack Sussex, um, and we're very excited to bring you the next um, iteration of Hack Sussex Hackathon. Um, right, let's get you all registered. For the online registration, you must send your tickets over to the Hack Sussex Discord account. Um, that's Hack Sussex hashtag 3825. Um, you will need to message your ticket QR code to be scanned, and we will sign you all in from there. This is needed for your project submission, so if you can't, sub if you can't get your ticket submitted, you will not be able to post on DevPost. Um, if you can't find your ticket, please message the Help Desk channel on Discord, and they'll be able to sign you in manually without your ticket, as long as you've registered beforehand. Um, you should already have created a DevPost account, so join the hack on the DevPost account. The link will be in the Discord. You will need this to submit your hacks. So without this, you won't be able to take part in the hack. And again, if you haven't got a ticket, unfortunately, you'll just have to follow along. We cannot take any more people that are unticketed on the online submission. Discord will be your main way to interact with us on stream, so feel free to say hi. There is the HS Live channel on Discord. Um, I'll be answering your questions throughout the stream. Um, so make sure to throw them in there, and I'll definitely get through them. Um, teams should either enter all in person or all online. Um, we won't be taking hybrid teams for the in-person tracks, so if you are a split team, you will have to only submit for the online tracks. We currently have Jackbox in the Welcome Lecture Theatre, so if you want to join that online, we'll be moving over to that shortly. And if there's any questions, as I say, do message the HS Live channel and we will go through them. So for all you online hackers, um, it'll be interesting to know where you're all from, where you're all participating from. Um, if you'd like to uh, message in the HS Live channel, I'll be able to go through them. Um, I've just opened up the stream chat as well, so I'll be going through your questions here. Uh, the workshops will be presented live, so we'll be showing them on stream um, as they're happening um, here in person. So you will be able to see the workshop content online and take part as well. Participating from Tokyo. So we have Jude joining us from Tokyo. That might be our furthest participant yet. Very impressive. Jude happens to be one of our previous committee members, so shout out to Jude. Is there a prize for furthest away participant? Um, I can't promise anything, but maybe we might be able to provide something for that. Is anyone going to challenge Tokyo? <laughs> Any advice for a first time in a hackathon? Well, um, there's a lot of guidance in the opening ceremony, so we'll go into that shortly. Um, but first time hackathon, I'd say just get yourself settled, get yourself comfy, make sure you've got lots of nice snacks and drinks. Um, just get comfy and just come up with a new idea, come up with a new project. Um, it, it's not about necessarily coming up with the most amazing solution, the most amazing project that's going to blow the world away. It's more so using your skills, having fun, 
working together, working in a team, and maybe winning some prizes. So um, I'd say, yeah, for a first time hackathon, don't stress about it. There is time crunch, but it's, you know, it's fine if you only submit a small project, if you submit a giant project. It, it's not about, you know, it's how much you learn, it's how much you work together. It's not so much about the end product. Um, you know, you're here, you get free swag, you get snacks, you get food. Um, you know, it, it's all very um, enjoyable, even if you don't really get a whole project finished. Um, it's more about using the skills, using things you've learned at uni, um, working through solutions and problems together, and also being able to talk to, you know, industry professionals and people who are experts in the field on how they use these technologies and how they um, use certain aspects of, you know, technology to um, work in the real world. So I definitely say just take it all in, relax, enjoy it, make sure you're comfy. If you have any questions, do come to us. Um, we've got a help desk at reception in person and online we've got a help desk channel for anyone who needs assistance. Um, we will be moving to Jackbox soon. So Jackbox will be happening in the um, in the lecture hall shortly. Um, and for all you online hackers, feel free to chat to each other. Um, it's great that we're able to offer an online hack this year. This is the first year that we've done an online hackathon. Um, so we wanted to bring it to more people, um, especially those who couldn't make it in person. Um, so we're, we're glad to have you guys here. Um, we hope you're all enjoying sitting at home in probably in your office, in your bedroom, um, participating along, <laughs> maybe not get out your PJs yet, who, sh who knows. Um, for everyone in person, um, if you head to the front reception, um, you'll be able to sign in with your ticket, um, pick up your swag, um, and then you'll get a tour of the venue. Um, we will be going over a tour later of um, for this stream. So you'll be able to see what's going on in person. Um, all of the talks and the workshops will be also presented online. So you'll be able to follow along at home. If you need to leave, that's fine. If you need to head off for a bit, that's fine. As long as you've signed in, um, the stream will obviously be live the whole time. So we will be uh, covering all the information live. Um, and a lot of information will obviously go out over Discord and things. So if you have any questions or you feel like you've missed something, um, feel free to ask in the help desk channel. Um, but you're welcome to come and go, especially if you're remote. You're welcome to come and go, um, take a break, maybe grab some food and then come back um, and continue working with your team. If you don't have a team, if you're online, that's fine. We do have a looking for group channel on the Discord. Um, so feel free to post your um skills and what your ideas are and what kind of area you might be working in um and then you'll be able to find people who you can work together um on your project so i don't think we've had anyone further from uh tokyo i think jude's currently the winner for furthest participant online if anyone wants to come forward do message the uh twitch channel so the opening ceremony um, will be taking place at 11. So we'll have Jackbox on while everyone's heading in um, and then we'll transfer into the opening ceremony which will start at 11 o'clock and that will be live on, on the show. Um, the opening ceremony will cover a lot of information so I'd suggest definitely um, tuning in um, and anyone in person do head there for 11 o'clock um, because we'll be covering all of the tracks that will be taking place, um, all of the workshops, um, all of the sponsors for the event, all of the schedule. So make sure um, if, if there's any part that you watch of this, make sure you're there for the opening ceremony because it will give you a lot of the information you'll need to know throughout the hack. And that'll be at 11 o'clock. So we will be moving to Jackbox shortly. Um, so if you want to head to the lecture hall, um, we will have Jackbox on. And that'll be just while everyone filters into the lecture hall. What is Jackbox? <laughs> um, Jackbox is just a party game. You just um, have a code online. You join on the website. So if you go to um, jackbox.tv, um, you'll be able to enter the code that's on screen. Um, and then you'll be able to join and just play along. Um, it's just kind of like a sort of quiz game, a funny party game that um, you'll be able to pick answers and see who wins. Um, but we'll just do that just while everyone enters in, just so everyone's not sitting there waiting. 
Um, and then the opening ceremony will go live at 11. Where's the opening ceremony going to be? It's going to be in the lecture theatre. So if you're in person, head to the lecture theatre. Um, if not, we'll we'll cut to it at 11. We'll be going to the opening ceremony. Um, but shortly, we will be switching over to Jackbox to um, have both online and in-person people. I'm from Mars. Okay. Well, I think... I believe you if we'd met land on Mars yet, but I don't think we're going to qualify that for the longest participant. We'll have to verify that, I think. Any questions, as always, do message the HS Live channel on Discord and I'll be going through them. Um, I'll also be keeping an eye on the Twitch chat as well. So we're just getting ready now to um, head over to Jackbox. That is on in the lecture hall and um, we'll be transferring to that shortly. Alright then, before we get started, don't forget, new players can go to this website and enter this room code to join the game at any time. Let's proceed. You're going to see seven crazy facts pulled from the following fact categories. In Canada, women used to drink dried beaver testicles and alcohol to avoid pregnancy. Use your device to pick whether you think the fact is true or a lie. Christmas trees kill an average of 13 people a year. The moon is named after the man who discovered it. Cheerleaders are twice as likely to suffer from clinical depression. The cat in the hat was banned in Sweden for promoting anarchy. Safety School of Architecture is in Safety, Alaska. <coughs> Bhutan imports 20% of the world's tube socks. And here's where everyone stands at the end of round one. Here are your next seven fact categories.
Oxford offers a Butler Baby Scholarship every year. Koalas secrete a thin silk that can be used for climbing. During the U.S. Civil War, gunpowder was made out of bat guano. Taco Bell tried to purchase the Liberty Bell in 1992. A woman in one of the Bond films was actually born a man. A black and black drink is half Guinness and half prune juice. Goats have rectangular pupils. Scores. For the final round, all the facts will be about one category. That category is the Babysitter's Club books. Which of these are real titles of Babysitter's Club books and which ones were just made up by us? Dawn and the Mysterious Hair. Christy plus Bart equals question mark. Boy Crazy Stacy.
Abby at Makeout Point alone. hates boys and Jim. Claudia gets a case of the cooties. <coughs> Promageddon. Let's see the final scores. It's time for another game of Lie Swatter. You're going to see seven crazy facts pulled from these fact categories. PetSmart sells a casket lowering device. Alpacas share a communal bathroom area. Tom Brokaw had his fingernails ripped off on live television. An eight-year-old boy found a piece of whale vomit worth over $60,000. Koalas kill more Australians each year than snakes. Sammy Davis Jr.'s glass eye was filled with a shot of gin. Ow. 
the top cardiologist in France died from a heart attack while performing heart surgery. And here's where everyone stands at the end of round one. Here are your new fact categories. A province in Greenland has a clear flag. In space, astronaut screams are actually amplified. Martha Stewart's French Bulldog is named after a friend she made in prison. Pine cones were called pineapples before pineapples were discovered. B&O Railroad is meant as an insult to Amtrak. Victoria's Secret sells a bra that smells like bacon. Mississippi is a Native American word meaning backwards. Here are your scores. For the final round, all the facts will be about one category. That category is presidential firsts. Check out these facts about presidential firsts and try to figure out if they're total lies. Jimmy Carter was the first U.S. president born in a hospital. Chester A. Arthur was the first U.S. president to father a son.
FDR was the first U.S. president to have a driver's license. Martin Van Buren was the first president born in the U.S. Abe Lincoln was the first U.S. president to give a radio speech. <laughs> Richard Nixon was the first U.S. president to lie. Andrew Jackson was the first U.S. president to die of natural causes. Come on screen, come on screen. There we go, cool. Hello everybody, welcome to Axe Sussex 2023. <laughs> Elias, can I get a mic for the crowd? I can't hear them. Hello, welcome. Are you excited? Yes, cool. We have a hell of a weekend ready for you guys. We have all lost way more sleep than we really should have setting it up. I'm very much hoping you'll love it. So, yeah. I always forget to do that. So, welcome to Access 6. Even those of you who are used to the area may have noticed that we've rearranged the building slightly. You've all done a tour of this, but this is the lecture theater. Most of the workshop, every workshop except the cup stacking happens here. We have our sponsor booths just outside that all of you have walked past. We have a help desk, that registration area you saw. There will be someone there at all times throughout the entire hack. If you need help or anything like that, go there. Someone will be there. We have our hacking area, which of course you've all seen as well. Not only is it the lab, it extends a little bit into the hallway. And we have our social space, which I saw many of you enjoying earlier. We, I really like that. Isn't that comfy as hell? Um, do keep in mind though, with our social space, for part of tonight, we will be blocking part of it off as a sleeping only area, and we'll be turning off any music in there at that point. Now, many of you aren't even used to the area, let alone the building. So, we are here. This is our campus. If I zoomed that map out more, it looks like a cat, which is pretty cool. Now, that little white dot there is us. There's a bunch of different places on campus. We are going to feed you a lot this weekend. But if what we're giving you isn't good enough, there is one cafe open on the weekend. There is one pub open, should be open this weekend in the Student Union building. If you are gonna get drunk, please do it there, not here. I didn't hear that. Cool.
hopefully this is better. Oh, oh, that sounds different. That's weird. Cool. So yeah, if you're gonna get drunk, do it over there. I, I can't recommend getting drunk. Like technically, can't recommend getting drunk. Uh, <laughs> There are two shops open. There is an extremely expensive co-op that way and a kind of expensive SU shop that way. I prefer the SU shop because the SU does some lovely stuff, but co-op has a bit more range. If, you're look, if, you, if you are living on campus and you have an oven, that's where you want to go for stuff to put in it. If you're here just visiting for the weekend, plenty of sandwiches, snacks, things like that, if, of course, what we're giving you already isn't enough. We have, for the record, we've sp we went to Booker's yesterday and completely filled an entire minivan to the point where, to get out, I had to open the window to reach the handle on the outside, filled with snacks. So what you've seen so far in that social space is just the beginning. Uh, <laughs> now... For those for the internet access, to it, if you are a student here or you're a student at a university with Edgerome, you should be able to use Edgerome just fine. If not, or if Edgerome just doesn't like you, it hates me for some reason, there are two more Wi Fi's available. There's the O2 Wi Fi, which is around campus generally, and also our IT department's been nice enough to set up a Wi Fi network called Hack Sussex that has no password and should just get you straight in, which should be nice and simple for everyone. Um, you may have noticed those lovely things in the hacking area. We actually do have guest accounts. So those of you who are from elsewhere and want to use our machines instead of the ones you brought, we can log you in. We can log in up to about 80 people on those machines. Do keep in mind what you can do on them is kind of limited. Um, we couldn't get you software hubs. There's no IDEs on there. So if you like web-based IDEs and want to use the really powerful machines for them, we can set that up for you. Um, also, you may have noticed two monitors to every machine. Both monitors are plugged into the machines with If you are going to plug your laptop into There's also a bunch of extensions as well. So if you brought our PC, you can still use those as well. Um, if you are a Sussex student, you are free to come and go as you want. And as a Sussex student in engineering, you're free to use Lab 2. So those of you who are here anyway, if you feel a bit crowded, you can move to the other lab. Other people, you don't even know where, need to know where Lab 2 is. That's why I didn't put it on the map. Don't worry about that. Now, there is some very important stuff to go through. Firstly, in the great words of Bill and Ted, be excellent to each other. Every single person here has agreed to two different codes of conduct. They are not just boxes to tick. They are actual rules. Be decent. Those are very important. I, I will tolerate absolutely no BS on that front. Do not mess with each other. Our most important thing here is your safety. That comes first before everything else. If something does go wrong, find one of the people in the colorful shirts. Everyone who organized this event from Hack Sussex is wearing these blue shirts. We also have volunteers in the green shirts like Ron there, and do you want to hold yours up? This green color as well. You can <laughs> and you can also message us on Discord. There is a Hack Sussex account, which is in the Hack Sussex Discord, which you can message, or you can ping committee, or you can ping HS volunteers, or you can, there's various things you can ping. Ping, ping committee, or the Hack Sussex account. One of those two would be best. Or you can just prod whoever seems active until you get a response. Feel free to harass us on Discord if you need help. If you're not getting a response, you should be. Um, and very weirdly important thing with the meals, the food that we have coming for you is spectacular. Um, when the food does come, please do not swarm to where it arrives. We will come and get you in groups and bring you round. We're also going to make sure that the people with dietary requirements we grab first. So if you are, I believe the people with dietary requirements have stickers on their things, don't they? They do, yes. We've put a little stick, a little dot on your ticket if you're one of those people. We are going to find out where you're sitting and come grab you before everyone else to make sure your food doesn't get contaminated and then grab everyone else in groups. And yet more important stuff. If you see a fire, tell one of us. Don't just... Cool. Don't do that. Tell someone if there is a fire. And do not try it. Put it out. Is anyone here a firefighter by trade? Cool, not this weekend you're not. Do not put out any fires this weekend. 
If there's a fire, we will call security and the fire department and anyone else who is qualified to come and deal with it. If the fire alarm goes off, it is not a drill. Probably. Uh, <laughs> almost certainly, it is not a drill. All of you on the tour around the building, oh, well, yeah, stay calm. It's not a drill. Your life is in danger, but don't panic. Uh, <laughs> stay calm, calmly get up and walk towards, leave the building and go towards the assembly point. Every single person here should have done a tour of the building, which should have started with, out there, there is a sign. That is where we assemble if there is a fire. In this building, if there's a fire in that building, don't assemble there. If there's a fire in this building, assemble by that green sign. Because um, we need to check that everyone got out. Um, also, if there is a fire, if you see people walking around the building with high-vis jackets on, don't follow them. They're probably the people that are checking everyone got out. Um, now, on to the slightly more exciting stuff. Not that fire isn't exciting. Fire is exciting. But this is more exciting. So, here is our schedule for the weekend. After this ceremony, which is running slightly late, but I made it slightly smaller than it needs to be, so we should be on time. Um, hacking begins at 12. Who here came solo? You brave souls. I actually <laughs> the FTL after this presentation, Rie and Richard, who are the people that gave you the tours going around, they will do a team building thing where they will, and Holly as well actually, I think so. Cool. Yes, and Holly as well. She now knows that as well. Uh, we'll be doing a team building where you can get to meet some of the other people who've come stag or with a partial team and you can form up teams to work together on your project for the weekend. Those of you who have a team can go straight to the hacking area. At one o'clock, we have lunch. We have vegan sushi for lunch. Yes, we got you sushi from a local restaurant. Um, it's really nice stuff. Then, at two o'clock, we have the lovely people here at EDF in the bright orange shirts. Very easy to spot. Talk to these guys, they're amazing. Um, doing their cloud-based energy trading workshop. I have looked through this. Several people in the committee have looked through this. There was briefly a fight over who gets to talk to these guys about setting it up. and being involved with it because it looks that good. Um, after that, at half three, we have our first workshop with MLH, which is a SNCC cybersecurity workshop. Then we have a cup stacking workshop. Workshop, not a workshop, game. Awesome competition. Cup stacking competition in the FTL, the social space, with Holly from Hackathons UK. Then at 5.30, we are doing a Bob Ross paint, MS paint session back in here with, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I thought some of the others would have got wounds more than that one. <laughs> some people have clearly done that one before. <laughs> cool. Then at 6.30, we are bringing you dinner. We are bringing you Pizza Me Pizza, which is a very nice local place that we've used before. We like them very much. Um, then at 10 o'clock, we are opening a Minecraft server with a load of games in it, which Tom here has set up. Yes, it looks dope. My laptop is too old to run Minecraft, so I couldn't be part of the testing for that. <laughs> Um, then, at midnight, we are going to feed you again. This time, we are not using a local restaurant because they're all closed, all the good ones. Um, so, we are giving you ramen and pick and mix. <laughs> yeah. Um, one o'clock in the morning, we will be showing a movie in here. People online, you'll be, the stream will be dead by then. You don't get to take part in the movie, but that's fine because it means we get away with it. Um, so... <laughs> Yes. Excellent question, but that is TBD. Um, then, 9 o'clock in the morning, we have breakfast. We have Bagel Man coming with a whole selection of bagels in the morning. Yes, I saw a few people gasping there. Brilliant response. Then, 11 o'clock is our soft deadline. What this means is, even though the hacking ends at 12, 11 o'clock, your team has to have submitted something to DevPost. You can still edit it but it has to be in existence or you won't be eligible for whatever tracks you're running for. I recommend probably putting something up before 11. Don't do what I've done the last two weekends in a row and be there at 10.55 going, oh, we're reloading, we're reloading, we're reloading, we're reloading. Try and do it earlier. Um, so yeah, 11 o'clock, have something on dev post. 12 o'clock, have it done. That is the end of the hat. That's also when we will be feeding you our final meal. Which is Casa Azul Mexican. 
which I actually think they are going to surge towards us or assemble to order. It's so they're, they're really putting the work in that one. Also, if you brought cash, I think they're selling some of their famous homemade salsa as well. Um, not sure on that one. And then at one o'clock, you will start the presentations for your hat. I forgot the word hack. What is wrong with me? How little sleep have I been having? And at four o'clock, we will start the closing ceremony for the weekend. And many of you, and I know this because I've had people asking me in the lab in their work. They've been asking me what they're doing this weekend. Um, the challenge this weekend, because many of you are new to this, you have 24 hours of coding. Those of you who are good at basic math may have noticed that 12 today to 12 tomorrow is 24 hours. And you may be wondering what you're doing. Well, your challenge is to make something. I'm so confused by where the applauses are in this presentation. <laughs> so yeah, as long as you're something in some way incorporates some kind of code, some hardware, some software, some kind of hack somewhere, that's fine. There are tracks which we'll be going through for specific prizes. If you want, you can go, no, nah, I'm good. I'll make snake on a calculator instead. Totally up to you. Whatever you want to make, that is what you're making this weekend. Now, once you've done that, you then have to show it off. There are a few different ways the judging may work, depending on how many teams there are that finish at the end of the, by the end of tomorrow. But most likely, it will be that you will have three minutes to pitch your hack, to demo it, to show it off to people. And then you will have two minutes for questions. And that's what you've got to convince us that your thing is dope enough to win the prizes. Which, by the way, our prizes are for the best in-person hack. You are getting an Ender 3D 3D printer each. Yes. <laughs> and the runners up for the best in-person hat will get 50 pounds each in vouchers. And yeah, much less enthusiasm. I don't blame you in the slightest. Um, for the best online hack, also get 50 pounds each in vouchers. We also have another prize, which is where there will very soon, because I've just realized I've forgotten to make it, be a Discord channel called Photos. The best photo of the hack will win a big box of Ferrero Rocher. Yeah. I want as many photos, that make this as hard to judge as possible. We want thousands of photos. Starting now, yes. <laughs> no. The winning one will be a decent photo. They don't have to be decent. I mean, they have to be like, you know, legally decent. Safe for work like, photos. safe for work photos. They have to be safe for work. Okay, cool. Cool. And. Speaking of prizes and tracks, we have our first sponsor coming up. Who is coming up? All of you, fantastic. So these are the lovely people of EDF, which is our main sponsor this weekend. Uh, th thanks, Josh, and, and hello, everybody. It's, it's really super to be back. We, we sponsored, we were one of the sponsors of this event last time it happened in person in, in 2019. So re really, really su super to be back. Uh, we, we, I love the, we all love like, the energy and creativity that happens in Hacks. Uh, so so uh, really pleased to, to be the main sponsor of, of this one. Um, we're also a big local employer, so, pr so particularly pleased to, uh, to be associated with the, with the University of Sussex. And finally, I know from talking to the committee before, and you've, you've made 
create a real effort to, to reach out and get new people involved in, in, in this hack. And, and that's, that's the thing we, we really like. I mean, we believe anybody can, uh, anybody can succeed in tech. And uh, so, so, so really pleased to, to see that. Um, we are um, also here to speak a little about our, our grad scheme. So out of the five of us, one uh, isn't on the grad scheme and, the, and four are. I'll let you uh, try, try and guess who, who, who that might be. Um, but um, the, I, I think r I'll, I'll just say very quickly, it's, uh, it's a joint data and software scheme. So you do, it's over two years, you do four or six month rotations. It might be in data science, data engineering, visualization, software engineering, et cetera. So if, if, you're, if you're still exploring, not sure, you want to do something in general in that space, it's, it's really great as a, as a way to sort of get, get exposure, get excellent training as well. People come out certified in AWS, Terraform, Tableau, all, 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 kinds, of, all kinds of certifications. Um, and, and in addition at EDF, we're, we're involved right across the energy industry. So we do, you know, uh, generation, nuclear, wind, solar, uh, customer business, trading, etc. So, so we've, you know, you get you get a, a, a massive, a massive uh, range of exposure. Um, Everything we do is driven by our purpose, uh, which is here on the uh, uh, this, this slide behind me, helping Britain to achieve net zero. So, that, so that's our uh, sort of our core reason for, for being as a company. And and then related to that, as as just said, we we are sponsoring a track. So so our track uh, is around net zero. So basically, any hack that that helps helps achieve net zero, uh, we, we'll be giving a prize for that for everybody. We have a smart plug and a Philips Hue smart smart light bulb for, for every member of the team uh, uh, in, in, in that track. Um, if you want to bounce ideas, we're, we're easy to find in these t-shirts. Uh, come, come talk to anybody on, on, on either uh, anything really, but certainly any, anything around the track. I'm going to, we're going to go, go through basically and share. I think you're going first, Greta. Yeah, so. Hi, every oh, hi everyone. I'm Greta. Um, I'm on the graduate scheme, so I started in September 21. So I'm now on my third placement. I'm actually in Gavin's team, working in data science. So working on a whole range of different things, but kind of notably, I've um, been analyzing how um, energy prices have affected customer usage. Um, at the minute, also looking at introducing a new tariff. So it's kind of analyzing how that would work for the customers and both for EDF. Um, I think the graduate scheme is brilliant. As Gavin said, you kind of alternate between more data and more software placements, so you really get a taste for both. Um, as EDF is such a massive company, um, you know, the placements do really vary so much. So, yeah, I hope everyone has a great weekend and can't wait to see you all later. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Kate. I joined the grad scheme at the same time as Greta and David. Um, kind of irrelevant to you guys, but I joined the scheme with no coding experience at all. Um, so they'll let you come and learn on the job. So if you have something that you're interested in, you don't have to have done it before. You just have to be like interested and kind of passionate about it. Um, my current team is the artificial intelligence team. And we're using natural language processing at the minute on a project to try and identify vulnerabilities in customers who haven't directly mentioned it. So we're trying to pick up if they have like young children or disabilities that they might not have said to us, but that we want to know about so we can help them better. Um, so that's what I'm working on. I really enjoy it. Um, if you have any questions, we have a table and it's covered in sweets. So come and say hi. Um, and yeah, yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Kate. Um, so yeah, I'm David. I'm on the same uh, year as Greta and Kate joined the grad scheme in September 21. Um, I'm currently doing a placement in uh, a data engineering team. Um, and before this, I was in a software engineering team called uh, Central Engineering Services, uh, which I thought I'd talk to you about because we do some pretty cool stuff. Um, so yeah, the, the learning curve is quite huge on each six month rotation. I got to do a lot of, um, it was the first time I learned about infrastructure as code. Got to um, learn a lot of Terraform. Also built uh, serverless um, applications with AWS that scale easily and cost effectively because as you know, EDF has a lot of customers um, and sometimes they all log in at the same time. <laughs> um, so yeah, overall it was a great learning experience. I also got to learn a lot about monitoring and alerting. Um, when you're building and designing applications in industry, um, you need to monitor them um, so that customers uh, have, have have their applications always up and running. Um, so I got to d help design a monitoring service using a Dynatrace and also got to build a service serverless application that monitors uh, all of our code repositories uh, and does dependency management. And that's being used somewhere uh, in different places around the organization now. 
so yeah, overall, it was a very fun experience. And please do come check out our booth. Um, if you want to learn more about um, any of the placements we've, we've been on, we can uh, definitely share more with all of you. Thanks, David. So hello, I'm Adrian. I'm a software engineer at EDF Energy. EDF, sorry. Um, and essentially, I will be your host for the workshop that we have coming. And I'm supposed to sell this to you. And my biggest sell is, I think I'll be one of the judges. So you'd have to be coming and being really nice to me and being, oh, Adrian, that's such a great workshop. Just like what Josh was saying just earlier. So, yeah, it's a cool workshop. So I, actually, I, I, I work in wholesale market services. So um, in truth, the, the energy trading part, a lot of it's in the cloud. So we partnered with AWS. So we frequently create serverless applications I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume no knowledge when we go into this workshop, so essentially we're just going to build uh, a, your very first serverless application. If you um, I've already pre-written all the code for you, so you don't need to worry about any of that. So it's pretty much just messing around with the AWS console and stuff like that. Um, so the context is pretty much, uh, for example, if you ever walk into kind of a finance trading floor, you'll see a lot of alarms blaring, you need to trade at this time, etc., things like that. Um, so we have something similar at EDF. You pretty much walk into Whitfield Street, which is our office in London. Uh, that's where all the traders are based. Each trader has a whole bunch of screens. They're looking at a whole bunch of graphs. And on those screens, we have the applications that we've built. Um, and so we'll kind of do like a really miniature version of that application, which will pretty much just be, I guess, just putting a, a graph, a live graph on the screen that monitors uh, interconnected flows between countries. And the traders then use that to understand what they should be trading in the short term. Um, because, you, you know, I don't know how much you know about the energy market, but for example, you, we want the system to be balanced. Uh, we don't want to oversupply or undersupply the system. We get hit with a penalty if we do. Um, and also, you know, power lines burn um, and you, go, you get blackouts, stuff like that. So essentially, these charts, WMS, Wholesale Market Services, are pretty much what I see as the glue between the generation and the customer side we get that energy to go to the customers, and we do that powered by our tech teams. That's pretty much it. That's my cell. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll hand over to Josh. Cool. Big hand for EDF. <laughs> oh, but I like standing in front of the lectern. <laughs> Apparently, I was causing radio interference. Um, <laughs> so yeah, as Adrian alluded to, not only do these guys have their own track to look out for, but they are also on the judging panel for our main tracks. So definitely make sure you talk to them. Yeah, you see a company turn up to a hackathon that brings along four graduates. Really a very good scheme. Now, up next, we also have our other sponsor, Electric Square. This, was this slide? This was not meant to be animated. Ooh. There you go. Cool. Here is Daniel from Electric Square. Not only an ex Sussex student, but an ex Hackathon hacker. That is the 2017 shirt. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Old school. Cool. There you go, Dan. Hello. <laughs> this is my first time using a microphone, so sorry if I get a bit too close to my mouth. Um, so I'm Daniel. I'm from. Uh, I'm an ex Sussex student. I graduated in 2020. Um, I currently work for Electric Square, which is a Brighton-based game studio. Um, we focus on um, co-development, so we work with lots of different companies, big companies. Uh, for example, I'm currently working on Assassin's Creed VR. Um, and uh, for, t for today, we have a what is essentially a game jam. Um, that we've named the joy of the throw. So basically, it's just themed around um, throwing things, sort of the very sort of basic mechanic, uh, and sort of all the different interesting ways that you might be able to interpret that. You can sort of read the sort of flavor text there. Um, we are gonna. I'm probably going to print out a couple of these, so you know you can sort of read these at your own time. But sort of the important thing is that you try and be creative with it. Just think about the basic mechanic of throwing and how you might actually be able to sort of use that in strange and interesting ways. 
uh, and we just sort of got some bonus points there. Team for the uh, with the cutest in-game mascot, team with the most satisfying throwing mechanic, and team with the biggest surprise. Um, so we don't really have sort of a main table. I'm probably mostly going to be sort of floating around. Uh, I'll also be here for about uh, sort of an hour or two after this opening ceremony, and. I'll come back again um, tomorrow in time for the judging. Might also bring some other Electric Square colleagues there as well. Uh, please feel free to talk to me at any point um, about any questions you might have about the game jam, or uh, just generally if you have any questions about sort of games development as a whole, Electric Square in general. Um, oh, and we also, our, our prize, I don't think it's up here, but it's uh, 25 pounds per head uh, on a voucher of your choice. That could be anything to Steam voucher, Amazon voucher, etc. Um, but yeah, I think that's really it for our track. Quite short and sweet, I'm afraid. But yeah, uh, I might be by the table outside, but I might also just be kind of floating around, just sort of, yeah. Look for me. I have a self confident badge, so that's nice. Um, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. This is a fair amount of text. We're not expecting some empires of this. We will put this in the Discord at the end of the ceremony. Um, cool. So those are our two main sponsors that are hosting tracks with us today. We also, although there are 10 of us on the Hack Sussex committee, we are not an army. We have a lot of volunteers and people helping us. We also are partnered with two lovely groups here. I will let MLH go first. This is Shashrika from MLH. Here you go. That's okay, that's okay. Even if you're not clapping for me, I'm sure you clap for some of our interesting price categories and resources that we have for you. So, without much ado, let's get started. The stage is already set on fire because there was a lot of energy up here. So, hello everyone and welcome to Hacks of Sex. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend and in the opening ceremony and for being so enthusiastic. I love it. MLH is super stoked to be here at, with you all and we'll kick off this opening ceremony. Just a quick second, let me set up before my laptop falls. <laughs> right. So, as I said, we are super stoked to be here and we I want to remind you all that the goal here is to make something and have fun. That's all. We want you to have an amazing time this weekend and there'll be prizes, of course, to complement that. So, without much ado, let's get started. Quick introductions. Hello, everyone. My name is Sashrika, and I am a major league hacking coach. I recently shifted to the EMEA region. I was previously in APAC. I've been to 50 hackathons now, a little over that. I work as a software engineer at Google professionally, and this is my second hackathon in UK since I shifted here. So, yeah, if you want to talk to me about major league hacking, anything else in general, I'll be there at the MLH booth to support you all. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me, ML Hacks. We will be posting a lot about Hacks X this weekend. So if you want to stay updated with what's happening at the event, please do join us. All right. Now, everything that you need this weekend from MLH is at hack.mlh.io. You can keep this link. I'm going to cover a lot in this presentation. So if you miss out on something, don't worry. Everything is there on this link. You can note this down. There are resources. There are prizes. There are so much more that you can work with. Speaking of, what is Major League Hacking? I know a lot of you are not aware about us, so Major League Hacking is a global hacker community. Our goal is to make sure that you have an amazing event, amazing event, amazing hackathon, have enough resources to get you started. How, how many of you are joining for the first time at the hackathon? Can you raise your hands? Wow. We have a lot of first-time hackers, and we have a welcoming community here to support you all. So if you want resources, if you want help, just please, please feel free to ask anyone. If you want to ask us, if you want to Hackathons UK is here, and the organizing team as well. So everyone is here to support you. And speaking of community, you are now a part of a 5 lakh, oh, sorry, I think 500,000 is the word that you use here, sorry. Over half a million hackers just like you are part of this community now. By being a part of the MLH community and by being at this event, you are a part of this amazing community who are ready to help you. So how do you uh, get more help or how do you attend more events? 
you attend our member events, you attend our Global Hack Weeks, and you can win community points. So if you want community points for your team, for your colleges, for your universities, attend more events. Speaking of which, we have Global Hack Week, which is our week-long hacker celebration. So we have one GSW every month with a different theme. There's one coming up uh, on APIs and on social good as well. If you are interested, please sign up for those. The link for that is ghw.mlh.io. Moving on, what are we doing this weekend now? This is the fun part. It's your destination to build something amazing, right? So we want to support you as best we can with the resources and tools. So we are happy to support this event with some fun events, right? So we have a SNIC cybersecurity challenge, as mentioned earlier. It's going to be at 3.30 PM here in the lecture theater. If you're not familiar with cybersecurity, don't worry about it. It's just a fun challenge. We'll introduce you to cybersecurity fundamentals, and we'll talk, about, talk more about it then. Speaking of which, there will also be an MS Paint Bob Ross mini event. I know that there's a lot of excitement about this event. Uh, it's an, for those of you who are not aware about it, we actually use MS Paint and make a painting by following a famous artist, Bob Ross, and it's a fun event. Uh, if you're an artist like me and you like to brag, even though you're a terrible one at it, it's going to be a fun one because the painting won't turn out anything like you expected it to be. But it's going to be at 5.30 PM here in the lecture theater again, so I'll see you then. Awesome. So we have, as I said, all the resources that you need for this hackathon, and we have some more amazing prizes as well. Speaking of which, we have a domain.com prize. So if you use a .tech domain name and register for the domain.com prize, you can use the weekend code 23 Feb hack and actually uh, opt for this prize. If you win that, you win a beautiful domain.com branded backpack. So that's an interesting one. Next up, we have. The most creative use of Twilio. I got a lot of questions about Twilio this weekend. It's an API that you can use, and you can win a Game Go console if you participate for this price category. Now, that also includes some socks, some stickers, and some scrunchies, if you, that's the kind of thing that you're interested in. You can use any Twilio API for a chance to win this prize. There's a $50 trial offer and a cr on credit today. Awesome. Next up, we have our sponsor, which is Microsoft. Best use of Microsoft Cloud for your community. You can win a 12-month LinkedIn Premium and an Xbox Ultimate three-month Game Pass subscription. All you need to do is follow that hackback link, hackp.ac slash Microsoft. And you can check out some of the interesting ideas and some of the hacks that folks have built, get, so, get inspired, and you can build something for the community. Awesome. Moving on, there is also the most creative use of GitHub. This is particularly my favorite prize. Not that I'm choosing anyone here, but you can win a GitHub swag bundle, which has got an amazing OctoCAD puzzle and a sticker pack, which is absolutely to die for. So you can qualify that by signing up for the global uh, campus and then host your projects on a GitHub repository and show off your skills in making the best GitHub, making the most creative use of GitHub uh, in this project. Awesome. You can also go and sign up for our Auto Prize, which is the best use of Auto. Again, you don't need a credit card. You don't need anything to get started. You can implement an authenticated sign-on option uh, and process your hack. You win a Tumblr, Rubik's Cube, and a sticker. If you want more information, you can go to the link. Uh, as uh, suggested, the, the, all the prizes would be up also on DevPost. So if you want more information, you can grab that those links from there as well. Cool. Now, everybody who participates this weekend gets an iDemo sticker because you created a hack, you built something interesting, and this is what we have for you. So uh, by the end of this event, if you show off your hack, be sure to grab your iDemo sticker and yeah, uh, earn one by demoing. There's also our MLH Career Lab, which has a lot of companies hiring. So if you're interested in career opportunities, this might be the place to be. With that being said, there is also the MLS season census. If you participate here, you can get a chance to win a brand new laptop. You can complete the census, and you can tell us about your experiences. We'd love to make your experiences a lot more better at these events. Uh, we also have the MLH Fellowship, which is a 12-week internship alternative. So if you're looking for internships or just a three-month um, three program or a 12-week 12 12 week program to learn about production-level skills, to talk about open source, to meet like-minded people, this is a stipend-based program that you can join. So you can check out Hackpack link mentioned on the screen and uh, get more information from there. 
But now, on a serious note, as mentioned earlier, MLH has a code of conduct. MLH hackathons are a safe space for everyone. We want you to have fun, but we want you to be mindful of other folks. Uh, it's also a hybrid event, so make sure that you're aware. If you're reaching out to someone digitally, the other people people are not ignoring, ignoring you. They are just on with going on with their lives. So just give them some time, give them the space to count, reach out back to you. With that being said, if you have any uh, issues or any Thing that you want to talk about during the event, I'll be there. The organizers would be there. There is also an incidents helpline that we share with you. So if you want to reach out to someone, please do. Now, thanks again to all our partners who have made these events possible. And with that being said, my name is Sashrika and I'm from Major League Hacking. Thank you so much. I'll hand it back to Josh. One day, I will learn to hold a microphone properly without having someone tell me how to do it. So, thank you, Sashrika. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> I proper set your phone, now, didn't I? <laughs> so, thank you, Sashrika. Now, I am aware we are running slightly late on the opening ceremony. Don't worry, we will extend the hack by however late we are leaving here. You're not losing time to hack with. So, up next, we have our other partner event, he said, as if they were a consolation prize, which of course she isn't, because Holly's amazing. Holly here is not only here for this weekend, she's doing the hack trick. She was at Hackaway as Hackathons UK, as well as a hacker at Hack Knots last week. Here is Holly. <laughs> yes, so, um, my name is Holly and I am from Hackathons UK. If you have not met me before, um, I just kind of exist at Hackathons. Most Hackathons that I am at <laughs> that happen, I'm probably at them. Um, so a little bit about me. I am reaching the 40 Hackathons attended, whether that was a hacker organizer or a volunteer. So I feel like I've been here a while. So basically, what is Hackathons UK? <laughs> Hackathons UK is a volunteer-run charity in the UK which helps organise and run hackathons at student events. So we are actually comprised of past and present hackathon organisers and we don't get paid to do this. We do this because we love the, the actual event and what it means. So if you want to organise a hackathon, uh, attend a hackathon or mentor at a hackathon, we're, oh, there's another one, or sponsor a hackathon. Uh, <laughs> we will be there with you every step of the way. Just come and contact me, find me at the booth, talk to me, just holler, I don't know, say, Holly, I need help, and I will help you. Um, so uh, if you want to join the community to find, you can't actually read anything, but like if you want to join us, uh, just join the Discord, it will be hackuk.org for slash Sussex23, and that will bring you to the current Sussex Discord. Um, and we've also got a challenge! Um, so, which you can't see! I'm so confused how that's actually happened. So basically, it's the hackiest hack challenge to win a beautiful blahage. Um, so basically, build something over the top, over-engineered, or held together with bits of string. Uh, just try your best. If everything fails, just present what you have and just tell me all your woes and issues that you've had, and I'll I'll take that into account when I'm chat like I am um, judging the prize. Right. Cool. Next, we also have a mini event, which is cup stacking, which is way more interesting than you think cup stacking is. I promise. Um, yes, it's at four thirty. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know whether that's me or not. I've still undecided whether that's me on the picture. Um, but yes, come join me for cup stacking. It is a great event. It's a good like, release of energy or frustration that you have with your hack at that point. Um, yes. Um, and also, if you want to get some Hackathons UK stickers, come find me at my booth. There'll be some stickers on the table. Um, yes, I'm saying yes a lot. It's early. Well, it's not early. I don't know. If you want to do what I do and just hop around to all the hackathons around the UK and help the organisers run the event on the day and vibe with hackers in general, because that's what I'm going to be doing, join us. Join us. It's not a cult. Um, Hackuk.org slash join. Um, it's a charity, so you can join us as a voting member or a volunteer. So if you're a voting member, that's a member of our community. 
a community so like when we vote on things because that's what you have to do in a charity it's like a whole democratic thing you can be involved in that process so join us join us at hackathon UK or hack UK .org for us join um and we'll someone will contact you we'll talk to you so yes <laughs> that is us that does say hackathons <laughs> hackathons.org.uk um, and we do have a list of all the events that we know of whether or not we're attending on there and all the information that you need if you do want to organize your own hackathon at your university we will be there with you from conception if you want to I promise we're, we're more of a help than a hindrance so yes thank you i hope you have a really good time this weekend please come talk to me and i will come talk to you yes peace Holly, I'm so sorry that I broke your slides. That, I, I actually think I know what happened there, and I'm really sorry. Um, I will fix those before they go on the Discord later on. Um, weirdly, it's readable on the screen here, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, now, of course, not everyone that's helped make today happen is here, although we have more of them here than I knew was coming. Hey, Ian. Um, so, in addition to EDF and Electric Square and MLH and Hackathons UK, we also have the wonderful University of Sussex, which in my completely objective, unbiased opinion, is the best university in the world. Um, we have our head of school, Ian Wakeman, has come just to watch the opening ceremony. Hello, Ian. Not only are they just, have they been fantastic in helping us set this up, they've also given us a building, they've given us a very generous help in setting this up. Am I meant to mention Cool. Yes, they gave us money as well. <laughs> we, we also want to thank MTL, this microphone I'm holding, the camera looking at me. These are the people behind it, the guys in the MTL, the Media Technology Lab, which is based here in Sussex, one building over in Richmond. Um, go, clap really loudly for them and they might actually hear it. Do you feel the love, Kobe? Okay, we can't hear him. Um, and of course, British Computing Society, which everyone here at Sussex, these are the guys accrediting your degree. If you don't know who they are, you should. Um, these are the people that basically make it so our degrees have value, which is if you want to work, it's a very useful thing to have in your degree. They're a fantastic group for networking. They are fantastic for doing events and things like that. Um, they're trying to make the whole profession be well respected and looked at properly and keep people accountable. Um, I strongly recommend getting a membership if you haven't got one. Um, yeah, and of course, Red Bull gave us drinks. Uh, and that's it for them. So, that is the end of the opening presentation. Are you excited? <laughs> is that all you got? That's more like it. So here is the list of all of the tracks for today, all on one slide. This will be put on the Discord separately as well as in the presentation. If you don't have a team, we can do team building in FTL. If you do have a team, then you can go straight to hacking. Go! <laughs>
Hello. So for the online hackers, uh, we hope you enjoyed the opening ceremony. For your team um, join, team forming and uh, joining each other up online, we've got a looking for group channel. So you'll need to head there and share your skills, share you know what you want to work on, what you're interested in, um, and just gather some teammates together. Obviously, ideal team size is four, and um, we'll take a maximum of five. Um, and you'll need to basically get yourselves into teams, you know, add each other, chat to each other, find out, you know, what you want to work on together. Um, and then that'll be, um, that'll be the best way to connect with other people who are also trying to form teams. And we expect a lot of people online are going to be singles, like you're going to be solo, you're joining from all around the world. It's an awesome thing to be able to collaborate together. Um, so just post your skills in there, find people um, who are looking for teams as well. Um, and just reach out to them and form form groups to work on your projects. Um, I can see a lot of you already have shared lots of great skills, lots of great languages. Um, I think, yeah, best thing is to reach out and message people directly and just ask if they've got a team. Um, that'd be great. And for those of you in person, if there's anyone remainder in the lecture hall, um, you'll want to head out now around to the lab area. There should be volunteers there and um, organizers. You'll find them in the green and blue shirts. They'll be guiding you to find places to sit down and figure out where um, where you're going to be hacking for the next 24 hours. So we'll now, um, we can actually see people uh, going into the labs now. So again, for the last... Um, at the end of the ceremony, we're now moving into forming teams and beginning hacking. Um, so good luck hacking and uh, the looking for group channel, um, online looking for team in Discord. Um, that'll be where you can form teams online. So shortly we will be after everyone's got their teams and everyone's settled down into the labs. Um, for the online stream, we will be talking to the sponsors. So we will be discussing with um, them about sort of their industry, what they're working on, um, what tracks they're obviously hosting, the prizes. So just to sort of recap um, from the opening ceremony. So we'll be able to ask them about why they're here, what brings them here, what they are looking forward to, um, and also ask them a bit about their tracks and uh, how that's going to be judged throughout today. Um, so again, if you're online, you'll need to go for the looking for group channel. Um, and then you will be able to find other people there. Send your skills, send you know what you want to work on, um, and I'm sure other people will message you and reach out. Um, so there's that's how you form teams online. Um, and those of you in person, we hope you're all getting settled into your lab area, um, into your hacking space. Um, and again, any questions, uh, either send them HS Live channel, I'll be checking that, um, and there'll also be a help desk channel for anyone who um, who needs help. So. In, a, in around five minutes at 20 past, we will be moving on to the um, sponsor interview. So we'll be interviewing sponsors about stuff. Um, but for now, get settled in your hacking space, um, get all set up. And then any questions, grab one of us um, and we'll be happy to help. So at 20 past, we'll be resuming with uh, sponsor interviews. Thank you.
again, sorry about that. We had some issues with the microphones. So I'm here with Daniel from Electric Square. Um, so yeah, just tell us a bit about what you do at Electric Square, you know, your background and what you work on and what you do in day to day at Electric Square. So uh, I'm a Sussex graduate. I, after graduating from Sussex, I um, worked, uh, I became employed at Electric Square. Uh, I've worked on all sorts of projects there. Two of the sort of big ones, um, Warped Cart Races, which is a project with Fox, uh, Electric Square being a co-dev company. So we work with all sorts of partners. So, you know, Fox, for example, Ubisoft here, as you can see, uh, we're working with them on the Assassin's Creed VR, uh, which is a project I'm currently on. Um, I'm a game play, play programmer. So that just sort of means that uh, I work on anything to do with gameplay. So that could be sort of weapon systems or U UI. Um, yeah, and that's just sort of my day to day. I work on all those kind of systems. Yeah, that's great. Some really cool stuff you guys work on. So you're actually a Sussex alumni, aren't you? So was there anything that you suggest to someone who's looking to get into sort of the game industry, like what they should look at while they're studying? Yes. So one of the big things I think is a massive help is that when you have your final year project, uh, if you're interested in games, make that game related. You know, um, propose something uh, that is game related. Work on that. Could be in Unity, uh, could be in Unreal, any kind of thing like that, just to sort of show that you are sort of passionate about something. And also, you know, two birds, one stone, you can do it as your final year project too. Um, also, learn C++ if you can on the side. Uh, that is an incredibly useful skill. You know, really know your memory management, really sort of understand the fundamentals of computer science, because all that stuff is very important in games programming. Wonderful, yeah. So with, with that, with sort of going into game development, you mentioned C++. So is it something, does Electric Square um, primarily focus on sort of Unity, C Sharp, or Unreal, C++? Like, what are the sort of technologies you guys use or sort of the infrastructure? Like, what, what te technological um, like stuff can people look into that will prep them well for sort of the kind of industry that game development is? Um, so Electric Square being a co-dev company, we work on all sorts of different engines, can work in all sorts of different languages. I've mainly worked in Unity, so that's C Sharp. Uh, but, you know, there could be any moment where I could be transferred to a project which is, you know, Unreal, you know, C++ there, or any kind of propri proprietary engine, uh, which, again, you know, a lot of them use C++ too. Um, so, sort of the idea is to have sort of a really sort of good fundamental knowledge of uh, concepts like memory management and just generally computer science concepts so you can transfer over um, to those sort of different technologies, different engines, different languages. Yeah, that's great. So for um, like, what, what is it that people should do if they are perhaps interested in um, Electric Square or is there any sort of um, opportunities for people to get involved at Electric Square, you know, who are maybe graduating or looking for placements? Is there anything going on currently? Um, so I would just say, look at our website. We almost always are recruiting for programmers. Um, and really we just sort of, we will take anyone who is sort of talented enough. Um, so it is just a case of, you know, try and learn C++, try and, you know, sh dem create some games. Um, and, you know, when you leave university, just double check um, on our website uh, and we'll have sort of a programmer uh, job listed. And yeah, just apply. Uh, a, a lot of the process is relatively informal. You talk to just sort of our tech director, you know, different people from Electric Square where we get a sense of you and then at the end of that process there will be some technical exam which again is in C++ so that another reason why it's very important. Yeah that's really great so obviously it's good because people hear a lot of questions they ask are about how do they get into it what's the process um, could you explain a little about sort of what your experiences was from graduating did you do anything sort of did you get involved with Electric Square or have anything beforehand or was it after you graduated so what was the steps you went through and is things like having a portfolio or having some work to show, like how, how does that help getting, a lot of people are struggling to focus on getting into the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. So they kind of want to know almost the steps of what actually happens in the real world. And obviously you yourself, you, you've done really well. You've got into Electric Square, a really nice studio. And I am assume that's kind of your dream job maybe. Oh, yeah, so how do people sort of, what's the steps that you would say is the steps of success in their journey from graduate, you know, studying mm. to actually getting into the industry? So I would say, first of all, there is going to be an element of luck into this as well. You know, there, it is a very tightly contested industry. I don't want to sort of pretend that, you know, I was the sort of ideal candidate and I would naturally get a job just because I was so talented. Uh, it's, 
it is, it is a hard thing to do, but you can do certain things to maximize your chances. Um, the way, the biggest thing that helped me was definitely having my final year project be um, uh, a game that I, you know, I, I worked on. Um, what also very much helped me was on the side, again, trying to learn C++. It, a lot of the times, what com games companies want are just really solid programmers who sort of know that sort of lo low level optimizations. They sort of understand how, uh, you know, again, I, I feel like a broken record, but it is, is, I do want to really sort of convey the importance of understanding, you know, uh, the sort of fundamentals of computer science. Like one of the things that um, I remember in my interview process, um, uh, one of the interviewers really liked the sound of was that Sussex taught, you know, Again, the fundamentals in terms of uh, compilers, you know, that kind of stuff they found like, oh, it's good that you're actually learning, you know, properly how computers work, how languages are made. Um, yeah, and also, very important, just to be personable as well. You know, people want to work with people who are personable. Um, you know, you've got to try and have you know, people skills, try and demonstrate that, you know, you work well with people. And, you know, you can sort of have fun as well, you know, be a nice person. <laughs> Be a nice person. That's a, that's yeah. a very good guidance, I think, for any job. But yeah. um, it's good to know, yeah, the steps that are involved in sort of going through the process and what people should have. And I think, yeah, definitely sort of final year projects and stuff. A lot of people are, you know, working on them or thinking of what their project's going to be, you know, second years going into third year. So it's good for people here to know, well, for, hear from someone who's actually there, um, how things work and the process goes. But, um, yeah, no, really insightful. And we're so glad to uh, be working with Electric Square on this event. Yeah, so thank you so much. Peer account if you haven't already. So Adnan has kindly put the link in the Discord chat. Um, if everybody could sign up for an AWS free tier account. If you really don't want to and you just want to watch me bore you guys, then that's completely fine too. Um, but I do recommend that you sign up for the AWS free tier. For those of you just coming into the room, um, like I said earlier, we're just 10 minutes or so just to make sure everybody signed up for an AWS free tier account. Adnan has posted the link in the Discord chat at the EDF channel. Right, Adnan? Cool.
So just another couple of minutes. Uh, we're giving people another two minutes to sign up to AWS free tier if you haven't already. Um, as, as I said earlier, Adnan's put the link in the chat. And then uh, we'll make a start. Right, cool. Let's make a start. So I'm assuming everybody's done great and signed up to AWS free tier. But uh, if you would like to just sit down, have a watch, kind of understand a little bit about the cloud um, and understand what we do here at EDF or anything like that, then that's completely fine. So I'm going to kick off with a presentation. Uh, obviously, I'm going to introduce the data and tech grad scheme. Um, obviously, because you are all students, um, or most of you, I presume. Um, and then we'll kick off with just a start to the workshop. I'll share my screen, and I'll give you a little bit more context. So the beginning part of the workshop is pretty much just uploading a file, uh, and then I'll come back to the presentation. Reason being, we need to be able to build the infrastructure in AWS, and sometimes that takes time. So we'll go through that step immediately after the grad scheme presentation. Okay. Oh, and um, in terms of questions, uh, just put your hand up or ask. It's good. I'd, I'd say it'd be quite informal. Uh, I've got David here, who is also just studying for his exam, I, I believe. So he should know more than I do in terms of any AWS services uh, if I've forgotten what the answer might be. So I'm going to kick off. Right, so kicking off with the Data and Tech Grad Scheme. So the Data and Tech Grad Scheme is a scheme that's basically a scheme surrounding data and tech. You don't need to have any experience. You pretty much apply. You go through the process. Uh, you get a phone interview, assessment centers, you know, all, those, all that typical stuff that you, s you get when you apply to other jobs. But essentially, it centers around data and tech. And we're pretty much, as EDF, trying to achieve a very more data-driven future. So for example, I'll give you one of our flagship products where we're currently looking at uh, using data science and machine learning to identify our customers which are more financially vulnerable. So for example, this might be things like what customers are paying with. So, so for example, pay as you go or direct debit. And the machine learning would basically pick that up to see whether or not if they've got late payments, or are they defaulting? And then you can kind of already isolate whether or not a customer is financially vulnerable. And if they are, then we'll pass it on to the customer service team. They'll go to it, and they'll pretty much call and see whether or not we need that customer might need some help or need a, need a little bit more support. Um, so we're trying to be a lot more data-driven, tech-driven. I work in wholesale market services. Like I said earlier, uh, I work a lot with the short-term traders. We build serverless applications. And the amount of data that we need for that is quite a lot. Uh, we basically need a lot of market data. We have a team called Volume Forecasting, which for forecasts the volume uh, of our customers. Market analysis, forecasts the prices. So many teams feeding in data. And those prices go, those costs also go into your tariffs. So it's really, really important that we become data driven and also have the best tech stack, which is also why we partner with AWS. A lot of our stuff is uh, deployed in AWS. Uh, we have a few internal things on Azure, mostly on the nuclear side, though. But most of our deployments are on AWS. So just a little bit about my journey. So actually, my, my tech journey started off at EDF. So I did a, a degree in chemical engineering. So I might not relate to some of you computer science degreeers. But EDF has an amazing grad scheme where they pretty much teach you everything right from scratch. I started off with it as a data scientist, then as a software engineer, data engineer, analyst. Uh, that was kind of interchangeable in that role, DevOps engineer, and then a software engineer. And throughout all those, you kind of get to see it's the whole round. So you got DevOps, you got software engineer. I know how to code. I know how to deploy. I know how to deal with data. And you get everything. You pick up a few certifications along the way. I think Gavin mentioned a couple. And just at the end of it, you become pretty experienced. So I'm currently a software engineer, as I said, in the wholesale market services. 
So again, with the scheme, scheme starts with 31K as a starting salary, uh, but that moves up uh, as you go along. So after the first year, then you get a pay bump and then a pay bump. Um, you get 28 days annual leave, so that's new. It used to be 25, um, and obviously all those other bits of uh, flexible benefits and all those other other benefits like bonuses, etc. But yeah, the scheme is six month rotations. Um, so work from home or from the office. Usually it's completely up to you. Depends on which team you're in. So I pretty much work from home once a week. I mean, work from the office once a week. I choose to work from home four times a week. But yeah, uh, you apply, you get psychometric tests, phone interview, assessment center. We actually just interviewed our, la our next cohort last week. So we've got 12 new graduates coming, or at least we've offered to 12 new graduates. Um, it's interchangeable. You start off with either data or tech, and then you start with tech, and then data, and then tech. So it really, really depends on uh, which scheme you start off with. So for example, you might start off with as a data scientist or as a software engineer. So software engineer would classify as tech, data science would classify as data, or data engineer would classify as data. So that's how it's segmented. But yeah, now onto the workshop. So with the workshop, um, what we're gonna do is, before I start kind of explaining everything, um, Adnan should have already sent a link to Google Drive. And within that Google Drive, should have all the files that you need for the workshop. So if I just open up the Google Drive here, so I'm just gonna give it a second so that everybody can open up the Google Drive on your side. Right, so within this Google Drive, uh, you've got a few well, zip files and YAML files and Python files. And don't worry, we'll go through all of this. You'll see that there are some London Python files. That's because I've done this exact same workshop, uh, but over a three hour period. And this time without using infrastructure as code, which is what I'll be touching on here. Uh, so I've condensed this to, to a one hour workshop. Um, so you'll see this document here. So this is gonna be the document that you can follow along. So if someone uh, kind of falls behind or requires a bit more information and you don't really wanna stop everybody to ask the question or you might be stuck on something, A, you've got David here who has done the workshop before and he pretty much knows what he's doing. So just raise your hand up and ask David and he'll come around and help you or you can do a complete self-serve and just follow along with this documentation. Completely up to you. Um, it's got most of the steps in it, but if you've never touched on AWS, uh, there might be times where you'll kind of look at this and think, um, where's that tab again? Or what is it that I need to do? So it's best you follow along with me, um, but also have that documentation on the side. I'm also gonna be looking at the documentation on my screen so that I know I'm doing the right steps in the right order. So the first step is to pretty much log in to your AWS free tier account. So I put that QR code there, but I presume it's much better in the uh, Discord chat so that you can just click on it. So this here is the AWS console. So I always got feedback from this workshop to say, you never gave me enough time to kind of play around with the console to understand what it's actually doing. Um, so Whilst I'm talking, explaining a little bit about AWS, play around with the console, have a look at some of the services, and kind of understand. So here's a search bar, and if you want to use an AWS service, you pretty much just search for that service. So for example, S3 buckets. S3 buckets are pretty much um, storage. So you can pretty much store anything in S3 buckets. You can store from video files, to text files, to any sort of data. So when you've got an S3 bucket and you want to navigate to it, you obviously go to the search bar and search S3. And you click on it. When this loads. Oh. 
I might have to extend this workshop now. In the meantime, yep, just uh, look around, familiarize yourself with the console. You'll tend to have these orange, uh, these orange buttons as kind of action buttons. So for example, it might be creating something, create a stack, create a bucket. So these are action buttons. Uh, and on the left, you tend to have a menu. Um, but most of the time, all you have to do is navigate in the search bar and then to the service. So the first service that we're actually going to look at is CloudFormation. So I'm just going to add the YAML file into here. And then I'll go and explain more in the context in the case study. Just so that whilst I'm explaining, this can be building in the background. Right, so in CloudFormation, CloudFormation is an infrastructure as code. So I find that sometimes a lot of developers, sometimes you might not take a DevOps module, or you right off the bat, you're kind of, you go through a computer science degree or you just learn, okay, I'm just gonna learn how to do Python or I'm just gonna learn how to do JavaScript. I create uh, an application. That application has a bunch of modules in it. Um, and so you don't actually learn how to deploy those applications in the cloud unless you kind of think of it as a single server where you deploy an application. So what we're actually moving towards is something called serverless where we actually don't manage the services and also, we're trying to put more of a focus on microservices um, and also event-driven applications, where we're trying to decouple pretty much everything. So long are the days where we kind of go and create an application, um, have a bunch of modules, and just create a monolith application and put it on a server somewhere. Those days are kind of gone. We're moving towards something a bit more new. That's where AWS comes in. So I'm going to create a stack. I go to CloudFormation, I create a stack, and I'm going to upload a template file. So at this point, I want you to upload the template file that you'll find in the workshop files. And that template file is called developer to cloud infra. So I'm just going to download that. Once you've downloaded that file, Choose and upload. I'll explain what this file is doing whilst it's building. So once you've uploaded that, again, if you fall behind, David's your man. Right, so. In this bit, you can call it whatever you like. I'm going to call it Hack Sussex. This will be kind of the infrastructure name that you've, you've given. Um, and in the parameters, so I've made this variable. And this, this bit is quite important, because if you miss out on this bit, then uh, other bits might not work for you in the workshop. You need to put in the API token that can be found inside the Google Drive and open the file API keys.xlsx. So we've got about six API tokens. If everybody could just take one at random, doesn't matter which one. Um, I hope everyone doesn't choose the first one. I'm just trying to, trying to not to hit the request limit. So pick one at random. You'll be completely fine. This is actually an open, it's an API that, that, that takes data from an open source area. So it's from somewhere called ENSOE, which is actually where we get the data for our live energy interconnector flows. Interconnectors, which I'll explain in the slides when I come back to it, are pretty much the cables between countries with electricity flows. So that would be pretty much the case study of our application. So take an API key. Take, I'm going to take the first one. Why not? Paste it in API token. Now this bucket name has to be completely unique. The reason it has to be unique is because all S3 buckets or storage areas have to be unique. 
So I'm going to call it 54378, just a random number. If you can do the same, otherwise if the person next to you does the same name, then it's going to conflict. You won't be able to create your S3 bucket. That's pretty much it. I'm going to click Next. Just click Next again. Make sure your, ver your parameters are correct. And just click on this and submit. So what's happening now is the infrastructure, which you've put in as code, which is in the YAML file, that's going to be built by AWS. Why is infrastructure as code important? So if you've, never, if you've never done DevOps, essentially, a lot of the time, you might want to deploy something in a dev and then pre-prod and then prod environment. Or you might have to do redeploy something after you've changed it, broken it, whatever, but you want it to be consistent. So it's best to always put it as infrastructure as code. So that can either be through CloudFormation, which is AWS's way of infrastructure as code, or something called Terraform, which is cloud agnostic, which you can use in Google Cloud Platform, AWS, Azure. If you learn how to do Terraform, then you can pretty much do uh, Terraform for pretty much all the services. And this doesn't stop at AWS it can, or cloud services. It could go to Snowflake, which I guess is a cloud service, but also a data cloud warehouse service. So it's not really the typical type of cloud service you'll get with AWS. Anyway, whilst that, that's building, I'm going to go back to the slides and explain a little bit on context of what we're doing. So a brief intro into the case study, wholesale markets. Um, so we're going to look at kind of the, the role of a short-term trader, or a shift trader, we call them. So like I said this morning, um, when you walk into the trading floor, you'll see alarms blaring. People are trading energy live on the spot. And their job is pretty much to make sure that we get the market, the, the, the net imbalance of supply and demand to be zero for our customers. So this here on the chart on the left is pretty much National Grid's estimation of supply and demand. And we want that imbalance to be zero. So that imbalance tends to be inaccurate. This forecast tends to be inaccurate. So at EDF, we need to create our own forecasts. We need to be able to create our own forecast of the prices, understand where we are in the market, and what we want to do, and how can we buy and sell energy so that the net imbalance is zero. And as demand increases, you know, you get more expensive generators that come to life. It's, so then, therefore, you kind of got a market. You've got energy that fluctuates in price, and you need to trade that energy. So you get a market. So short-term traders, their job is pretty much to trade on that market to make sure energy is coming to our customers. And so it's pretty much the glue between generators and suppliers. Of course, we have our own generators. And the energy we create with our generators, we tend to pretty much buy and then use to our customers at a fair price. But we also have to buy energy from other generators make sure that we pretty much hit that demand. And they can either trade on the wholesale market, on exchanges like Epex or Nordpool, uh, or they can pretty much trade directly with contracts. But enough about whatever that trading stuff is. To be honest, I don't really know. I always go into the office and I'm like, OK, tell me what type of application you want to build. I, I don't really know the context behind all this, although I'd like to. And I'm still learning. It's a really, 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 really tough topic be honest there's just so many so many topics within it but what we're going to do is we're going to go look at a case study called the net imbalance volume tool so this is pretty much a tool it's a serverless application hosted on aws and we're going to make a really simple similar one that's just pretty much a live graph on the screen and we're going to see the interconnector flows so that's the flows between countries so i'm not going to go through this slide too much technical elements about what traders do. It's pretty much, we just want to put a, a graph on a screen. Although if you're, you're interested, you can always come by and talk to us about it if you kind of want to have some ideas for maybe your hackathon. Um, but this is pretty much just explaining how we use a little bit of ML, a little bit of 
predicting on telling the traders how much of a percentage we are short in the market. So then they know what decisions to make. So this is the actual architecture of the NIF tool. It's not entirely serverless. Um, we do use some on-prem databases here, but we use a lot of AWS services, and that can, that can be messaging services or anything like that. But the end result is pretty much, you've got a UI, your UI is connecting to an API, querying an API, and that queries a Lambda, which then can take data from a database, which is something similar with what we're about to do. So this is one of the interconnector screens of the NIV tool. I appreciate there's a lot going on. Um, traders like that. They like to see all these little lines and graphs and say, oh yeah, I can pick out what, what, what that says, or what am I looking at here with Norway and Belgium and the electricity flows between all that. So this is pretty much what we're going to make, but a really miniature version. We're just going to get the live outflows. So like I said earlier, interconnectors, they are the flows between countries. So for example, from um, Ireland, Norway, uh, and all that. And, th and the traders, they also trade that energy. So we're going to make this, pretty much. This is our proposed serverless application. So with a mouse, what we're going to do is, what the CloudFormation is building at the moment is it's building an S3 bucket. So this S3 bucket is where you're going to store the front end code. It's going to build a, f a cloud front. This is pretty much where your users will, will access the link. CloudFront has quite a few advantages. It's pretty much, for example, it could be a caching service where someone from another part of the world might want to access your application. Uh, and then you can, they can load the application and it could cache specifically at that edge location. So the location where AWS might have some servers, it'd be a lot quicker for them, or there could be some security things that you need to do, various applications that you could use. Um, so that's part of the infrastructure's code, and it's going to build these lambdas, which are cloud functions, and these cloud functions are going to process some of the things that you have. Uh, so for example, I was talking earlier about event-driven applications and how we want cloud functions to have a single function, right? So this particular cloud function will query an API, it will take that data, um, and then put it into a DynamoDB. So your API token, which you've just put in, is actually going to be put into a parameter store where we can then access. And for various security reasons, you should put security things like API tokens in a parameter store. So no one can go and look at your code and say, well, I can see this API. I'm just going to take it and use it. So that's pretty much what the Lambda does. And event branch here is an AWS service that schedules that Lambda. That Lambda will then take data and put it into the DynamoDB, which then in the S3 bucket where your front end code is hosted, and when that actually goes back to your user, so this bit's a bit subjective, this arrow can actually come from the users. This user will query that API, and then that will activate this Lambda, which pulls out from a DynamoDB database, which you created. So you're pretty much stepping away kind of from if you're a Python developer, you know, creating a Flask application or trying to create servers and putting that application on that server. You're more stepping towards a decoupled architecture now. So you've got some code in various elements and th this decoupled architecture has uh, code in, in various places which has a single function. So for example, event bridge, you don't need to code how many times that queries the API. That's uh, pretty much part of the infrastructure. So, right, I was talking about serverless. Um, why do we want to do serverless? Uh, it's pretty much the modern way to build applications. Uh, we don't want to manage infrastructure. As developers, we pretty much just want to code, right? Get the job done, code. We don't want to manage a lot of servers. Um, and scaling. And scaling has always been an issue in the past when we build you know, big monolithic applications. You want to scale, or you want to buy more hardware. No. On AWS, you can pretty much just, you know, I'm a startup, pretty much got no money. I'm going to get an, on an AWS free tier account. 
and I'm just going to put my application onto there. Design a, a decoupled application, put it on AWS. There you go, done, dusted. Actually, a lot of um, AWS does this really cool thing called uh, serverless espresso. Which I think I've got the sticker on the back of my my laptop where they've essentially showcased how you can do event-driven architectures with uh, a coffee shop. And it's really, really intuitive. It's pretty much just a messaging service. You know, you've got coffee that needs to be made, and then it goes up on the screen. You know, actually on at McDonald's or anywhere, you might you might have seen those numbers pop up on the screen. And a lot of the times they do use serverless architectures. So if you've got the, the chance, have a look at serverless espresso. They've got a really good demo for that. All right. So that's the careers page QR. We're going to go back to that pretty much at the end of the workshop. But we're going to get into it. So if you navigate back to the CloudFormation, you'll see that everything's pretty much built. Um, I'm going to show a little bit about the code. So what you've uploaded was a YAML file. And within that YAML file, you've essentially got uh, just some code that's, well, in a YAML format. And for example, you want to tell it to build the bucket you want to tell it to build um, a bucket policy, which is essentially a set of rules to say who can access the bucket. Um, and sometimes, I guess, you need to think about security. And we have to follow the least privilege rule, the, the rule of least privilege. So whenever you create a service, you create a set of rules, always make sure that it has the least privilege. So for example, you want something to read a database then only give it permissions to read a database. Otherwise, if a hacker or anyone gets a hand of that role, you're pretty much, can't say anything bad, can I? But um, it's not good, basically. So yeah, um, this code pretty much just outlines all of that. So what we have in the console, you know, you tick all those tick boxes, you have those multiple choices, and you input various elements in the console. It's all pretty much converted into code. Um, so if I wanted to change that API token name, for example, this part here is the infrastructure's code to change that API token name. Like say, Enso API token, if I put a two on there, it'll pretty much, when you rebuild the infrastructure, it'll change the two. So like I said, with IAC infrastructure's code, it's extremely important just so that we can keep things consistent. So everything here is pretty much built in there, as I said earlier, with DynamoDB. Uh, we've got some roles with the DynamoDB associated with it. So the role has access to put in the DynamoDB um, or read from the DynamoDB. Uh, but if you've got some more time, it might be really cool to go through the CloudFormation. Or you know what? Uh, we're pretty much by the, the stand all day, so if you want to go through the cloud formation, I can always talk you through and what I've done on here. There are some various elements that I've left out so that we could do some console work. For example, in the cloud function, I've put a random function, which is pretty much hello from Lambda. So we will be replacing that code with the pre-written code. So that's what you've just uploaded, and that's what's been building in the background. And as you can see here, everything is completed. Create has completed. So I'm going to take an example. For example, if we go to uh, the architecture diagram again, and we want to see whether or not the DynamoDB has built. So that's a database. It's a NoSQL database. We're going to go navigate to DynamoDB, and we're going to see that it now exists. Right. Might just open a new tab. Okay. I've refreshed it. That works. That doesn't work. Is everyone else's internet okay? Slow? Hmm. I'm on the Hack Sussex one. Yeah. 
yeah, I'll try and disconnect and uh, reconnect, I guess. So what do you do with that? Oh, you just. I was, yeah. Have you got you've got all that? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I. Okay. Well, um, Elias is just plugging in the Ethernet. I hope he is anyway. In the meantime, if you want to follow along with the documentation, it's completely fine. They're obviously more dedicated to the hack. Cool, sounds good. Right, so back to it. I'm gonna speed up a bit now. So back to the management console. We're gonna go back to DynamoDB and we're gonna have a look to see if our resource has been created. Right, if we explore items, we'll see that the database that called interconnected data is now built. So your cloud formations worked, it's created something, hooray. Now what we wanna do is we wanna go back to the architecture diagram and we wanna build this bit here, which is the Lambda querying the API. And so we'll do that by uploading some code that I've already written. So we'll go over to, navigate over to Lambda, by the way, if you've never touched AWS before and you go into an interview and you say, oh, I've done an end-to-end -end application and deployed it onto the cloud, I think they'd be very happy with that. So we're gonna go to <laughs> NSOE, so DynamoDB uh, interconnector. So this is the Lambda that pretty much pulls API calls, uh, pulls the data from an API call and puts it into our DynamoDB. And if you can see at the bottom here, this is where the code is actually hosted. So this was the sample code that I have put in. Um, we're gonna replace that with something that I put into a zip file. Um, so I guess that'd be the next step, wouldn't it? So if you go back to the um, developer workshop files, so download this file here called lambda.zip. I can find the download, oh, there it is. And for any of you that's already ahead of me, press upload and upload the zip file. So this will upload the code. So whilst we're waiting for that to download, I'll just show you a little bit of the code. What's essentially gonna happen is it's going to so it's some Python code. I wrote this 
pretty much uh, a few months ago, pretty much put it together just for the workshop. It's pretty much going to take data uh, for a certain date range for today and tomorrow. Uh, it's going to get the net flow, so it's going to pretty much minus the outward flow from the UK to the inward flow to the UK, um, and then pretty much get the data and put it into a DynamoDB. So the only the only one thing in this code that I want to highlight is pretty much Boto3. So Boto3 is AWS's Python package, the Python package that you can use to interact with AWS services. So if you want to deploy new services or if you want to interact with AWS services, that's pretty much what it does. You can use Boto3 to do this. Um, so this here with DynamoDB, I'm actually using the Python package Boto3. So I, I created a client here um, just so that I can, well, interact with AWS resources with Python. So I'm going to upload that zip file now. One well, I've just downloaded. Should take some time. The uh, conference's Wi-Fi is so much better. I wish I could share the details. Well, I guess most of your students anyway. Whilst that uploads, I'm going to open another tab so we can continue. I'm going to re-upload it. That's uploading in the background. So with this particular um, uh, API, uh, if you refer back to the diagram, what we wanted to do was we wanted to uh, have event bridge schedule that API so that we query the API at a one minute interval. And it will also access the parameter store, which is where your API token is. So the thing missing here is the trigger, which we'll need to add. So I've already pre-built the event bridge. Um, just going back in case any of you are following me. Uh, right, let's go back to Lambda. This is the Lambda page. Click on Add Trigger. We should have already created an event bridge trigger. So you just have to look for the existing rule. Click on the existing rule and press Add. So that should be the existing rule that you've created with the CloudFormation. Um, and you've pretty much got your trigger. And hopefully this code, yep, it's finished. Code's finished. There's a trigger now. I'm just going to refresh this page to make sure it's updated everything. Um, and we're going to go down to the Test tab here just to make sure that it works. So we've got a Test tab down here at the Lambda itself. We're going to press, I'll call the name test, whatever you like. Click on test, and hopefully, if it's nice to me, it would turn green. So green means, essentially, everything works. So that particular one script of code has pretty much moved data, took data from that API, and then put it into the DynamoDB database. So it's taken it from the ENSOE API, which is pretty much where we get our data for our interconnector flows, um, and it's put it in the DynamoDB. So I'm just going to prove this to you in case any of you think I'm lying. We're going to go over to DynamoDB, and we're going to go to Explore Items, and there you go. You've got data. So you've got your daytime, date, and some 
energy flows between the countries, Belgium, France, Netherlands. So what I'm trying to get at here to everyone is that you can decouple parts of an application. You can put it into scripts and make sure that uh, it functions as a single, well, as a single purpose is the word that I'm looking for. And therefore deploy that in multiple different microservices or services. And therefore, when something goes wrong, you'll know exactly what has gone wrong and what to do about it. So this is more of the architecture that we're moving towards. So we've just created the back end where the Lambda pretty much takes from the API with some code that I've built, which pretty much took me about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so if you ever look at that code and think, oh, this isn't really efficient, please don't blame me. Um, and also, the time differences might be a bit weird. So if you look at the application, it actually is about 10 hours behind. Don't ask me why. I never really de debugged into it. But that's not the point of what I'm trying to teach you here. So we've done this bit. That's all done. All that's left is the AWS, the next AWS Lambda, and an API gateway. If you've never created an API before, today's your lucky day. You're going to create an API, and that API is going to invoke that Lambda, which you'll then take data from DynamoDB. So first thing we're going to do, go over to the Lambda, to the second Lambda, which is called get DynamoDB interconnector. Now, this one doesn't need a trigger yet. The trigger is going to be the API. So when you query that API, that's going to trigger the Lambda, and that Lambda is going to grab the data. Okay, That's what's going to happen. So with this part here, what we're going to do instead of upload a zip file is we're actually going to paste the code. So if you go to the workshop documents, you'll have the code there. But I suspect that if you copy that, you're going to get formatting issues. So what instead, what you should do is open. So it's this bit here. So you just copy, paste this. I suspect you'll have formatting issues when you paste it. I'll give it a go myself. Yep, formatting issues. OK, great. So what instead you're going to do is you're going to go to um, the folder itself, and you'll see that there's a file called lambda function.py. If you've not got an IDE, then I guess you're going to have to open this in the text editor. But I recommend downloading it and then opening it in your IDE. I've already got it here, so I'm just going to pretty much copy paste everything here. And what this is going to do is it pretty much uses BOTO3, which is what I mentioned earlier, takes from the DynamoDB, and then returns the data. So let's go back over to here and paste this. And then you've got to press deploy. If you don't press deploy, the test won't work. So that's deployed, and now we're going to test it. Moment of truth, let's make sure uh, data's coming in with that Lambda. Test. Cool. So that Lambda, that Lambda function, is pulling data in from the DynamoDB. You're querying it in that Lambda function. The way that I'm querying it is I'm pretty much taking a certain time and then taking that and then querying the Dyn DynamoDB database based on a time period. That's what's been done. So that Lambda can take data. So next thing we need to do is create the API. So a little bit of a business idea. I've been thinking about this and something that you can implement too as a student. Have you ever seen something like the news API? It's like a, an API that pretty much does some stuff that takes, scrapes news articles and stuff like that. That, what I think anyway, that assumes a similar business plan where you create 
this sort of infrastructure and you have an API and you monitor those APIs with API tokens with access as well. And people with a subscription can have those API tokens and access. And so you can provide a service that you've deployed on AWS and you've got API tokens and you've got APIs and you can pretty much do a subscription based business plan. It might be something like, I'm gonna pass in some data, use some AWS machine learning and pass back predictions based on that data. Simple as that, that's it, create a website, people will sign up to your subscription plan. So that's something that is pretty much widely implemented, to be honest. News API is the example for it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a REST API. Slightly different context to here, by the way, but just something that I wanna put out there. Um, we're gonna create new API. Uh, we'll call that API, it's a connector API. It's pretty much fine. Make sure it's a REST API, by the way. Um, we're gonna create that API. We're gonna create a get method. If you've ever seen APIs and used APIs, which you probably have, you've, got, you've used post and get, anything like that. And we're gonna link that API to the Lambda function. So now this Lambda function, when queried, I mean this API, when queried, will pretty much query that Lambda function. That lambda function is gonna grab data, pass back to the API. And uh, don't forget to do this step, by the way. Cores, there's cross origin resource access. That's not, S is not an A. Forgot what the S stands for. Sharing, thank you, David. Um, so essentially, sometimes the headers have different uh, elements and it won't it won't recognize it, so you might not be able to access the API, so it's best to enable it, at least for this workshop. Cool. And the final step to create the API is to deploy the API. Let's call it new stage, let's call it prod. That tends to be what we call things when they're in production. So I'm gonna take this link, actually I'll just click on it. So I've clicked on the API, and with any browser, you can pretty much pass this API to anyone. I didn't put any security on it, I didn't put any API keys or any API tokens, and they're getting data back. So like I said earlier, you could get someone with a business plan, create an API, uh, pass in data, and have it returned back. And it'll be pretty much like this. So you've got an API and you can access data. If you've ever wondered you know, how you're accessing data through an API, you've just deployed one. So that's, uh, that's how you created the API. So there's only one piece missing left to the diagram and that's the front end code in the S3 bucket. And pretty much apart from that, we're pretty much done. And then we'll have to tear down the resources if you noticed, if you created a free tier account, you might have noticed that you had to put your credit card details or debit card details. So we'll tear down your resources because when the free tier ends, then you might be charged for it. So you're really, really small, but still, you should tear it down afterwards. So AWS free tier is a one year free tier. So last piece of the puzzle, the S3 bucket. Now let's navigate to S3. So at the S3 bucket, we'll go to the bucket that we created. It's, these are probably buckets that I created quite a while back. And we are going to upload some files, again, from the drive. Go over to the drive, download this, build.zip. Now build.zip um, is actually JavaScript React. So it's pretty much a build. Um, it's a really simple application, or well, simple front end, where it's just a graph using chart.js, queries uh, an API, and then outputs it. 
So we're going to move that and upload that onto. So I'm going to extract all. Open build. And we're going to upload all these files. So it's important to drag and drop. If you don't drag and drop and you put add files, add folder, this is something I find a little bit annoying about this console, is when you add files, it literally just lets you add files, not folders. But if you drag and drop, it lets you do both. So I've just dragged and dropped everything in there. Right, so all that's left, we're going to go over to the, uh, so everything, all the files that we've got in the S3 bucket, that's the front end part of the code, right? So now you've got the front end part of the code hosted somewhere. We're going to go to cloud front, which is where we can access the front end. Right, just need to make sure the top one is the correct one. Yeah. You can copy this link and paste it onto the screen. And your application is pretty much here. So there's one bit missing here is basically the API. So there are various ways that we could do this. Um, we could kind of have an, an API that we could verify with Cognito, which is AWS's service and with, I think, credentials and verification, I think is the right word for it. Um, but because you're all generating different APIs, I was looking for an easy way. And you know, why not just put it as an input? So that's pretty much all that's left here. You copy the API, pass it in as an input, and you click Generate. So about five seconds, I think I put a five second thing on it. There you go. Now you've got a application, a front end application that pretty much queries data. It takes the data um, from the DynamoDB and outputs it on the front, on, well, on your screen. So you've created a full on serverless application that clearly has no servers. Well, technically it does. You know, a, a Lambda is using compute power, so you are using a service. But the point about serverless is you don't manage those servers. As a developer, you don't really care about those services. So as I said, this Lambda on a schedule grabs data here, puts it in your cloud database. Your Lambda here pulls that data, takes it um, from that database, and outputs it as a front end. So that's pretty much it, um, and that's, that's pretty much the end of the workshop. But I am going to tear down the resources in front of you for anyone who has actually created these resources and would like to know how. But if you'd like to keep it on, keep it on for as long as you like, uh, provided that it's not past the one year free tier. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear down mine here. So the first thing I'm going to do is tear down the API gateway, uh, because that's the that's the bit where we created manually, right? Everything else wasn't created manually. So I'm going to delete this. I've documented all of this, by the way, in case you're not following and you'd like to come back to it. Oh, first things first, it's the S3 bucket. So the S3 bucket will not get deleted by CloudFormation for protection unless you've emptied it. So I'm going to empty that S3 bucket. Delete. And the final bit is to tear down your cloud formation. Just delete it. 
and that should be pretty much it. You've um, so if you're following along, um, which I don't know how many of you did. I'm assuming you're pretty much all here for a fun day of hacking and not a lecture telling you like you do in the weekdays on how to do something. But I'm hoping it kind of gives you a taste of some of the things that we do at EDF. So for example, hold on, let me just open this up. So for example, as a developer, we try and use kind of modern tech stacks and we try and implement things on well, the modern way of doing thing, things, which might be serverless architectures or event-driven architectures. We do have a lot of legacy applications, which might be Excel, um, and we're trying to move a bit away from that. And part of doing so is to combat it by creating applications like the NIV tool for the traders. So there's various elements to it. Hopefully, you get a chance to actually do this workshop in your own time, because if you've not got any kind of cloud modules at uni, it's actually so prevalent in today's time. I've done this workshop and I've done this talks a couple times with meetup groups and communities. And sometimes you find that developers who pretty much just know how to code Python, for example, don't know anything about deployment onto the cloud. And this is kind of what we're trying to fix here. So especially when you go into an interview or anything like that, just make sure that you say that you know how to do these kind of things. But anyway, that wraps things up. I'll, live, I'll leave the uh, QR code up here um, and come and chat to us if you want to know more about EDF or our track or anything like that or, or just suck up to us. Completely up to you. But uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, happy hacking. All right, we can just let everyone get settled when they join in. That's OK. Uh, we'll continue. All right, so how many of you are familiar with cybersecurity term in general or have worked with 
uh, basically tools to help you in debugging, stuff like that before. I know cybersecurity sounds like a very huge term and with like a lot of white hacking going around, but it isn't. It's actually uh, can be really basic if you wanted to, and it can be something you've already been doing. So when I run this cybersecurity challenge, it I'm I assure you it won't feel like something absolutely blue out of the like out of the blue, very new, something like that. It can be really really simple and easy to get started with. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get set up for our challenge. And then I'll help you drop you hints to actually reach the result of this challenge. And you can learn the basics of cybersecurity while doing so. Pretty simple. So all right, uh, the steps are up on the screen. We'll go over them one by one. And we'll work together on these challenges like a team. All right, so first, if, you'd already, if you don't already have Node.js, you can download and install Node.js from hackp.ac slash Node.js. And we can start from there. Uh, just to get a head count, how many of you already have Node installed uh, in your laptops? All right, there are three of you, four of you, five. Everybody else, please do install. And for those of you who already have Node installed, can you check that your version matches the version of Node, which is there on the link? Uh, link is hackp.ac slash node.js. Is it visible? I can write it down if not. If you're facing any issues, just raise your hand. I'll come to your desk, and we can do this together. But the first step, pretty easy. Just download and install Node.js from this link. And it'll take you right along the steps to do that. So there's that. And once you have already checked the version, have it installed, then you can create a my.mlh.io account. I know this step most of you might not have done already. So the second step, we can just leave that as a checkpoint. Just go to my.mlh.io and then create an MLH account. Cool, awesome. Raise of hands. Uh, how many of you are done with the first step? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, still a few of you left, so I'll give you like a minute or two and let me know when you're done. Quick show of hands, how many of you already created the my.mlh.io account? Done? Done, 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 done. Awesome. All right, a few of you are left. Just continue with your work, uh, let, and we can just create another checkpoint at point three. Uh, once you're done with the my.mlh.io account, you can go to hackp.ac slash snake. Uh, the link is there. I can also write it down if no, it's not visible. But yes, you need to create an account for the Snike Cybersecurity Challenge at hackp.ac slash snike. And from there, we'll just uh, begin the challenge together. So don't just go to the next step. Finish off until the first three steps, and we'll move forward. Yes. Issue coming up.
All right, please join us. Uh, we are already at the third step, so you might want to continue and reach there quick. Okay, uh, how many of you have already made your Snyk accounts? Quick show of hands. Most of you are almost done, so we'll wait for two more minutes and then moving on to challenges.mls.io. So again, just to give you a brief, the steps that we did was just the setup because I told you this is a beginner friendly thing. We don't expect you to have anything installed or set up before. Now we're going to begin, like we begin the challenge together. So once everyone is done with the step, uh, we will press begin challenge. But for now, just go over to challenges.mlh.io where you be, you'll be able to see the challenge. And you should click into Snyke and Invisible Ink. And then just stay there. Don't click the begin challenge button yet. All right, final show of hands. Everyone done with the fourth step up until A? All done? Done, done, done. All right, cool. Sounds good. Awesome. All right, so we'll begin this challenge, and uh, we'll talk about cybersecurity along the way. So don't worry about any of the other things. I've also given you a pamphlet if you want to read upon it. I know it sounds like too much information, but there, might, there are some useful tips in there. All right, moving on. Uh, now that we have already done these steps, I'll just quickly go over them, which is downloading and installing Node.js, and then creating a Snyke account. Once you've created the Snyke account through hackp.ac slash Snyke login, there would be an option to head to app.snyke.io. You can click on that, and then it'll just create a new tab and open that application for you. Uh, and then once you are at challenges.mlh.io, we have already done the step. This is what your screen should look like. There should be an invisible link challenge with the begin challenge button. If not, just raise your hands. I'll help you out there. But this is the point where we are at. Awesome. Moving on. So now that everyone is at the same place, we will, as a group, begin this challenge. And then we'll see which one of you is, which one of you is able to find the flag quickly. So it's going to be a race of sorts. But just don't stress too much into it. We are here to learn. Uh, we will take the challenge together. So what you can do is, everyone, click on Begin the Challenge, and then click on Take the Challenge button right now. Once you do that, this page would appear. Like It'll ask you like where you're solving this challenge. You can say at a hackathon, write the name of the hackathon. Uh, but you won't be able to submit because you haven't found the flag yet. In order to find the flag, that's our challenge. We click on Take the Challenge, and then it'll take you to the next page, which would look something like this. There would be a view hint button, a package.json file, an index.js file, and a flag text box or sort. So basically, this is what you can see. Now, what you need to do is download the package.json file and the index.js file, and then put them in a folder together. So create one directory. And under that, you can just name them like cybersecurity, or call it like Sashrika's project, whatever you want to call about. Uh, but just download both of those files and put them under the same directory. Now, I know a lot of you are beginners. So how many of you have worked with a terminal before? Everyone, I assume? Yes? No? No one? All right. No worries. Uh, we will do that together as well. Absolutely fine. Uh, what When we say that navigate to the folder in your terminal, I 
What I mean is you have to change directories and be in the same directory. Now, depending on which uh, OS you have, whether it's Mac OS, Windows, or Linux, the term is different. Uh, what you can do is you can Google based on your version. I can tell you that if you call me for help, uh, which works for you. But what we need to do is we have to change the directories and be in the same folder that you just created. All right? Yes. coming up. Did you like collude or something that you're going to sit far away and make it difficult for me to reach you? All right, once you all have downloaded both the files and then save them in a folder, you can also click on the View Hint button, which is also available on the same screen. And you'll be able to view some of the details. Uh, there would be some install instructions for Snike, our sponsor, someone. <laughs> uh, so that's the tool we're going to be using to actually work through this challenge and then find the code bug. Uh, there would be the link of our GitHub, a GitHub link for installation process up there, which you can look into. And there would be some steps to install it, test it out. And now here is what I need you to do. I need you to work through these steps. I need you to find the bug. And I'll be dropping you hints along the way. You already have two files. Your hint is that the code bug is obviously in one of those files. There is a flag there. What you need to do is find that flag, whether it's a number, whether it's six, whatever it is. You have to find that flag and then submit it. If you think you have found the flag, just go ahead on the first screen that we took you, where there was a flag input button, input, and just add the detail there, click on submit, it'll tell you if it's the correct flag or not. So just keep trying, and I'll keep dropping hints, meanwhile, just to help you out if you're stuck somewhere. But I want you to just at least try with the code sample. You'll also learn more about the code. You'll also learn more about Snike. You have a few hints to work through. Just try working through them, and then if you're stuck, raise your hand.
So just to give you an so idea of the further steps, steps that you might or might not have taken, you can install Snyke CLI, which is pictured to the right. There are steps written on the hint link that was given to you. And then when you do an NPM install Snyke at latest-g, it will give you some results like this. And if you check the version, you'll be able to see Snyke installed. Now, these are just the steps that I already told you. There's a view hint button that you can check and then install that. And just try testing out, uh, playing around with the code, seeing what is, what's actually breaking, what's not working. Uh, and we'll talk about a few more hints later. Yeah, coming up. All right, so when you are already there in the terminal, you can do an npm install to download all the packages, the node packages. You can find the vulnerabilities that are present there since you already have Snyke installed. You can also have, you also have access to some commands that you can use to run on your project and then find those vulnerabilities. And please don't hesitate. Raise your hand whenever you are stuck or if you're totally confused and have no idea what's happening. I will help you out personally. I'll just run upstairs if I have to. So don't worry about that. All right, once you have that, you can, as I said, you also have access to some sneak, sneak commands that you can use, starting with authenticating it. So sneak auth is used to log in to CLI using your server. So if you have your terminal installed, like if you are using your terminal, you can actually log into Snyk from the CLI auth, a sneak auth, and then re it'll redirect, it to you, redirect you to the auth page and look something like this. So once you have that, you can go back to our sneak CDF tab and then click on the invisible link URL, and then there would be the view, a URL on top of the view hint button, the invisible link URL, and you can see something like this, which is actually another hint that you can use to test out your code and find the vulnerability. What this particular request and response on the right side means that if a user sends a post request, and for those of you who are not aware of post request, it basically means that let's say you're sending a packet, a packet of information to a certain link, a certain endpoint, and then getting a response back from them, right? So just in simpler terms, if I put it. Uh, so yeah, if you request and send a post message, get messages actually getting that information back, but post messages when you send out a request and then get a response back, the request would look something like a message which has a ping button, and the response, what we see in the response is something which is interesting. You see a user IP present, you also see a time, you see the message we sent, which is ping, but what you see is that the flag is disabled. Now, when we see that the flag is disabled, what we actually find is that somewhere in the code base, we're not able to access the flag that we want, and which means that we have to find in the code base where exactly is that missing code, or what exactly is our code doing in order to get a flag disabled response back. Does that make sense? So try to find something similar in the code base, and you'll be able to check that out. You can also use Snyke vulnerabilities to actually read up on those uh, issues that you're just trying to figure out right now. And then maybe it'll point you in the right direction.
now that you have had some time to look at the code, you can also run a snipe test, as I said, to find out about those vulnerabilities. Again, this is something you can do from your terminal. Run a snipe test and see what the results look like. What you can see is that once you run that command, you will be able to see some issues which are populating. And there are a lot of issues which are populating, but there are some which are which we are interested in to find the flag. You can read about those vulnerabilities online on Snyke website. There's also another command that you can use, which is Snyke monitor. You'll get a graphical output of the same info if you want. But again, it's just a pretty picture. If you want to use a Snyke test, that's also fine. It'll, see you, it'll t tell you about the vulnerabilities found. It'll tell you about the points that you might need to look at. And you can also read about what kind of vulnerabilities are causing your code to break, what kind of issues are causing your code not to give the flag that we want. Instead, it's giving us a disabled option.
All right, moving on. Now that you've had some time to go to like run snake test and snake monitor, there would be some URLs available for you to actually check on those issues that you just found. Starting with snake monitor, you can actually go to the snake page and see some of these things, some of these vulnerabilities. The first one, actually most of them would point to prototype pollution. Now that is an interesting term. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I first saw this, I never have, I didn't he hear about prototype pollution before. So there is an issue that you have established and Snyke is actually helping you recognize that issue. So once you go and read up about prototype pollution in that uh, file, you can actually point, it will point you towards the link and you can actually read up on this article to see where is the issue arising from. And so you can, yeah, as I was saying, you can actually read about this type of vulnerability. Prototype pollution is like an attack on JavaScript. So when I say that there is a, a vulnerability present in the code, what I mean is that your code is actually not giving you the flag. And I'll actually show you exactly where that issue is happening. So uh, what you can do is, if you remember, we talked about the post request. You can use something like hopscotch.io. If, if there's something else you want to use, you can use that too. But basically, using curl, postman, whatever it is that you're comfortable with, just send a post request to the particular endpoint and try to get uh, an, a response back. Right? It'll give you the same response you saw earlier, which is flag disabled. So right now, here we are using hopscotch.io. What I did was, if you can see, there is the URL on top, the invisible ink CTF URL slash echo, which is basically we are sending a post request to this endpoint with the message ping and asking for a response back. The flag here is disabled. And now in order to exploit the, this vulnerability that we have just found, we will send some more information in the post request to exploit the prototype pollution vulnerability we talked about earlier. So when you're actually looking at the code again, what you can see is that this particular vulnerability is something which you can, what you can do is you can actually send a request, like some response with the body, as I said, and actually bypass that entire protocol that you have in place for flags and get the flag that you want. So it's basically exploiting the code base to actually getting the value you want. And this flag is set on pro prototype object, as you can see. So it should exist as an options.flag in the code, if you can find that. Let me show you. I think I have a slide for that as well. All right, I think I sort of skipped that slide. But anywho, all right, so basically in your code base, you'll be able to see an options.flag if statement, if you can find that. And in that statement, what you see is that if your flag is coming in as null, at that point of time, the flag is set as disabled, and you're not able to actually view the flag. And so what we need is, what, we need, what we're doing actually is exploiting this particular vulnerability, sending a random flag value, and trying to figure out if we can find the original flag. Cool. So what uh, I suppose you have had some time to navigate through the code base. You might have found that code sample that I'm talking about, which includes the options.flag if statement. And through that statement, you have realized that, yes, if the flag is not null, then it'll give us the original flag value that the code is sending it, the code is actually sending to the server. So what we're doing is, earlier we just sent a message ping. 
right now, what we're doing is we are send, we adding another proto to it and setting the flag as whatever you want. You can add your name to, want, to it as, uh, if, you, if you like. Just what we need is not to keep the flag null. And a lot of these things might be like, a lot of these times you feel like, okay, you're not able to like, quite get how you to approach the solution. What we did earlier with snipe test was actually learn about this pro type of vulnerability first. And so if you read through that code, uh, through the writing sample that we just shared, you'll actually be fine that these are some of the steps that are already mentioned in those samples. And so you'll be able to figure that out on your own. But for now, just follow the hints if you're still confused about it and not sure how it's done. So yeah, if you send a flag, like whatever you add to the flag, you'll be able to get a response back. And because your flag was not null, you're able to see the flag that was found. And whatever this value is, is the actual flag we were supposed to find. So I'm not sure which step you folks are at. Uh, just raise your hands if you're stuck. All right, coming. All right, are you able to do the step, this particular one, where you send the message, set the proto? You're facing issues at the back? Sorry, can't hear you, it'll come up. Oh, OK, no worries. We'll help you out with that. All right, so for those of you who have found the flag, you can actually submit that flag on challenges.mlh.io with the hackathon name and this on the Snike CDF website. You can also join the Discord community. Uh, at hackp.ac slash snike community if you're interested in more such challenges. Uh, and yeah, that would be all. But I do have a surprise for you. So meanwhile, you are working with your code. What we're going to do is I am coming upstairs to give you a sticker. All right? Uh, and yeah, let me first give you the sticker, and then we'll talk about it. Yeah, so I shared some stickers with you. What we're doing is we have this lovely uh, Lego kit, which is an infinity 
gauntlet. And uh, on one of those stickers that I shared with you, if you turn it to the back, there should be a snike word written on that. And if you could raise your hand to whoever has that word, you won this awesome Lego set. Oh, you have that. Awesome. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's all. Thank you so much, folks, for joining me uh, for this cybersecurity challenge. I hope you had a great time. I hope you had fun learning something new about cybersecurity. If you're still stuck on the issue, I'll be here for a couple more minutes after the workshop, and I can help you out, reach the results. So, yeah, thank you so much for joining in. I hope you had a great time. So, Adrian. Yep. You did a workshop for us earlier, right? I did. Yeah. How do you think it went? Ooh, I actually I thought it went great. Um, so basically, I felt like a lot of people were following on, and I felt like there were a lot of good comments on the in the chat. So people really really were invested into it. I had a couple of people come up to me afterwards, and they were like, you know what? They don't really teach us this in uni, um, which is exactly why I was trying to do these kind of workshops because. A lot of developers out there, you know, they, they code, they know how to code, they know how to do Python, and et cetera, but they don't know how to deploy to the cloud. So I thought, yeah, I got some really good feedback from it. So I thought it was great. Oh, fantastic. Glad to hear that. And David, so you're on the graduate scheme right now. Yeah. What role are you doing? I'm currently working as a data engineer uh, within our sales and marketing function. So how is that going? Uh, how's it going? Um, yeah, it's been great. Um, where in the middle of a big project, moving from actually moving away from AWS for our data warehouse over to Snowflake, because um, it's a lot faster, um, saves us a lot of money. Okay. So we're we're doing like a massive migration of all our data engineering pipelines over. Um, yeah, cool. yeah, I've been helping out with that. So do you think Adrian's just just trying to make use of the stuff that's about to become useless at work then today? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not really. <laughs> Let me just clarify. This is a different part of things. <laughs> we still use AWS for our cloud infrastructure, but not for our main customer data lake. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Cool. And Kate, you have a Hello. different role to David, right? I do. What's we're, your role? We're both data and tech graduates. We joined in the same year, um, 2021. So I'm actually on my fourth placement of four. Um, each of them are six months long, and you sort of rotate around the business and try different roles out. Um, so I started out software engineering, working on the EDF website, and then I moved into a team that deals with like energy trading. And then I was in a finance team for a bit, and now I'm in the AI team looking at like um, natural language processing with customer interactions. Well, that's a very diverse set of roles right there. How do you find it moving from one to the other? You're always the new you're always the new person, which mm. is challenging in a way, but it's kind of what I wanted because I didn't know what kind of career I was after. I joined from a non-technical background. Um, I did a geology degree, essentially, um, and I sort of wanted to open like more doors, and this has sort of shown me four different careers um, okay. in quite rapid succession. So that's been good. The learning curve has been really steep, but that was kind of expected, and there's a lot of support. Cool. I was, I was about to say, I'm guessing they've got support along the way. They're expecting a steep learning, surely. 
Yeah. yeah. So you have like a buddy who's a graduate in the year above you who's gone through the same stuff. And then you have a career manager who stays with you the whole way through. And then you have different assignment managers for each placement that you're on. And they help like guide your progress and help you set targets and reach them. Nice. Yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, if we bring it back to Adrian for a sec. So your workshop was on uh, serverless web AWS with AWS. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you go with serverless when most people they think of online? They think of AWS, they think servers. Why serverless? Um, I reckon it, it's really, it, it's just where we're moving, to be honest. You see, a lot of the time you think, okay, I'm a computer science student, I know how to do Python, I'm, I'm a developer, I've become a developer, I create these kind of monolithic applications, I've got a bunch of Python modules, and then um, kind of deploy that on a server. I think long are the days where those kind of applications kind of exist now. It's more... Um, it's more serverless. Uh, um, there's just quite a few advantages to it. Uh, so, for example, you don't have to manage servers. That's the whole point. I it's not that we're not actually using servers. We are using servers, but we're just not managing them. So, for example, an AWS Cloud function, we're, we're making that as a, a specific use case. Like, it's only, it's only got one purpose, right? It's got to do a certain task. It's going to take data from X to Y. And so if that fails, then you know that that's where it fails and you just have to fix that one part. Um, so, and the, the thing about serverless is it's also easily scalable. So it's just, you just don't have to manage servers. You can pretty much just be a company, you know, just a startup company and you say, you know what, I want to deploy an application online. I want it to be uh, scalable. I want it to be, I don't want to be this guy that, uh, pretty much has to manage a, a server. I don't want to buy servers. I don't want to do anything like that. Um, so you know, you create an event-driven application. You create a serverless application. Um, it's just as easy as putting a code into a function, connecting it to another server, connecting it to another server. And then that's pretty much it. Easy to manage. You can always come back to it. You can fix it. You can have a look at the logs. So I just think there's just so many advantages to it. And if you look around, there's just a, a really big push in the industry towards event-driven applications, microservices, serverless. Um, so yeah, I think it, I just think it's great, cool. to be honest. I was, I was planning on having you expand, but <laughs> you've, you've expanded on every single area that I was planning to that. <laughs> <laughs> so David, yeah. yeah, remind me your role right now. I'm currently doing a data engineering role, cool. but before that I did a bit of software engineering and data science. Okay. So right now in the data engineering, yeah. What's the typical day for you? So the typical day would be to migrate over a bunch of jobs. Uh, so yeah, it's, it sounds a bit boring, but it's critical to the business. Uh, I literally uh, move jobs from r which are running on Redshift over to Snowflake. Um, I have to change the syntax, um, sometimes optimize them a little bit uh, because some, so some of the jobs were built like a long time ago by people who didn't really understand um, how data engineering pipelines should be built. So I've been uh, trying to optimize them, make them run a lot faster and quicker and save money for EDF. Cool. So yeah, that's a typical day. Um, we work fairly flexibly. So you don't, at EDF, we don't really have fixed working hours. We usually work between nine to five, but if, um, you're free to like go to the gym in the middle, go for a run, uh, take like a long lunch, as long as you uh, work uh, like make up the time in the evening, so it's quite nice to work flexibly. Like that. Nice, cool. And Kate, same question. What's a actually first? Remind me of your role again. Um, I guess I'm an AI engineer at the minute. Okay. Yeah. And what's the typical day for you then? I have two projects on the go. Um, one is like my first project that I have had sort of from the get go, which is really exciting for me. Um, I'm making a command line tool that will take an input of free unstructured text from customer interactions and will automatically like mask sensitive data. So like people's account numbers, their names, their addresses, all those sorts of things are now protected. So we're not breaking any GDPR laws. Um, so that one's really interesting for me. And I'm really proud of it because like I've sort of made it from scratch. Yeah. And then the other one, I'm helping out on a project that is detecting vulnerability in customers when they like contact us. So if they mention that they have children or that they have a disability, we can like help to guide them to like extra support that they might need. Ooh, that sounds really, those are really worthwhile things to be working on as well. Yeah, it's really I really fun. like that, yeah. <laughs> cool. So, um, 
random question for anyone who wants to. So with the, the graduate scheme you're doing, obviously you finished yours, you're still with EDF. You guys are on yours right now. If you decided you don't want to work for EDF anymore, how far do you think your graduate scheme would get you out there in the rest of the world? I'll take this one, Josh, uh, because I, I guess I finished the scheme, so uh, I could pretty much tell you everything. So essentially, just a bit of background. I started off, so I had no coding experience before this, uh, before I joined EDF. So my tech experience actually started at EDF. I started as a data scientist, as a graduate data scientist, moved on to a software engineer, and then a data engineer slash analyst, and then a DevOps engineer. So you kind of get hit with pretty much all sides of the tech career. Um, so you know how to deploy code, you know how to de uh, you know how to deal with data, you know how to create applications because you've you know I've been a DevOps engineer, software engineer, and all that. And you also pick up certifications along the way, uh, whether or not it's AWS certifications or Terraform certifications. Um, so you kind of get equipped with just a well-rounded feel. So just touching back on what I was talking about with, I say, developers who don't really know much about the cloud, which I found to be a trend pretty much everywhere. So I, I run a meetup group in London called London Python. Um, and a couple times I, so I did actually that same workshop for London Python a few months ago. And I was just speaking to the people there and they were saying pretty much exactly the same thing. They don't get much cloud exposure. You become a Python developer, you know how to code Python, but you don't deploy in the cloud. So I'd say just going through the grad scheme with EDF, knowing every single element of there is to within the tech industry, it's just, it's just great. Uh, now, if I was to you know, leave EDF and go somewhere else, I would already be equipped with just knowing how infrastructure works, knowing how code works, knowing how, and also the, the, the stakeholder management of things. You know, we, we, get, we become product owners of things. Um, my, I've, I've got kind of like a bit of a sub role at the moment. I'm, I'm leading on the data strategy in, in wholesale market services. So you kind of get that, that ability to do operational change. So once you pretty much at the end of it, you, you've just got so much experience and it's just so well-rounded. And I can code in pretty much five, six different languages now. So it's just, yeah, just a well-rounded scheme. Yeah. Well, that sounds awesome. That was a great question. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Cool. Um, cool. Okay, one more thing before we go then. Just a random thing. Obviously, I'm guessing you would all recommend getting the EDF graduate scheme? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. Uh, do you think you've had enough of the hackers coming down to see you while you've been here? <laughs> oh, we've actually had a, a quite a fair bit, but it's never enough, so. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So we need a lot more to come down. Well then, you guys heard that. We need more people coming down here. Please come, um, <laughs> talk to us. You know, awesome. I actually do, uh, we, we actually do the assessment center assessing. So we, we, did, uh, we did that last week. I did the uh, technical interview and, and I think uh, Kate helped out with the group exercise. So, you know, it's always good to get some of the ins if you're interested in the graduate scheme. Maybe set you 20 quid while you're down there to get you <laughs> the assessment center. Um, cool. So. That's all we've got time for with you guys. Thank you very much for talking with me. And I know that you guys want to watch the cup stacking just as much as I'm sure the people online want to watch as well. You can do it. Nice. So you may see them in a minute doing the cup stacking. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. Oh, no problem. Thanks. Thank you for the hosting the hackathon. Thanks. Wait, this. He's cut, he's cut Gina out. No, your fingers in the corner. No, you're oh, sorry. No. Why? Is he joking? <laughs> Yeah, I think
I think I might be too with the focus to be fair. Uh, yeah. Oh wait, I've just remembered. So I just remembered that the, the, the phone audio is live. So. <laughs> Are you able to sabotage me? <laughs> I 
Do you want me to take pictures? Yeah. Look up on the screen. What the hell is going on in the box? Richard, you did a great it's job. Like, no Ian, see you in third place. Louis, you're doing a great job. Yeah. See you in third place. The audio for this is live. Ah, everyone's doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think? You do not put your finger in front of the camera. It's the same basically.
successes. That that succeeded. That succeeding where we failed. That that we walked so they could fly. They better bloody fly. <laughs> I'm gonna have to, uh, gonna have to reposition. Oh no! Can you see people? What do you mean? It tracks people. No, no, no. It's uh, anti-aliasing. I think. Oh. Right. Are we ready? You got two minutes. Three, two, one, go. Wash up. Wash up. I can see so many people. Pick up Sol. Sol. Pick up Sol. 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 Oh, I'm sure they won't cheat, right? It's 30 seconds left when you're in there. You're so focused on that. Yeah. Oh my god, I can see you. It's shaking. Oh no, 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 no. Come on, come on. 
Oh. Stream's dead anyway. Look at the stream. That, it might come back to be fair, Dan, and then you're gonna be on that screen. But it's dead. You're really risking it all here, Dan. Oh, it's come back, Dan. Oh, Dan, you're gonna be. Oh, wait. Oh, I think Elias might. Fuck. Okay, no, it's going. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dunno. Someone asked to. I do like um, watch this guy on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> some, some of the clips that he made from the real bad guys. Oh, right? Oh, uh, yeah. uh, no. He basically <laughs> does like game design. He did game design for this guy. Yeah. Yeah. So he got to be the game designer. Like, no, I'm going to do that. 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 I'm going
Oh, it's a free for all. It's cup stacking battle royale. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Wait, Look at 
That's all right. This can be the ad man cam if you want it to be, I can just follow you around. <laughs> Can we throw it now? Yeah, throw it at any point. <laughs> oh wait, one person. Fuck. Oh, well, that was better. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Me. So he has two cups now. You the placement. <laughs> two ammunition. Go 50 seconds left. Wait. <laughs> you go. Seven How long that Seven Five seconds. Okay. Oh! Oh, that was good. That set me back. Can I have a cup? <laughs> 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 Watch out there. It's quite a lot behind.
Hello, can you all hear Hello. me? Can you all hear me? Yes. Hi! Hello everyone and welcome to MS Paint Bob Ross. How, how many of you have already been to an MS Paint Bob Ross event before? In person? Virtual? Yes, it is a thing. Why do you ask such questions? <laughs> it is a thing. Of course it's a thing. We are all here to paint using MS Paint because that's something we do every day. And so, uh, in order to make things a little more difficult, what you're going to do is search for JS Paint online. We're not going to use the recent model of MS Paint. We're going to use the original version, which would look something like this. Let me show you. And it'll trigger or probably jog your memory. Do you remember this one? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so if you search for jspaint.app, it'll take you right to the screen. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this to create a masterpiece. 
and if you want you can use the you know new version with much better features and the fancy brushes and the fancy paint but it's going to be much more fun and challenging if you use this which i'm going to be using and it will turn into a disaster but let's have like what the hell we'll have fun so uh, you can use jspaint.app, you can open that and we'll choose a painting together on the Twitch stream and then we're just going to paint. That's all as simple as that. All right. And I'm not going to show you what I'm painting up until the end. So, sorry. Yeah. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to call, as soon as we complete the paintings, we can show paintings to each other. Basically, we can show our masters. We, all know, we also have our online crowd. Uh, joining us live on stream so you can all say hi to them no thank you so much <laughs> yeah welcome community so yes we are live uh, and we have folks joining us up on stream let me just quickly remove this from the screen sorry technical difficulties Okay, awesome, yes. So folks joining us live, we will play a uh, MS Paint, a Bob Ross stream up here on screen, which you can watch and you can paint along with us. You can also open jspaint.app and then continue with that. So I, for one thing, this seems like a nice, beautiful option, which has like mountains, pink mountains of sorts. What do you all think? Should we go ahead and paint this? Sounds good? All right, awesome. I'm going to hit play and then. <laughs> well, you folks choose it. Uh, I'm just going to. Oh. Oh, it's, it's a clip. Sorry. <laughs> Moving on. All right. Let's see what she's streaming right now. Cool. Makes you sort of pretty. <laughs> Smooths everything out, but that little light area, it stays in there. Hmm, okay, the same thing in the sky here. We just sort of blend it together a little bit. But I've left some holes in the sky. Let me try again. One second. Let's see. The Twitch streams are all like really long streams, so you'll either have to yeah, go in there. Yeah, got it, got it. So we're just gonna pick the one and then start at the beginning. All right, yeah, a little I think bit we found it. All right, let's just pick something from these. I'm not sure. I don't know if they have the face to do that. I think just use it. I mean, you can use one yourself and just begin on your own. Sure. Uh -huh. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, what? It's, it's painting on its own. Oh, oh. We'll stick to Twitch. <laughs> oh. Okay.
wasn't as easy as it looks. <laughs> yeah, most people are not scared of like people like really uh, not like having enemies. Yeah. They're about to use you. They are? Did you find yeah, one? The one the one just now we saw was the one. But it was something which was already being planted. Uh, no, that was just the beginning of it. Oh, funny. Uh, this is the first time this has happened to me. Every time I pick a video from Bob Ross, it just starts from the very right timestamp. <laughs> Ads. <laughs> okay. Cool. You can stop from here. Yeah. All right. I think we found one. Success. Yes. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, for those of you folks who've joined us just now, what we're doing is we have a Bob Ross. A video up here on stream where he's painting live on canvas. The only trick is you're painting on MS Paint. And if you want to make it more challenging, just use jspaint.app. I'm going to put the link up on here so you can just use that if you don't have MS Paint installed. And yeah, just follow along. But also use a canvas that has a gray primer. And that way you can tell exactly where your liquid white is. Now, if you, if you don't have a canvas that has a gray primer, it's just a, a white primer, a little, a little trick that you can do is take a little bit of liquid black and just put a tiny little bit into your liquid white, and it'll give it a, a gray cast. And then when you paint your white canvas, you can tell exactly where it's covered. And I really, really recommend you use odorless thinner. There's a screen down here in the bottom of this bucket. Scrub the bristles against the screen, the solid material settle to the bottom, and your paint thinner, it remains relatively clean. Shake off the excess, then... <laughs> and that's the fun part of this whole technique. Tell you what, let's make a happy little sky. And for that, I'm going to go right into a touch of phthalo blue. Just a little bit, just pull a little bit of the color out, and then tap the bristles, bristles firmly into the color. This will assure a nice even distribution of paint all the way through the bristles it does not take much color just a little okay let's go right up here now then just using little crisscross strokes again laying in a basic sky and start at the top and work downward that way that way your brush will pick up the liquid white and automatically automatically your color gets lighter toward the horizon let the canvas work. Let the liquid white work. Let your brush work. You just enjoy. You just enjoy. Because painting should make you happy. Should be a fun experience. And you can always add a little more color. Start with very little color. You can always go back and add a little more. That's that's very simple. It's the same again to try to take it off, though. You can do it, but it's very difficult. Okay, and that quickly we've laid in a happy little sky. That easy. Okay, now that all we have brushed dirty, let's have a little touch of water in this painting. I love water, and it's always fun to do. So I'm going to take, go right back into my thing little blue, reach right over here and grab a touch, grab a touch, just a touch, just a touch. Another thing little green. Don't need much of that. It's very strong. Just a touch. Thalo blue and thalo green. And just tap it into the bristles again. Okay. Now decide where you want water to be. And pull from the outside in. Start on the outside. Pull in. Start on the bottom. Work up. So it gets lighter and lighter toward the horizon. Now see if you start. If you start here and go over. It leaves a very distinct line. Which is hard to blend out. There we go. But you can. If you, if you happen to forget. But blend from the outside in and leave a little. Just like so. There we go. Let's see how easy that is. Are you also using the spray paint option? I think that is the most feasible one that you can use. <laughs> I have several brushes going, and you'll find it saves you a lot of time and a lot of 
a lot of money in wasted paint if you have several brushes, if you have one for dark color and one for light. Otherwise, your good paint's going to end up down here in this washer bucket. Okay, clean brush, and I'm just going to blend right across here, very lightly. I don't want to lose this light area, but I just want to bring it all together, and it's like so. That's ready, all fixed up. Now, if you just have a tiny bit of paint on your brush, you can just wrap it like that, and it takes, it'll take that paint off. Okay, let's use the fan brush today. We'll build a happy little cloud. Let's go right into titanium white. I'm going to reach down here, be right back, get the least little touch, a little bit more of the bright red. I want to put a little sunlight in these clouds. I'll make a happy little cloud today. Happy little cloud. Okay. Decide where your cloud lives. Maybe he lives right in here. Take the corner of the brush and just make tiny little circles. Tiny little circles round and round and round. Don't stay in one place and keep working. If you just stay in one place here and, and keep grinding the paint, you're going to end up with big cotton balls up in the sky. And you can also do this just as well with a one-inch brush or, or two-inch brush. Two-inch brush makes fantastic clouds. Okay, now with a clean, dry two-inch brush, use the top corner of the brush, and you want to blend just the base of these clouds out. Not touching the top yet, just blend. See, very lightly, very, very lightly. Just like so. Just barely, barely blending. Okay, now we're going to fluff it. And this, we're going to do a big circular pattern. Just grab it gently and fluff it upward. Just fluff it. And you're going to pull up little stringy things when you do that. Don't worry about them because when you go across, they just go away. That easy. You have one beautiful little cloud. Maybe we'll maybe we'll put another happy little cloud in here. Maybe this other cloud. Maybe he lives right over here. Same thing. Tiny little circles. Just drop him in. Where do you think he should live? He lives right there. And in your world, you put a cloud where you want it. You don't necessarily need to put a cloud where I do. You put it where you think. If you think it lives somewhere else, then that's where it ought to be. There we go. Lift it gently, lift it, and very lightly, just go across. So if you all are using the spray paint to paint the sky, how do you making the clouds? Because I'm out of ideas. <laughs> Let's build, maybe we back in here, there's just a small little mountain that lives. So let's take a touch of Prussian blue, a little bit of uh, midnight black, and we're going to get a little touch of Elizabeth crimson. So we've got blue, black, Elizabeth crimson, maybe even a little Van Dyke brown. What the heck? What the heck? Just drop it in. Dark colors. Okay, pull the paint out as flat as you can get it. Just really mash down hard. And take your knife and cut across. See there? Get that little roll of paint. This knife has a straight edge on it. And by having a straight edge, it's very easy to load it. Let's go on up here. Okay. Now then maybe, maybe our little mountain. Yeah, I gotta make a big decision here. Maybe he lives right here, just floats around in the clouds. Push very firmly. Very firmly. We're trying to push this color right into the fabric and you just decide where you want little bumps to live see there's one wherever wherever you want it maybe there's a happy little thing that's right there scrape off all the excess paint just really get in there and scrape hard we can't hurt this just scrape it the only thing we're worried about is this nice outside edge in here we could care less. Now then, with a two-inch brush, I want to grab this. And because of the liquid white, the canvas is wet, you can pull this and move it. Just move it. Remember, you can see the entire mountain. It's always more distinct at the top 
the music at the bottom. And by doing this, that will happen automatically. Just like so. So you just let it sort of float off in the sky there. There we go. Because this is a very firm paint, you can blend right over it. Okay. Man, it, maybe there's some maybe there's some snow on that little mountain. So we can take some titanium white. And once again, pull it out. As flat as you can get it. Just really pull it out. And go across. Get that little roll of paint. See, there he is. Tiny little roll of paint. Let's go up here. Okay, now then, right along in here. Take the point of the knife, put it right up at the top of the mountain. No pressure. Just let it float. Just let it float right down the side of the mountain there. No pressure. See, follow the angles of the mountain. Absolutely no pressure. Okay, maybe right here. Think where light would strike. Think where the sun would shine through here. Create all these beautiful little effects. And if you're right-handed, it's not any easier for the light to come from the right side. Normally easier. See? Very delicate touch, though. Very delicate. Very, very delicate. This is a time when the little knife would come in even better. So you can get back here with a little knife and get these little places. That little son of a gun just sneaks right in there. Either knife works very well. They both have the, the straight edges and they work very good. Take a little bit of blue and white. This is a little phthalo blue. Just a touch. Just a touch. Mix it up about like so. That's good. Cut across. And once again, we have that small roll of paint right out on the edge of the knife. So you can see it's right on the end. There you go. Now then, decide which peaks fathers to weigh. If this one's in the background, put a shadow behind this one first. Just a little tiny shadow. Then a shadow here. Let it come down distinctly through. See there? Distinctly through. No pressure at all. Think in your mind that the only thing touching the canvas is that little tiny roll of paint. And each little highlight needs a shadow. If it doesn't have a shadow, it won't come out and play with you. It'll just leave you. Just leave you stranded. Okay, now then. Sometimes it's fun to play some games. All right, clean, dry brush. I'm going to tap the base of this following the angles. I want to create mist. Now lift upward very softly. Three hairs and some air over here. Do you all have the mountains ready by any chance? I agree. Uh, what about I skip the video a little bit forward so that we can make something else? No? I think people are really fixated on making, getting the details just right on the mountains, right? I feel like any more paint that I add on my painting would just make no sense because the mountains won't be visible anymore. <laughs> All the angles of highlight or light color are in the same basic direction. Same basic direction. Because light's only going to strike at a given angle coming through here. Sing. Pretend you're a sunbeam just wandering around here and having fun. Okay, now we need a shadow back here. Everywhere there's a highlight, we have to have a shadow. Just a little shadow. Just a little happy shadow. It lives right back here. See how that pops right out? Comes your friend. It's easy. Just a few little rules. Mountains are just geometric um, I shapes. I did, but I think you can only shadows. go so far with the airbrush. And you yeah. can make some of the most fantastic um, mountains. I think this is the maximum that I can do. That's great. It's great for practice. But to give you experience, it's just oh, take the canvas and start at the top. Take the from top to bottom. <laughs> It's, it's a super and now it's just there. 
by the time you're finished, you'll be good friends with the knife. Okay, tap in your base, follow those angles again. Now, you want to save that one line right there. That's a distinct line that separates these two entities. Save that. Lift upward, very gently. Whisper light. You don't want to destroy, you just want to diffuse. Over here, follow these angles. Save this line. That's a distinct line that you need. Give it a little blend. And you've got one very effective, yet very easy little mountain. And I knew you could do it. Tell you what, let's have some little footy hills that live right in here. For that, let's mix up some color. Shoot, we'll take, we had this mountain color. That was just some Prussian blue and some midnight black. We'll put some Van Dyke brown, lizard and crimson. Just a little touch of sap green. Don't want too much sap green. I'm going to reach over here and find some white. And let's see what we got here. you got to put a little white with it to know what you have. It's very difficult to tell. A little more blue in there. Oh, yeah. Just sort of play with the color till it gets like you want it. I'm looking for a color that sort of a bluish gray maybe with the least little hint of green it's too far away to have much green okay now we can lift it up like so okay and clean that and today I'll tell you what let's do let's use a one inch brush and we'll just go right into that and just pull it through just put a little, little paint on it like so just like so Okay, let's go up to the canvas. Now you have to make a big decision here. Where's your little foothills live? Maybe let's start right in here. Maybe just using a corner of the brush. Maybe they just come right down. There they come. Wherever you want it. And just sort of, sort of pull it straight down. So turn it over. Use the other corner. That one gets, gets empty. You can turn it over. Just pull straight down. But very important here. See this little misty area right in here? You want to save that mist that's between the foothill and the mountain. If you if you kill that misty area, these foothills are going to look like they're right up against the mountain. You don't want that. Okay. Now then, time to wash your brush. I've put off washing the brushes so I'm about to run out. Good shake. <laughs> and just beat the devil out of there. Now, I want to create mist at the base of this foothill. So here, all we're going to do, and pay attention, pay attention here to the angles. This foothill is going to sort of be coming down this way. Just like so. All right, would you like to share your paintings if you have completed some of it? I mean, do you want to come up here and share it on screen? Okay, yeah, sure. Five minutes. Five final minutes and then we'll see some paintings. I'll start with mine to just get some pressure off <laughs> that the painting need not be the best version of, you know, digital art. <laughs> these colors on your brush shoot no big deal green in there not much green it's too far away okay now maybe maybe this one lives right along in here somewhere there he goes there he goes see this one's a little darker so it'll stand out now sometimes you want to make something that looks like a little individual trees you can just take a brush and turn it on the end see pull down and it makes little more distinct things, depending on the effect that you want to achieve. Maybe this comes right on down. You just sort of have to make a big decision and decide where it lives. Look at there. It's that easy, though. And I'll show you, show you something that's fun here. Maybe you decide in here, maybe there's a little separation, and this one comes right on down here. See, you can, you can sort of pull them apart and make more than one that easy. 
and you just take them wherever you want them to go. Kind of a super way, though, just to make some, some happy little foothills that live back here in the distance. Maybe over here this one comes up a little. I don't know. Whatever you think. Whatever you think, you just put them in. Okay. Now then, with our two-inch brush, still paying attention to the lay of the land, we can sort of begin tapping this just wherever you think it should go. There. Don't want to destroy this little line, though. If we're going to keep that in, we'll go in between there and just tap with the corner of the brush to soften. Like so. Okay, in short little strokes, lift straight up. Even if this comes down the hill, lift it straight up. Straight up, straight up, straight up. Always. If you lean it to the side and lift, it'll look like a little tree is far away. Look like the wind's blowing a thousand miles an hour and make it blow them away. There, straight up. There we go. And then very lightly. Just blend it. Now, okay, but in that one super way to make some happy little foothills. And we're that easy. Very easy. I'll tell you what, let's do. I find, uh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> Can't find my brush, you know. When you get old, the mind's the second thing to go. Okay, we'll take some of that dark color. Do some black and some blue. I want this to be very, very dark. Black and blue, we'll get some little brown, little sap green. This should look black. It should be so dark. Now pull this brush through the paint. As you pull it through, wiggle it. See? Wiggle it. And then sharpen it. That'll bring the brush to a super sharp chisel edge. Super sharp edge. There you can see it. It's very sharp. And the only reason it's sharp is because you have so much paint in there. It's literally just stuck the bristles together. Okay, now then. Maybe back in here. Way back in the distance, there's some little evergreens that live. Now, the only way to make these show is to save this little misty area. So touch it with just that nice chisel edge. See here? Don't kill that little misty area that's in between. And every so often, reload your brush to bring it back to a nice sharp edge. And you can begin dropping in all kinds of just happy little distant trees. We're not looking for distinct shape yet. They're too far away still. Too far away. When they get closer, then we'll worry about individual shapes. Right now, all we're trying to do, there, just, just sort of tap. Hmm, isn't that fun? It's a super little way to make a lot of trees. Now, if you get them too far apart, if you, let's just do some here. See, if you put them like this, they're very rapidly they're going to look like telephone poles or a fence post. If that happens, just put some more in there. This means you don't have quite enough. Not quite enough. Reload your brush frequently. And maybe as they wander out here, they get a little bit bigger. And by making them bigger out here and smaller toward the center, it'll create the illusion of a little pond here. You'll see what I mean in just a second. But sort of let them get bigger toward the outside edges, and it makes a wonderful effect. A wonderful effect. It'll make you happy. And if you're interested in selling paintings, hmm, that's what I sell them. Uh, do you want to share your masterpieces up here now? All right, cool. Let me just give it a quick pause. There you go. Awesome. All right, who wants to come up here first? <laughs> yeah, you can take a time to just add some finishing touches, right? All right, uh, do you have it on your phone? Uh, do you want to share this image on Discord? I can yeah, pop it's it Yeah, I've put it on the Discord if you want to have a look. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah. 
There you go. Yay. I mean, you cheated, but an awesome picture, indeed. <laughs> All right, uh, no worries. Ooh, that's actually a pretty good painting. One second. There you go. Wow. <laughs> Work of art. I can actually see your trees and strokes. Let me show you my painting, and then you'll see why I'm saying that You know, all of these paintings are so brilliant. See? <laughs> Awesome. All right, who wants to come up here next? Come on, come on, come on, come up. All right, we have some more paintings on Discord, and I'll just line them up meanwhile. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> there you go. Come on screen. It should work. Yes. Woo. That's a pretty good painting from someone who didn't cheat. <laughs> Thank you. Please drop one. All right, so we have a few paintings that were submitted online. Let me show you those as well. So this is another one. Oh, give it a minute. There you go. That's one. Is it a, is it someone is it posted by someone who is joining us online or is it posted by someone who's here? Woo! Yay! <laughs> All right, do you want to show yours? There you go. Yeah. All right, awesome. <laughs> Got it. Another painting up com coming up on screen in That's a good. Give, give it a second. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, it says David Ross. <laughs> Is your name actually Ross or <laughs> <laughs> uh, that definitely makes sense. Oh, no worries. I will grab that for you. Okay, we have some more masterpieces. Let me just pull these up. All right, we have some great masterpieces right here. So we'll just go over them one by one. So this is one by Grabby Toes, I believe. Uh, oh wow, we have them here, so yay. <laughs> nice painting, I can, I can see the trees actually in this painting, which is, which is awesome. I don't know how you managed to do that. I used spray paint and it just made it a mess. <laughs> All right, next up by Henry. There you go, woo! Awesome. Next we have by Agent P. Who is Agent P? Is Agent P here? Lovely. Oh, wow. I can see the difference between the snow strokes as well. So, great job. Woo! <laughs> I mean, come on, people. Hype them up. They painted amazing pieces. I mean, amazing art pieces. All right. Next up we have by Jamie. There you go. Woo! <laughs> I mean, I know you're just mimicking me, but that's fine. <laughs> All right, next by Kitty, I believe. Nice. And we have by SG Plague. Wow. And there we have, oh my goodness. That doesn't look real to me. Um, 
Ja. Like, who shared this photo? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no one's claiming it. I mean, either you're a really good artist or it's just, you just fooled us all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up we have side a side A. I see the artistic point. <laughs> I very brave creative choice with the orange skies you definitely think out of the box. <laughs> yeah. Correct. All right, next. <laughs> I got mad and made this instead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then we have an abstract ad. Wow. Nice. Next, uh, that's was by Charlotte. Next up, we have a 100% cheated painting. Wow. Brilliant. Honesty. We love it. <laughs> <laughs> And then we have another one by Ree. Wow. Love it. Absolutely brilliant art. And then we have, I think that's the last one. Wow. You guys are amazing. You folks have done it. Wow. Great. Awesome, folks. Uh, that was a f just a fun interactive mini event for MS Paint Bob Ross. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you had an incredible time and got a break from the tough hacking you've been doing. There's some stickers here on the table for you, some stickers outside on the MLH booth if you want to grab those. And thank you so much for joining. See you. Also, guys, the pizza has just arrived. So when you head out, head left and go get your stamp and pizza. Enjoy.
welcome back to Hacksaw 23. Um, we'll be giving you a quick tour just of the facilities and what's happening. We're a third of the way through the hack, so I guess we'll go see what everyone's up to. As you see, our sponsors have headed home. They are not staying here for the night, um, but we'll be moving through um, the venue. We have just had pizza for dinner, which is great. So we will be then moving past the uh, catering. We'll go past our wonderful reception. Um, a lot quieter here. All the hackers are very busy. We'll be visiting them shortly. Um, as you can see, we have just had some wonderful pizza from the lovely Pizza Me down in Brighton. <laughs> Anton serving food very nicely. Um, so if we go through here, we can take a quick look into one of the hacker areas. So through here into our reception area, we now have our first load of hackers. As you can see, very busy, very busy. Um, we'll take a quick look at what these guys are working on. How's it going, guys? You guys doing well? Uh, no. Yeah, we're uh, trying to suck up a, a little bit of reading data off of the, the analog data from the album. Oh, okay, so these guys are having some problems. They're rewiring a cassette player, is it? In essence, we're using the we're using the tape of the cassette to act as the tape in our Turing machine, and then we're using the head to act as our read and our write. We've had to already do plenty of hacky things. Uh, for example, the uh, speaker over here has come from an old pair of headphones I had because the speaker that came with it is broken, and we've managed to re we've managed to write to the cassette by directly sending analog signals through a 3.5 millimeter jack, which we've connected copper to. However, we do have... Looks very impressive to me. So you're, you're getting there then. You're we're actually, getting you're, there, we're getting there. you're making actually, progress. We're making progress. And now we are having some more difficulties in uh, reading off the cassette. Right, okay. Well, I mean, good luck with that. You guys seem like you know what you're doing. You've definitely got all the kit here. Um, and you've got plenty of time. We're only a third of the way through the hacking time. So you're doing well. But yeah, good luck, guys. So we've got some more guys going on here. Another very hardware heavy team. What are you guys working on? Uh, shape memory robot hand. Right, and you guys have got the memory wire, is it? Yeah. So you're powering the wire and basically that's essentially making it return to its shape. So these guys are sort of using it as a kind of sort of, yeah, almost like a muscle, yeah, to sort of contract and change shape. Um, but this, you guys really look like you're getting involved and you've got a lot of prototyping going on. <laughs> no, it looks great. Oh, so it's, it's moving. Contracting further. So you're sort of improving, I guess, the... Wow, that is really cool. So you sort of... How do you set it? How do you set the muscle memory? Ah, I see. So you heat it very hot. And then that's its sort of memory. That's yeah. its memory. Very nice, very nice. Very clever. Very nice. Well, I mean, we're a third of the way through the hacking time, so you've got plenty of time left. So keep going with it, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys can win some prizes. Wonderful. Good luck, guys. So over here we've got these guys. Enjoying the pizza, are we? <laughs> we'll move on into the main hacking area. You guys all right? We're just doing a quick tour of the labs. Um, you guys have got a lot of statistics going on here. What's this? <laughs> is this graph analysis or what is it? Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Well, what we got over here? We got something making noise over here. I don't know what you guys are. This is probably awful for the audio. I might run away from this because I feel like it's probably going to ruin the audio. It looks, it looks very good though. It looks very good. Elias, is that ruining the audio by chance on the stream? Should we run away very quickly? And these guys over here jamming out, looking very hard working. Keep it up guys, keep it up. So we've got some more, looks like a game over here. These guys might be working towards the throwables task. Are you guys making a game? Is it throwing by chance? Wonderful, wonderful. So they're going for the electric square, Joy of the Throw track, um, which 
Hackiest hack. I think I think majority of people go for the hackiest hack. But uh, yeah, definitely very centered around Electric Square. I'm sure they'll enjoy it. But yeah, you're a third of the way through, guys. So you got you got a lot of time left. But keep at it. Good luck. They're looking around. We've got lots of people with their nice sweets, snacks. Everyone very settled in, actually. You guys all right? Having fun? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. A lot of a lot of hard working going on here, which is great. It's good to see. <laughs> Don't want to bother too many people while they're in the depths of their hacking. Lots of hardware, Raspberry Pis, by the looks of things. <laughs> you guys fancy a chat? <laughs> what, where are you guys at to? trying to set up oh you've got Sorry, a graph going on here what we've got going is a system where this switch controller controls the mouse so we can move around in game with both controllers together and use the uh movements to throw throwing knives that curve at whatever we're looking at wow so you've got two mice on screen or are you just changing the position every other frame is every, that uh, it's meant to go back every frame but the controller doesn't send a signal every frame i see i see well, it looks like you guys are definitely, you're going for the throwing track as well. We had another team down there who are also going for the throwing track. So you've got competition. Oh. You're not scared? You're not scared? Not, not intimidated at all. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not judging yet. We're, we'll judge later. So, uh, I, I mean, I think you guys, I think you guys have great projects. I think the control is definitely a really interactive part. I mean, Especially with the one of the bonus points for Electric Square being a satisfying throw, I feel like if you get if you get the connection right between hand movement and actual you know physical impact in the game, that is that is definitely going to get you some extra points. Okay. But yeah, you guys look like you're definitely making progress. We're a third of the way through, so you've got plenty of time left. Um, but yeah, good luck. Okay, well, I'm under the impression all three of us are staying overnight. I mean, it's up to you. It's up to you guys what you do. You've got a lovely you've got a lovely lounge. <laughs> but yeah, good luck, guys. See ya. So we'll now go through to the lounge area, show you guys what um, what extra stuff we've got in store for our in-person hackers. So around here we've got our lounge area, quite quiet at the moment. As you can see, everyone's very busy hacking. We've got the remains of our tuck shop. Um, hey, went down very... Hey, <laughs> hey, everyone's saying hi to their uh, their parents here, which is interesting. Um, we've got um, our snacks that are our snacks that are going to be um, hopefully replenished throughout the hack. <laughs> we got some people relaxing over here. You guys all right? Taking it easy, having a break. More than so, yes. Yeah. Well earned break. Well earned break from some of our lovely volunteers over here. We've got our lovely drawing wall. You might need to back up to uh, get this fully in frame, but this is where we get everyone to sign. Um, so this is kind of our collage of Hack Sussex. I think we're having some trouble with the uh, camera feed, but there is a um, there is a, a wall here that people are signing, um, and essentially it's just sort of a collage, um, similar to what Reddit did not too long ago with their sort of pixels. Our place had where everyone could have a pixel, everyone can have their little area on this wall, um, and it's a nice photo opportunity for people to take. Um, so then that brings us back round here. Um, we then have our booths. Um, for people to chill out, nice quiet space. We've got a lovely foosball table, which many of our hackers have been enjoying. Um, and then back around here, that brings us back out to where we started in the sponsor area. So we'll now go back, back round and we'll return back to the sponsor area. So that is the full extent of our hackathon. Um, and hopefully you guys are all enjoying your hack so far. Um, you're a third of the way through, so you've got um, plenty of time left if you are spending it hacking all night long. Um, but yeah, we hope that you guys have been enjoying it so far. And any questions, throw them in the Discord. Um, but otherwise, back to the other guys and we'll have a break. Thank you.
Welcome back to day two of Hack Sussex 2023. So um, hope you've all been hacking overnight and getting your projects done. Um, we do have um, the soft deadline coming up at 11 o'clock, so make sure you do have your dev post submitted. Um, you can make changes after this time, but you'll need to at least submit something so that we know your project is on its way to completion. Um, the hacking will finish at 12 o'clock, so by 12 you will have to have it submitted. Um, and with the submission, you'll need to make sure you're all registered on DevPost um, and make sure to include your Discord handles as part of the submission. For anyone who submitted before this point, we have added that as a um, requirement, so you may need to go back in and fill that in. Um, that's just so we can verify that you are ticket holders for the event. Um, for in-person people, for the judging criteria, you'll have to prepare some kind of pitch. You'll get three minutes for the presentation, so you'll be doing that in the lecture hall. Please make sure you've got a laptop handy, ready to plug the HDMI in and you'll need to have your pitch ready to showcase your product, sort of a prototype, a demo, and any hardware that you might need as well. You'll need to have that all ready. You'll get three minutes to show and present, and there'll be two minutes of questioning, um, and that'll be towards the judging. For the Electric Square submissions, anyone doing a game for the Joy of the Throw track, you will need to uh, make sure to include an executable file, so a .exe, along with your submission. That's so that they can go through it after and have a quick play of it themselves. Um, and for the pitching in person, um, you'll need to make sure you cover all the topics for the tracks that you're submitting to. So just make sure you emphasize the areas that you've been working on so that um, each track knows individually what you've been working towards and how it might relate to their topic. For the online submissions, um, again, make sure that you include your Discord handle, um, you'll need to submit and you'll need to provide a three minute presentation video. So that can just be a pre-made video that showcases each part of your project um, and that will be easy for easier for us to go through and judge through all the online submissions. So um, after hacking finishes, we'll then have a short break um, and presentations will start at one o'clock. So that's, um, that's the schedule for today. And shortly we will be going over a DevPost workshop. So um, MLH will be going through how to submit to DevPost um, and how to just get all your submission tidied up ready for the final deadline. Um, we hope you've all enjoyed it so far. Um, it's been really great having you all here. Um, it's so great to be back finally with our hackathon, our first hackathon since 2019 due to the pandemic. Um, we've really been enjoying it. Um, and we will be resuming, I think, shortly with the DevPost workshop. Thank you so much.
What happens when your internet goes down? Yes, you play a game of Chrome Dino because you have nothing else to do and there's nothing better to do when the internet is not there, right? So we're going to play a quick game of Chrome Dino. We're gonna, what I'm going to do is ask you to come up here on stage and play it on my laptop. And I know you might be a pro at that game now. You have an all-time high score, which you, have, like, which you beat every time you play another game. But here's where it gets interesting. When you have to play Chrome Dino up here, there's an additional challenge of playing this or that with me. Have you played this or that before? Where? OK, don't worry about it. This or that is just, I'll give you two options. You have to pick one, and it's going to be rapid fire. So just keep continuing, keep picking, and then keep playing that Chrome Dino game. And it gets challenging, because I'm pretty sure you won't be able to beat your high score up here when you're playing that game. Sounds interesting enough? Who's up for the challenge? All right, awesome. Uh, cool. So. To make it more interesting, we'll also take some suggestions from the audience later. But for now, let's start with one game quickly. All right, so we have one. Uh, somebody else also raised their hands up. So two, and then three. Three folks up for the challenge. So all right, all right, you would also be there fourth. You can come up first, and we're just going to get you connected. One second. Yeah, I mean, disconnected. <laughs> All right, let's see if our screen is up. This, is, this will be daunting. <laughs> let's see, OK. All right. Oh, yeah. All right, wait, hold on. All right, it's already up. Uh, you, you have a keyboard, all right? That should work? Cool, then you can just play on my laptop. You already have the screen up there. All you gotta do is use the keyboard here and look at that place. <laughs> do you want what I can? That's fine. I can also like stop it again if you want. That way we can. I just thought here is that easier? Oh yeah. Okay, let's just let's just mirror. Do you want to do a trial run? You've never played Chrome Dino before, have you? I've never played it, no. OK, awesome. All right, we are playing with someone who has never played Chrome Dino before, so it's going to be a challenge. It's like the least you can say. All right, so awesome. Are you ready? No. <laughs> We're going to play anyway. All right, so as soon as you're ready, press place to play, and I'll ask you questions. And just so everyone can hear you, I'll just be doing this and this. Yep, OK. <laughs> Works for us? <laughs> All right, cool. Awesome. Uh, yes. Go. Let's do a countdown. OK, no. It's OK. We're already there. So the, uh, the dino is all set. OK, wow. We <laughs> what difference do you want to give? <laughs> you got a standing ovation, my friend. See? <laughs> Interesting. Should we give him another chance? Oh, the audience has spoken. Thank you so much. You might have a chance later. Who's the next person up here on through live with us? All right, come up. Yeah. <laughs> so pro tip for anyone who's coming up here to play Chrome Dino, practice a little. <laughs> All right, come on. Uh, all you need to do is press play whenever you're ready. If you want, we can do a quick countdown. Uh, all right, three, two, one, press play. 
All right, vacation or staycation? Vacation. Coffee or tea? Neither. <laughs> Car or bike? Bike. Cooking or just order it? I thought you said cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> roommates or you would like rather live alone? Roommates. If uh, would you rather have sneaker like own sneakers or dress shoes? S sneakers, definitely. Reality shows or documentaries? Uh, documentaries. English or math? Maths. Gym or art? Art. Do you win a race or win a debate? Uh, win a race. Dogs or cats? Cats. <laughs> Fast food or healthy food? Uh, healthy food. Eggs or pancakes? <laughs> awesome, great food. Pancakes. <laughs> Lovely, awesome. All right, we have, we have I think, time for one more Chrome Dino. I know I asked a bunch of you over there, but who was the third person who was going to come up here on screen? Okay. I don't remember which one. Okay, yeah, come on up. All right, we have one more player for our Chrome Dino tournament, and we have a score of uh, triple five, I think. <laughs> All right, can you beat that? Well, we're going to try either way. So, three, two, one, hit play. College or high school? Uh, college. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Board games or video games? Good score. Congratulations. A high score of 51. I don't think you beat triple five, but you there. You beat the first person, so that counts for something. Awesome, awesome. Love it. Uh, all right, let me just have a quick chat. All right, we have time for one more game, I think. We don't have time for one more game. We are all good to go. <laughs> awesome. So we're now going to get presentations underway. Ooh, well done for making it to the end of the hack. So could I get, is this in the right order? That's the order I got sent. Josh? Yes. Yes, that's fine. We Can we have? Knuckles to come and present first, and then can we have coding down with the ship to get ready to present after Knuckles? So this might take some time to uh, set up. I've got one plug and I'll use it. Uh, let me grab your attention.
well, just try using things and hitting things. I'm sure it just wasn't turned on. Yeah, it's turned on. Uh, yeah, it's just being crazy. Whoa, look at me up there. Crazy. Say something funny. Something funny. I don't get what I'm going to do. Uh oh, panic mode engaged. We're not going to. Yeah, we just. Beans on. Can you just. Beans on toast. Yes. Perfect. White people are black. Hey, okay, cool, so it works. Right. Should I just, should we just go? Okay, Polly, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Do we just present now? Okay, so uh, our project is called Knuckles. It was inspired by a video on YouTube that we came across of someone using a shape memory alloy spring, uh, and they were passing a current through it to compress it and lift a weight up. And also, I don't know if you've kind of seen, there's like a kind of straw and string mechanical hand thing where you feed the straw through each of the fingers and they kind of act like tendons and you can kind of pull them along and close the fingers. We're also inspired by that to make a kind of mechanical hand using night null wires. Uh, uh, night null is a shape uh, it is a shape memory alloy. So you can program a shape into it. Uh, our initial design, we had it as a straight line and we would bend it using an elastic band, pass the current through to straighten it out, but that didn't provide enough force, so we had to coil it into a spring to uh, go over a larger length. Uh, you program it by heating it up to 500 degrees, so you might have seen in the photos channel, I was huddled around a lighter burning metal. Uh, that was us programming it. And then running a current through heats it up to a lower temperature, which makes it go to its remembered shape. Uh, yeah, so um, a big, prop, big part of this design was the fingers themselves. Uh, you can see on top of here we have all of our previous revisions. Uh, if you can point at this so we can see it, uh, we actually use part of the clipboard for the base, so that's why there's a big hole in the front. Uh, so here is our version one. It's literally just two sticks next to each other. Just point. That's wrong. Oh, it's going to be back. Exactly. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah, like, so... Stick of a band, and then we like we needed it more rigid, so we put a zip tie on, and then that kind of helped. But then it was sort of too rigid, and we moved on to having like an elastic band inside it, and then another heat shrink around that. And then we've eventually given him brass knuckles as well, which is entirely kind of by coincidence. And, and that's just like to limit the motion, kind of that motion. Um, and and then we finally arrived on this design, which. We've got a nice drawing of, but you can't see it because it's backwards. Can you point it here? Because there's another thing I want to mention, which it, you can maybe see on the diagram anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we have the wires going... No, you're talking about like, right. Yeah, Next person, you tell the wires. Next person. Uh, all right, so, so for the hand tracking and computer vision part, uh, we used MediaPipe. So it's a, it has a hand tracking and finger tracking solution. So basically, uh, it stores... Uh, coordinates of uh, parts of your parts of your hand and then they will uh, check whether uh, a finger is raised or not and then it sends the serial data to the microcontroller so in terms of the microcontroller we're using an Arduino compatible board um, the general pipeline of stuff is yeah once once he get once he sends data to the microcontroller over UART about where the fingers are um, microcontroller uh, can needs to control these fingers they need one and a half amps at five volts DC. We, the Arduino can't provide that on its own, so we need relays, but it can't power the relays on its own, so we need transistors. So the Arduino powers re uh, transistors, power relays. Um, it's a whole sequence of events. We also have this little um, LED matrix to also just show, this, show you the status of your hand, just so you know what the, what the hand is trying to do. It's not flickering in real life, it's, uh, it's the artifact of the phone. Uh, but yeah, we're probably out of time now. Of time. Thank you very much.
Can we have two minutes for questions? Any of the judges want to ask any questions? Go for it now. There's a question up there. Could you give a quick overview of what you learned through this? Oh, there's a lot. Um, as computer science students, uh, as computer science students in mathematics, we were quite unfamiliar with all of the hardware things. So. All of that was a complete learning experience. We'd only really learned about Nikenol a couple of days before the hackathon, just enough time to order it. Uh, so we learned everything needed to make this work. <laughs> oh, so we kind of uh, touched upon it, but there was like a kind of interesting physics channel that I follow that was like measuring the amount of weight that it can actually lift by like having a nitinol spring like that and then passing like different levels of current through it and seeing what weight it can lift. Um, and then from that we kind of just, uh, like a logical extension of making it like complicated enough to do in a hackathon and cool enough to do in a hackathon is to make it kind of biomechanical and do a hand that you can control each of the individual digits on. So that was kind of, you know. Okay. <laughs> So that's a design, I, I'll let Zach say this actually, because okay. he probably yeah, designed the thing. That's an interesting one. So basically, um, the, we have inside these black heat shrinks here, which actually you can no longer see because my phone stopped working, um, is that we have like an elastic band on the outside pulling them taut. Um, so as soon as the wire stops pulling inwards, um, it starts cooling, um, and then this elastic band pulls it. We have this fan here, and that means it cools faster, um, which means that the hand opens up faster. Yeah, if that makes sense. Any more questions? Ah, yes. How might it contribute to net zero? Um, so what we're kind of thinking along these lines is that this in itself is not the most energy efficient um, compared to servos, but the energy source for this could be anything. All we need is like a heat differential. So if this could come from just geothermal or solar or anything along those lines, you could have some kind of you know, robotic control without any electricity input. I mean, you can control it with We're done. Thank you. <laughs> Unpack it. All right. Where's the list? Oh, I've lost the list. Good. Uh, right. Could we get Coding Down with a ship to come up, present, and Go Green, get ready to present next? So, hello. Uh, so, with the looming uh, climate crisis, it's imperative to raise not just awareness of uh, energy efficiency, but what's the individual contribution to CO in general. And uh, as programmers, we often are not aware what carbon footprint we really do, uh, you know, leave use it doing our job. So, the question is, will you adjust yourself to, to the challenge, or will you co code down with the ship? <laughs> Uh, our uh, small project is a website that you can uh, input your GitHub link and uh, that gives you the estimate of the carbon emission that just storing your code on the server is. Uh, that uh, I'll demonstrate shortly. So uh, this is the one of the biggest GitHub repositories, uh, on Git well, one of the biggest uh, GitHub repositories, and we put in some uh, help, hopefully helpful and interesting metrics of how to like st see uh, how much storage uh, uh, leaves the carbon footprint. Also, 
Uh, what's important is what we found out during the making the project is while GitHub claims itself that it's carbon neutral, uh, it also doesn't mean that they're serv storing something on their servers. So like the code you created and leave on your GitHub repositories, you know, leaving <laughs> uh, creating that awareness of your carbon footprint is, thing is a very important point uh, to you know, optimize your code, people. <laughs> Yeah, as my colleague said, <laughs> that you know maybe having a bunch of files which you're never actually using in your project just sitting there in your GitHub and just being uh, is sort of a bad thing because you do actually use power for the server. Uh, we also added, uh, sadly, yes, a tiny little bug. So this would be a feature which allows you to check the time complexity. Uh, we run it through uh, ChatGPT. And then, yeah, I know, I know, I, I know. I, I, I hate it as well. Um, but we run it through Jet GPT, um, and then it actually gives you the time complexity of snippets of codes, uh, because that also matters, right? How long your code is gonna run will, like, inevitably matter on the machine. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, if I, I can go longer. Uh, so for the actual, uh, getting of the data from GitHub. We fetch it directly from them using their API, and then we run it, we get the file size. We also get uh, what language is being used, uh, and we have read some papers about what language are more efficient than others, and how they affect the overall percentages. Um, all of our numbers should be accurate. It's to be taken with a grain of salt, of course, because you know those things change, and their averages overall so maybe like GitHub is slightly more efficient than we have actually shown, but yeah. yeah. put in the repository itself uh, both your yeah <laughs> yes just the just the public ones you put in the repository itself and uh, with the username uh, yeah I mean <laughs> I, I think I can speak for all of us we had no clue what we were doing um, like the first couple of hours were literally us looking up, okay, is this actually something that we can do reasonably? Um, but uh, we all came together. We had two other team members that sadly can't be here for the presentation. And uh, we all ended up working, like finding each other's skills and being able to fit together to have, bringing the whole team up. That's pretty cool. So, um, because you can also get, uh, if you notice on GitHub, you can also actually see the files directly from their website. We get that information, get the code that's displayed, run it, uh, and then ChatGPT for its technology magic um, will bring back, right, we basically send them a request and through their API, they'll bring back uh, an answer with the detail of everything, right? Um, I mean, there are some cases where you can have multiple answers, but generally you only have one. And then we show you which answer it is. We've tested it multiple times. It seems to be pretty accurate, actually. I mean, so... <laughs> It's a really good question, but it's true because you're downloading data, but this was just about checking, right? Because uh, it's not just about websites, because you know you could be storing uh, a video game that you're working on on GitHub or uh, whatever, like your fancy calculator that you're making or a translator, and it might just be there sitting in their server, right? Because that still needs to be accessible 24-7. Sussex Food Bank website.
ready to prepare to present that. Wonderful. Oops. <laughs> HDMI. Do you need? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, the other. Uh, oh Sorry. This one. Yeah. Um, whoever's talking, just so you know, don't hold. <laughs> So we like the idea of Socratic thinking. Um, and we like the idea of, uh, it's a demonstration of the dangers of modern day technology. For example, uh, companies like to greenwash and often try to present themselves as more sustainable than they really are. Um, and what we did was we got GPT-2 and we trained a model to generate a sustainability manifesto for the company based on the name of the company and what industry they're in. Uh, this is the splash page, and then this is what it would be. So go green, you put the company name in and the company type, and then it will write out a manifesto. Shall I show the code? This is a back end. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. This is the output. This was the. Oh no, this is the wrong one. Okay, no mind. So this is um, the first generation, actually, and this was the early version um, okay, of, of, of GPT-2, and this is the first manifesto. As you can see, it's very basic, um, and it doesn't really make sense, but uh, over time, as the model gets more and more advanced, it can put out something like this. Um, <laughs> yeah, that is pretty good, That's isn't fair. it? Um, <laughs> yes, our project didn't come together completely in the end, so we had like sort of the um, Python code, um, the model that sort of uh, generated the text, um, and the website. We wanted to put it all together, but um, and add, add some like other resources as well, but um, we didn't have the, have the time to like, put it all together. I think uh, we wanted to raise awareness of like, um, a lot of companies have sustainability statements on their websites now, um, and they speak a lot about like, use sustainability green, and like a lot of big words, but sometimes the, um, it doesn't match up with their actions. So we just wanted to sort of like raise awareness of, of that to, um, to sort of like get consu consumer consumers to be a bit more critical. Um, and we did like a lot of research, uh, looked at um, some journal, journal articles and um, looked at a lot of company sustainability statements as well and uh, sort of used them to um, create prompts for the program. We tried training the program as well with Cohere, <laughs> but in the end it didn't work out quite. Like we, we spent like an hour training it, but um, sort of the output was still very generic, sort of like sort of random stuff taken from the internet or not very specifically targeted uh, towards uh, sustainability. So we had to like, um, yeah, <laughs> go um, another way. So you must be excited to see the program now. So this is our backend program and uh, we use GPT-2 model to train it. And uh, in order to train it, we use like the company's uh, sustainability statements. And um. yeah, so so basically, we went on the like biggest greenwashing companies and like used their sustainability websites to create similar ones. So it like uh, generates uh, this text, if you can see the cursor. So this is the like uh, generated by the GPT, 
and it like it will just say some greenwashing bullshit <laughs> to it, it will like talk about like uh, how uh, th like this company is like working for environment and like how it's gonna help it and even though it's nothing real so and every time we run it it will just like generate very unique uh, and we can also like use maximum length and minimum length for our data uh, for our results. Uh, we learned like uh, that uh, it is very easy to like just uh, portray that we are like doing something like a company is doing something for the environment when even it's not like and so it's important for the consumers to be aware of this so, so for this project we require some python skills and we also need to like use some uh, nle skills and uh, we use the library uh, transformers and uh, and also we had to do a little bit of research. We also use some HTML. No, um, the point is not to show that it an uh, AI can make it less greenwashing. We just wanted to like show how easy it is to create like a greenwashing statement. Holding the mic, if you hold it halfway up, not the bottom. If you hold it around the bottom, it loses signal. Oh, so <laughs> but about just hold there. it up. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, great. Cool. Ready? Yes. Is it gonna? Oh. Um, are we ready? Yep. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, welcome <laughs> to our presentation. There's only two of us. Uh, the other three, Sally, didn't make it to the presentation. Um, we're very sleep deprived, <laughs> as you can tell by our uh, project name, and also our website name, which is website name. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this about? Um, this website is basically uh, sort of realizing that we have a lot of, we make a lot of like food waste, like as you can see, 9.5 million tons per year in the UK. And we have 8.4 million people in food poverty. So a lot of that's just gone. Um, and food waste, it can, it can just go to landfills, landfills even. Um, it's, just wa it's just gone, it's wasted. Good, good still edible food's just wasted. Um, and obviously <laughs> landfills aren't good for the environment <laughs> have these massive landfills so uh, in terms of website basically it's sort of a platform for food banks those who want to donate food and those who are seeking food to sort of all come together so we've got are you seeking food donating food oh, it's called terminals. Oh, there we go. Uh, or a food bank um, and we sort of our idea was to have sort of like a database where you could see the current availability of food um, 
So like if it was a low availability, you know, we need more of that. So maybe if I was one trying to donate, I donate that food. Um, if I was seeking food, I could request more of that food. And if I was a food bank, I could sort of organize, you know, uh, have a platform. So we go back up. We had a login. Um, oh dear. We have no internet. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, I'd say like we, we had that idea, but in the end, because of our poor choice of technology, it ended up not working as planned. Um, we had some nice PHP problems. So, any questions from the judges? Yeah, um, what I learned as you I always use AWS for all of my projects until I found out this hackathon that Azure is free for students and I can do anything I want on there and use their brilliant services. So, I'm definitely going to go more into that in my future projects. The main thing I learned is that you should name your project and come up with a website name sort of at the start of the hackathon because <laughs> when it's at five in the morning, realizing you don't have a website name and everyone's just nodding at you going, oh yeah, we don't have a website name. That's how you get to this. Um, so, well, to be fair, no one had used that domain name, so it is, it's unique. <laughs> and then, of course, we have the wonderful um, like learning of just CSS, of trial and error. Why is one pixel fine and the next one not? And uh, no, no, no more CSS. <laughs> so. Any other questions? No? OK. Well done. <laughs> so up next, we have PSR bot for the EDF. And if Battery Quest can get ready, that'd be great. Uh, hi, uh, we are a group of five people, and yesterday we interacted with uh, the EDF team, and uh, we got to know about some problems they were facing uh, with uh, like oh talking with the customers uh, service. Uh, like so, we actually got to know about some problems. One of them was uh, their long uh, customer waiting time that they had. And the second gen was a general problem that they want to reduce uh, carbon footprint. So uh, actually, we got uh, we came up with a solution of uh, making a chatbot that can actually uh, reduce uh, the carbon footprint also, and uh, making their customer service uh, highly efficient. So what it does is like um, they uh, assess uh, who are the high risk customers. Um, which, uh, who, which actually, they, uh, whoever actually need a direct call, and um, like uh, for low risk customers, they actually uh, send a website link or something. Uh, and uh, other thing that actually it can help is like uh, it can uh, reduce the electricity cost, and thus uh, reduce the carbon footprint. So this is what uh, we have. We have, I think, my teammate. Can see. We also did this by signposting. Um, relevant m messages that customers might have and help them through the process and show them the uh, services that are available but they might not be aware of those services and refer them to those services and be able to help them 
um, without taking much time out of there um, and being costly for the company as well? Um, so we use natural language processing and uh, we used a naive Bayes model in order to classify the text by topic. So um, if we just run it now. Um, so for if we use the example of a low risk cus customer who thinks that their boiler might be broken, then we can see that it will signpost them to the website, the EDF website, where they can get information on what to do next. And if they have a more high risk problem, such as like high risk, uh, there are priority clients which have like young children or have medical issues and they might need to be prioritized by EDF. So it'll say that your problem has identified you as a priority risk customer and it um, their uh, request will be saved to a data frame. Oh, do you want to show the data frame? <coughs> Which then EDF can use to see like, oh, this was the statement and it's been classified as high risk. Wonderful. So, any questions from the judges? What did you learn while making this? Um, so, none of us have ever done natural language processing before. So, that was quite like a big step for us. And we also had to look into like the different classification models we could use. And we decided because there wasn't a lot of data for us to go from, we decided to use naive Bayes instead of support vector machines. And also to create the chat box. We had to use um, a graphical user interface for Python, I think. Do you I don't remember the name, but um, yeah, that was something new we learned. Oh, so we got a set of training data by looking at the EDF website first for the low-risk ones. We looked at their troubleshooting page because there's a list of questions like, oh, these are some topics, these are like questions you might have. And we used those statements to do the natural language processing on them. And that looked at the frequency of like how like certain words appearing. And then for the high-risk ones, we looked at the high-priority um, register which had a list of like the different groups that would be on the register and then we also tried to do manual semantic analysis in order to get like more data since it was quite sparse no oh one question up there um Oh, so we used one naive um, Bayes classifier uh, to just sort between high risk and then categorize the low risk. But um, we wanted to use another one as well to then further classify the high risk into smaller subsections. So then if EDF looked at the database, they could see like, oh, these consumers had um, like a lot of them had problems with young children and therefore it might be easier to solve like other consumers problems if they solved one of them. <laughs> right, so up next we've got people working towards the electric square tracks. Um, so Battery Quest is up next and then Fajita finds his father. Get ready please. Okay, 
So, hello everyone. We're Bat Request or Bat Request. My name's Tim. This is Amy, Henry, and Jamie. And we spent last 24 hours working on a 2D platformer game made purely in Game Maker, which I've used before. They haven't, uh, but the software has changed a lot. Uh, and it's a great tool for uh, just prototyping quick 2D platformers or like any 2D games. Uh, main goal of the game was, uh, or let's start with the storyline. The storyline of the game is uh, humanity has abused the energy sources on Earth, used it irresponsibly, and they absolutely ruined the planet, they had to escape. And now they want to come back. Fast forward a couple thousand years. It's 19th of <laughs> There's an event happening at Sussex. Uh, so humanity sends special electric bats to Earth uh, to help them restore Earth, while the event is happening, uh, a battery is missing from a projector remote. We can't have the presentations at Hack Sussex 2023. The bat named Terry, not Terry, going to save us all, so he's going on a rescue mission to find renewable energy to save the day. And this is it. I'll hand over the mic to Amy. She can talk more about the art that she created for the game, and I'll showcase the game while she's talking. Yeah, so I mainly created the graphics for this game, and I also worked on a little bit of code. But um, it was quite hard to um, do pixel art because it was my first time doing actual proper animation with pixel art. And as you can tell, um, details are hard to you can't really see the details. So it was hard to show that it was like a battery on its back. So sometimes it would, people would get confused, like what is it, is it a bucket <laughs> or something? But I got a lot of help from other people and a lot of advice and I worked on top of that. So it looks like a battery now. And Thank you. Um, I'm Henry, I worked on most of the algorithms for the game. Um, we because it's a bat, we use a pseudo version of uh, radar, but we do it through light and colors. So you throw a ball, which was actually pretty hard to code because it bounces, etc. And it taught me a lot about prioritizing things to get them working because the original concept for this is quite different. But what we have is um, something that was still production ready and uh, I think good enough to go. Um, and then uh, you worked on. Yeah, so it was my first time using Game Maker as well, so it was a fun challenge to, to learn a new language. And um, another thing we focused on was renewable energy. Um, as you can see, there's some wind turbines, there's also water and solar. And the battery pack also represents um, the power vault, which is a real-world system which captures excess energy from renewable sources. And this is something that we're collecting through the game, teaching the players about renewable energy, and trying to bring to the end part of the game, which, yeah. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, I was what the win state of the game was. Like so the win state is you bring the battery to the king, which you can see on the screen now. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to him on the level. The level is uh, quite long, and uh, I just wasn't able to get there. But if you play hard enough and you collect all the sources, you'll get to the king, and he waits for you with a prize of well done message. So I think everyone learns something different. Those guys learn something about using Game Maker. I've learned something very important about layering systems. I had some experience in terms of like graphics or like collision programming, uh, but the echolocation of the bat who throws uh, its echolocator uh, around the locations uh, was something that we had to spend quite a lot of work in making sure that the walls are uh, not uh, behind the echolocator. Uh, radius, so you can actually unveil the map as you throw the echolocators. Anything else? If you had more time to go back to the game, what would you add? 
Uh, so we were going to talk about um, healthy states of batteries as well in terms of a gameplay feature because normally you want to keep your battery between 20 and 80 percent and a lot of people don't know that and that leads to increased battery degradation so you wanted to teach um, the player about um, healthy battery standards but unfortunately we didn't have enough time Hello. While that's um, being set up, going to introduce all of us as Studio Eater. Um, it does say um, Fajita finds his father, but that's our game name. And this is Fajita. He's a little blue dragon, and we decided as soon as the hackathon started that he'd be our mascot, and that we were going to make absolutely everything themed after him. And I mean everything. <laughs> is that all right? Should be. Ready? It would be great to have a video. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, we're Studio Eater. We decided to make a kind of platformer puzzle game based around throwing items. And we did this all in Unity. We also decided that we needed a necessary cutscene, of course, to explain the plot of poor Fajita who's looking for his dad. Where's his dad gone? I don't know. Will we ever find out? No, because we never finished a second level. <laughs> 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 so we d managed to make, again, we had a plan of having a tutorial and a last level, but we basically just did the tutorial. We have simple mechanics such as jumping, um, Fajita can't fly, he can only glide. And we have a wonderful throw mechanic, which was made by our lovely deer. Um, all of our graphics were hand-drawn <coughs> by me. Um, and <laughs> we had a really interesting time doing this because none of us had ever used Unity before. And um, I can come out of it saying I hate it. <laughs> but um, it has been very, very successful in terms of what we were managed to having an output. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd just kind of say, I think, sort of, in terms of like what we learned from it, um, obviously, no one had really used Unity before, so we all kind of learned a lot of systems, like Lily kind of learned a lot about the um, menus and how to put them together, and kind of Tess learned a lot about the physics, and then I kind of learned a lot about sort of displaying graphics, and the it's gone now, but the little like um, projection line which was an absolute pain to put in. <laughs> um, however, yeah, I think just kind of really happy with it. And I quite like Unity, actually. I do want to say that um, I spent way too long making a parallax background, and I want all of you to notice it, because it's parallax, and that took time. <laughs> <laughs> and it broke our rendering. It broke our rendering so many times. Um, have we got any questions? So the throw mechanic here um, specifically is to press this button that will then unlock the big old brick at the side. There was supposed to be a drawbridge, but no one could figure out how to get it to work on a collision. So we just tipped down the castle and thought, yeah, that works. Uh, um, so with the throwing as well, so in the final level, um, the way we implemented it, it's kind of done. So obviously we've got a rock there, but it's based around a sort of projectile. So we thought about implementing different kinds of projectiles and potentially different sorts of buttons that can interact in sort of interesting ways to create kind of unique puzzles. And then as you go throughout the levels, it would introduce these mechanics over time. And sort of, yeah, it was focused, it, the idea was to be focused around sort of throwing, making that quite interesting and coming up with interesting puzzles around that.
That's a really great question because um, my favorite thing to say in computing all the time is, I can't code, I can only draw God, please help me, Josh. So, <laughs> um, I use Clip Studio Paint, which is my art software for everything. So all of this was done in Clip Studio Paint. Um, what we did then was export each frame of an animation as an image sequence and then um, Tess, who handled our animation, um, coding it, would then import it into Unity and create, because Unity has its own animation files, which were very interesting and very weird, and I don't like them, but it means that you can have something loop, which is really nice. So, but things like our cutscene, actually, were done in After Effects, because I said, can we just put in an MP4? I don't want to figure out how to do it in Unity. And you can. So I made it look pretty in <laughs> Adobe After Effects and went, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, and then sort of we implemented that with the text size. So I did the dialogue system, actually, so that's a good one to talk about. Um, we kind of, we got our like system set up for the video player and then um, sort of put that in the background and sort of link that up with the dialogue system. So we did have pretty much a lot of it set up for like sprites and that. Um, but we just couldn't quite get that in in time. So then the sort of sprites could sort of change by interacting with like a sprite manager script, which sort of flipped off, like, sorry, no, flipped on and off the correct sort of character animation at the right time, which we kind of imported and set up from Eli. Yippee! <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I missed your question. <laughs> So up next we have Sip Anna Analytica, and uh, if launch or lunch can get ready. Thank you. Hi guys. Uh, here's your HMI. And, and when using the microphone, if you hold it at the top half, so otherwise it'll block the receiver. Okay. Hold it up the top and don't put your hand around the bottom. Right. Okay. Don't put my hand there. Okay. Hello, hello, oh, cool. <laughs> oh, you've got, oh, no, wait, wait, just, no, wait. No, no, no. Uh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hey, your dream team. Welcome to your first day at the job at Flip Analytica. We're like a family here, and so we thought we'd keep our new team behind after hours for compulsory volunteer training to make sure it's go uh, that going forward, it's a synergized, hands-on-deck kind of situation. Let's touch base on what we do here at Flip Analytica. Our job on the board, and our lovely colleague over there, Ethan, um, is to study in great detail the movements of the general consumer, as indicated by their cellular devices. This data means that we can better appreciate their needs and wants, and uh, sometimes give them a helping hand when it comes to things like elections and things like that, yes. Um, your job, as our valued uh, movement coordinators, is to test our tracking systems by moving, flipping, and throwing your own mobile devices around to ensure our system is calibrated, pinpoint accurate, and that our beloved clients get the best experience possible. Very important. Um, you, as the diligent workers you are, will receive instructions which you must comply with. Uh, for example, achieve three full rotations with one flip of your phone, or spin your phone at a literal speed of a thousand degrees a second, or even reach an airtime of four seconds. Since Flip Analytica is such a great and desired place to work at, a lot of people want to work here. So you only get three wrong attempts before we kick you, uh, no, sorry, before we part ways. Um, that being said, can I have a volunteer? Anybody, anybody wants to volunteer? Hello, sir. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, do you want to get your own phone, not oh, mine? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you don't have your phone, oh, convenient. Sorry, anyone? Oh. I'll bring it over. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> if you would like to scan this QR code, sir. Uh, I mean, valued employee. Oh, yeah, your phone's already a bit worse for wear, so. You might want to crouch down a bit as well. Minimum, minimum speed of. 
No, no, you can, if you rotate it enough, it will, it will, uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Successfully scan the code. Okay. Oh, what? Oh, I don't know what's going on here. Maybe skip advertising. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, uh, so start, if you start the game, here it says you've got to reach a minimum speed of, of 2,000 uh, RPM. So you've got to flip. Do you think you can flip your, your phone that fast? Uh, maybe, but... Do you want to give it a try? Yeah, of course I'll give it a try. Sweet. Have you seen my phone? It's already cracked enough. It's, it's, it's very more. bad. All right, uh, click if you click begin and <laughs> just give it a toss. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Begin. Again? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> okay, you failed that one. You lost a life, but that's okay. I reckon if you nice. throw it, so if you throw it high enough now, you can get an airtime of about two seconds. If so, then you uh, you earn you earn a valid about two p from our company. Four hundred four hundred points. Yeah. That's really good. <laughs> Congratulations. No one's ever got that far. <laughs> oh, your score is zero. That's because you haven't you haven't done anything yet. Okay. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry. Uh, wait. Sorry. Just one uh, top tip. Try not to listen to music, converse with coworkers, or think too hard while you are working. We find our data is most clear when our movement coordinators enter into a state of thoughtlessness and semi-consciousness. Um, welcome aboard, and remember, team. If you break your phone, we won't replace it. Any questions, please? Questions. Hello. Uh, so we heard about the the track, uh, the the joy of the joy of the throat, and we thought, you know, we we. What is what is the most high risk, high reward situation you can put yourself in? Um, what the reward? What's the reward to work at our lovely company and uh, to help us exploit your? I mean, sorry, no, to help us gain data uh, for you know very very valid data. Yes, Ron Grau. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> um, so uh, rotational. Uh, Rotational, yeah, like c how to get the number of uh, rotations that happen is actually not a yeah. uh, trivial task. Uh, it involves using quaternions, which which are quite difficult, actually. Um, we we actually gave up, uh, and and we c we didn't make any progress for about twelve hours, um, and then finally, about an hour before the deadline, we kind of figured it out thanks to lovely Steve here, who actually does maths. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> and and yeah, so yeah, all right, yeah. <laughs> cool. Sweet. Yeah. And so up next, we have Lord, your lunch, and if you're mad or nice, and get ready. Um, and whoever's talking, guys, when holding the mic, if you could hold it out the top half, because um, otherwise it'll block the receiver. All right, so we're Launch Your Lunch. Uh, it's a game about throwing your lunch about, trying to make it together with friends, kind of inspired by Overcooked and, of course, the game jam, uh, The Joy of the Throw. Our initial idea was a cooking game similar to a plate up. Um, we have a throw mechanic where you throw your food and then another player throws a knife to try and um, like slice the food in order to like make a salad, kind of like Fruit Ninja. Um, we rely on the communication between the two players so that they throw the knife and the food at the same sort of like trajectory, so actually hits the food and cuts it, otherwise they're not gonna make the food. Um, 
We did try and make it multiplayer, and we tried that for about 11 hours, and we almost done it, and then we kind of gave up and just made it. <laughs> just just um, WSD and um, arrow keys. But yeah, talking uh, more about the network side, I, because the main appeal of most like play up and overcooked is um, the the like multiplayer. Oh, you join with your friends, uh, you shout at your friends. Um, so that was our main goal going in, and we have no experience with Unity uh, netcode or networking, so we thought it'd be fun. Um, I haven't slept, and. <laughs> It doesn't work, so <laughs> yay. Um, but yeah, it was good. We've it got to a point where it was oh we're happy with this progress, but since with the time constraints, we got to like four hours beforehand. Owen was asleep, um, and I was like, okay, we might need to unnetwork this and make it local multiplayer. So we stuck with just two players, WASD. Um, and then the mouse, not mouse, arrow keys, there we go, uh, to play the game. And we managed to get right, just a small window open, and you can explain. Uh, so as you can tell by this impeccable art style, all of these are assets. None of us, <laughs> none of us made any of these. Um, well, a lot of these are really nicely formatted, um, but... I hadn't made, I uh, hadn't used Unity before, so a large amount of my time was trying to get these to uh, look quite nicely, uh, positioned on the screen and uh, getting it all structured, as well as uh, doing a great job of choosing which assets to use. Um, but uh, I think we did a relatively good job of the general structure of the uh, uh, general window for the game. But yeah, more about like how the game works. Uh, if you ca you can kind of see the knife, uh, you, there's only one knife. The patch, oh, yeah, the patch that's not uh, coloured in. Thanks, Owen. Uh, if you pick that up, you can throw it across, um, and then it will just land on the bench. But if the other guy over there picks up a neatly placed lettuce, uh, which is obviously on the bench, and throws it at the same time, and they meet, they collide, it will produce a sliced lettuce, and then that combined with sliced tomato, salads, bada bing. There we go. Any okay. questions? So the goal was to have like a ticketing system, like in most of those where you have the day or which is like you know two minutes to complete 10 orders and then if you fail you fail and you restart the day that was the goal but didn't get that far oh, shut up about networking <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for multiplayer, we used uh, netcode with game objects and then implemented that with relay and lobbies. Uh, but then it got to the point where I needed to use colliders and I gave up. <laughs> so. um, well, I had Unity experience, but... Uh, I had absolutely no experience with Unity whatsoever. Um, I'd used similar game softwares like uh, Pi Game back in uh, A level, but never experienced Unity whatsoever. So a good uh, sort of first step into that. So up next we have Mano Knife, and if Trash Plain Eater could get ready. Yeah. 
Yep, and then holding the mic, hold it up the top. Otherwise, it will block at the bottom receiver. Don't put your hand okay. up. Okay. Hello? Oh, okay. Still booting up? Sorry, guys, we just need a minute whilst the PC boots up. But we have a pretty fun take on the fro for knife, or knife for fro. Fun for knife, for fro. <laughs> that's it, that's it, thank you. For fro, yes. And I'm pretty excited to show it to you guys, and I hope you guys will be equally as excited once it comes up. Am I on screen? Oh, I'm on screen. Yes, you are. Is that duplicating? Duplicating? No, yes, yes, it is duplicating. That was a good noise. Yes. <laughs> so, you're going to start on the technical thing anyway. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Do you want to play then? Me? Yeah. Yeah? Good, good, okay. Some you've got to click after it's like two, three seconds. Oh, you're not going to play. No. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. It looks fine. It looks fine. It looks fine. Just push in the second time. Just don't play with me. Play with two different people. Oh, fuck. Okay. Yeah. Go for it. Go away. Hi. I didn't realize it was scary down here. <laughs> oh, oh, it has never done this before. <laughs> <laughs> we love to see this in development. So, my big thing's been broken. <coughs> I have a feeling something's wrong. <laughs> Sorry. This feature we added very late in development. <laughs> Um, you've got to disconnect it on the Bluetooth. Okay. Uh, you click the bottom three of your knife, then you click the, the side bit. So Windows 11 hides <laughs> Bluetooth um, behind <laughs> this feature. Yep. So Windows, th if, uh, uh, let's turn these off because they're stopping you from turning them off. Yes. Our project has been racked by difficulties and I thought they were over. The power button isn't working. They won't turn off. What do we do? Should we just explain it? Not one that we can fix. Not a good one. <laughs> you want to explain how it would have worked? We have to start with the Okay. Uh, you try and fix this. I'm going to start talking and then we'll switch. Our game is built in Unreal. It uses Unreal Blueprints and Switch controllers to allow you to move around like a first-person shooter, left stick movement, right stick looking, and to use your right hand to throw throwing knives with a uh, couple of buttons set up to choose how far away you want your target to be. Or at least it did until we had to get rid of those because maths is really hard when it comes to creating splines that have vertexes that curve. We ended up instead just using physics. If we had more time, there'd be a hell of a lot more in there. I think we got a lot of work done in the last hour. Um, yes. Okay. okay, so I'll take over. I've got a little bit to talk to you about. So I was kind of um, in charge of doing the art, which unfortunately you can't see just yet, but we'll get something up. I think the thing that's bugging is probably these Joy-Con controllers. They have a bit of drift, which is why we got all the funky movement that we're not getting now. Um, so this game is meant to be a first-person game. You're meant to have a knife, and you throw it around, hence the name Man and Knife. Actually, it's also a pun in Spanish and Portuguese for any speakers out there. It means Brother Knife. So um, if you actually get to see this for once, you get to see that we got to create some of the custom assets, and that's something that we're actually really proud of, because we got to work with um, integrating Blender assets into, you, uh, into Unreal Engine, which is something I've never done before, and this was my second Blender project, so it was actually quite a daunting task, unreal. as it was Unreal. Oh, no, no. Blender is not Unity. Blender is not Unity. So, <laughs> the idea of the game is that you can see the, the, there's these prism kind of like tethers, as I call them, but they're basically like targets, and you get to throw them. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to import all of our assets, because we actually, um, I actually made like some of the hand, uh, like a hand asset, so that it'll be holding the knife, but we won't see that today. Aha, uh -huh, here it is. So one of the fun thing about this, oh, we got the Joy-Con working as well. We've got motion controls. So if 
depending on which way you like swipe, you can change the direction of the knife. It is quite a difficult game, so <laughs> pro zone, yeah. So, um, but yeah, so this knife is something that we Blender. And it was really fun because once we imported it into Unreal, we actually got to uh, mess around with the emissive lights. So it actually, we darkened the sky box to show that it actually shines. And you can see it in the prism as well. <laughs> Woo! So, last things I'll quickly touch on. The RCL was heavily inspired by uh, Super Hot, if any of you have ever seen it. The knife was kind of inspired by Overwatch, <laughs> Gonads, if you've ever seen them. And we kind of like gave a classic nod back to all the games in the PS2, PS1. Everyone loves a good nostalgic game. Um, and I'll give it back to Layson quickly just to talk about future projects. Okay. Oh, okay. Question. Sorry, guys. Time out. Any questions? Layson, do you want to take this one? Absolutely. Um, we really wanted moving targets where you would have to predict where things were moving in order to get a good hit in. We wanted a light attack that was very quick and easy to just throw a knife and a heavy attack that was very predictable, but you had to time it right. Um, we really wanted uh, missions that you could go through where it was important to curve your attacks around objects to get people before they could get you. We had a lot planned and so many things got in the way. Git large file storage, syncing large game projects across the internet is not an easy mission, especially when you've done, never done it before. Um, so yeah, we just kept getting stuck, but there was a lot there. Any other questions? Okay, that wraps it up. Oh, one more question. Yes, sorry. <laughs> that is better joy. You're welcome. Um, okay. Uh, sure. So, oh, I don't know how to answer this. Just about this. Okay, um, what we learned from this, for me personally, prototype everything. If you think you have a good idea, you don't know you have a good idea until you prove it works. Um, that has proved true over and over again. What about yourself? So a lot of the times, like um, uh, Layton said, we had really cool ideas, but we weren't able to implement them in time in a short span of 24 hours. Also, I'd like to know that we started as a team of six over the limit, and then we dwindled down to two. So that was also a big challenge. There was a lot of that we almost cried, we almost gave up. But we came up with a pretty cool prototype, and I hope you guys liked it, because, you know, switch sports, that kind of thing, and we want to see it more.
So we're going to go for lunch now. Um, we're going to come back in here to resume the rest of the presentations at 3 o'clock. Um, so, yeah, if you head out and turn left, lunch is ready. 2.30. 2.30. Half an hour for lunch. Okay, 2.30 we're returning here, I've been told.
directions, <laughs> and it fires the aeroplane. Thank you very much. You didn't hear that because you were clapping, but that made a bad beep noise. There are two LEDs on the top that tell me if I need to land on the left-hand uh, runway or the right-hand runway. I've got the left-hand light up, so if I reset it and don't break it... <laughs> this sometimes never happens. So if I aim towards the left, my little echolocator should not work. Wonderful. <laughs> it's got a little echolocation device that, the, uh, that sometimes detects where the plane has landed and um, plays a good little free beep if it lands in the right place or a bad long beep if it lands in the uh, wrong place. Let's see if we can get it to work. <laughs> right, we've got the green light on the right lit up. Let's aim towards the right. Let's aim towards the right. <laughs> well, it worked briefly. <laughs> it is made of rubbish and held together with sellotape. And it's got a nice knockoff Arduino in it with rainbow colored guts. <laughs> well, I got it working for a bit. It's broken. Thank you very much. literal hacking I had to do with a Swiss army knife on tin cans and pizza boxes and the copious amounts of sellotape. What inspired you to, to look at the fact that this was a Well, I'm really concerned about the environmental impact that comes with using new materials and the pizza boxes were free. <laughs> I suppose there were two. One of them was I powered the servo, uh, the servo, not the servo motor, the stepper motor from the board and that blew it up. The other one was the IR remote kept breaking and I couldn't figure out why and I don't know how I fixed it. What did you learn while making this? Almost all of it. I've never made anything of an Arduino before. <laughs> I had to learn how all the stepper motors, the servos work, the IR remote, the, um, uh, the bat echolocator thing. <laughs> the only thing I knew was a bit of C++. If you had to do it again, what would you do differently? How would you improve it? Uh, everything. Um, <laughs> I would make it out of better materials, put more time into it. Uh, I'd invent a new up and down direction. I wanted to add a sort of a, a life system, maybe keep track of score, but uh, the hardware took too much time, so I couldn't implement any of that. <laughs> Briefly, <laughs> briefly. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, up next we've got basketball game, um, and then following that we've got uh, tempweb.net. If you can get ready.
to play into Oh no, he's working. Not sure then. He's on duplicate, he's on. Might be um let me try it. Uh, yeah, I can do show only on two, that might be able Strange. Um do you have can you do USB C to HDMI? You don't? I do have one. Okay. Um, what we do have is that for here. Okay, right, Sorry so about that. this is basketball game. So, hello everyone. My name is Lucas and I decided to make a basketball game. Because the HDMI cable doesn't work, we are, like, doing this instead. <laughs> so, yeah, we have, we'll have a player that moves around, basketball, and a hoop. Who could have guessed? So, yeah. Um, of course, the easiest way to implement a game would be on something like Unity, but that would be too easy. So, we decided to make it on a website instead. And of course, the usual way to make a website is with a dev stack. But, that's too easy as well. So we used plain HTML and JavaScript to make the game, using a HTML canvas element, <coughs> basically. And so, every good game has a play button. And when you play the game, you get a man who's animated on a JavaScript, <laughs> on a HTML canvas element, and you can aim with the mouse and throw the ball into a hoop. <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> but for some reason, my teammate, Jack, who sadly isn't here, uh, decided to make the hoop very difficult to aim into. Because I had the idea, just make it go side to side bounce off the wall. But he had the idea, let's just make it jitter around randomly. <laughs> so, yeah, it works. <laughs> Ta-da. That is what we made in 24 hours. <laughs> Any questions? Questions, anyone? Yeah? There are better ways to make games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Any questions? Um, probably designing the whole game overall. Because of the way JavaScript works, it's very hard to use an object-oriented approach. 
So we had the whole game engine in one file, basically. Well, it's not too hard to make an OOP approach on JavaScript, but for web development, uh, web browsers have a lot of limitations on how importing external JavaScript files works with like cause problems. So yeah, that was the issue we ran into. Yeah? Multiplayer. <laughs> Local multiplayer, nothing like crazy, but yeah, that's what we would do. And there is meant to be a scoring system, but I haven't managed to get it in the hoop yet, so I don't know if it works. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, any other questions? He can. I was gonna make the, yeah. Moonwalking. No. Yeah. Uh, All right. Let's see if this decides to work. Uh. Well. Even if it doesn't work, I've got a hosted version. Unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so, uh, tempweb.net is what I worked on. Um, so it's a service to temporarily host static web pages and static websites. And it was born out of the need uh, that I came across. So I do a lot of work with CI pipelines and stuff like that. and. There's lots of tools which will generate you really pretty HTML reports and uh, other diagnostics that you really want to look at. However, digging into sort of the GitHub actions, into the artifacts, downloading it, unzipping it, and then sort of opening it locally is rubbish. So what I wanted was a simple, automatic way of sharing things over the internet, uh, have giving it a URL, but I don't particularly care what that URL is. And it doesn't need to stick around for so long, because I can always regenerate them if I really care. Um, so I bought this domain uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, thought about doing this. Uh, I have no idea why it's not working. Um, if I actually throw something at it, maybe it will. OK, it seems that the server's alive. It just isn't connecting. Okay, there we go. So the magic of it is you can interact with it entirely using HTTP uh, post commands. So what I was doing here was I was using curl to upload a zip to the uh, URL, which is tempweb.net if you're not within the University of Sussex, uh, and localhost if you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, what it responds to that is a simple URL which has that beautiful site uploaded. Um, you can do sites of arbitrary complexity. What I suspect has actually happened with this one is it's decided to default to HTTPS, which uh, I haven't got set up. There you go. Uh, so you can interact with it via curl. You can interact with it via the web, web uploader, which just uh, posts. You can select a zip or a tar file, upload it there. Um, the code's open source on GitHub, so you can grab it there if you want. Or you can, I'm actually going, because I want to use this service, I'm actually going to be maintaining an instance of it at tempweb.net, which anyone is welcome to use for any purpose they desire. Any questions? This was the single biggest issue 
no, actually, second biggest, TARS are worse. Um, I spent probably 12 hours writing various checks and security things and trying to make unzipping arbitrary user uploaded archives vaguely safe. I'm not confident I've got it all, but okay, zips are bad. You can have like sim links in them. I think you can have uh, um, absolute file paths in them. Um, you can have files that get massively bigger or where you end up with millions of files coming out, like ruining your inode counts, ruining your disk space. There are ways to counter most of them. Then we get onto TARS. You can put device files in TAR files. You can put network sockets in TAR files. <laughs> Who needs that? Why? It's, it's painful. So currently, I've got it configured to last for a week, so seven days uh, from upload. Um, it's actually configurable, um, and there's a simple uh, TOML file with configuration settings that is set up by whoever's hosting. As an expansion goal, what I'd really like to do is allow it to be set as part of, you can probably set it through a HTTP header um, up to a certain upper bound. Um, but the goal, the my intended use case for this service is for sort of short-lived, uh, like reports, that kind of thing. So it comes out your CI system. You'll look at it fairly soon after it's been generated, and then you won't care about it afterwards. And if you do, you can just regenerate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. I could prepare, that'd be great. We haven't broken it. Oh, just get my iPhone as well. There you go. You ready? Mm -hmm. Right, go ahead. Okay, so hopefully we're going to make this nice and quick because I am incredibly sleep deprived, like probably most people here. Um, as you can probably tell, we took Josh's instruction of make something a little bit too literally and quite literally made something. Um, we made a website which. Um, acts as a notes page effectively. You can log in as shown by Charlotte and the user can create new notes, we can edit notes and you can add markdown to them and then display. I'm going to slow down because I think I'm panicking Charlotte. <laughs> um, we have a page for all the user's notes um, and this is stored alphabetically. Um, clicking on those allows you to show the rendered content um, you can also toggle between the displays and edit the notes. And just for you, Josh, because we know you like going into Charlotte's proje projects and injecting <laughs> some JavaScript, we added some previous security features to sort that. I'm going to pass on to David. Cool, I need to plug mine in. Uh, ah, it's too fiddly. Come on, it's gonna do it. It's gonna do it. It's gonna do it. <laughs> I broke it. Okay. <laughs> Yay! And so what I made is like a, a simplified implementation of what we made here. So it's got all the same features, but we sort of did it on one web page. And it's not quite fully implemented. None of these buttons do anything, but when you click on your recent files, it's all a bit gobbledygook, but it opens them and they are saved locally. 
So, yeah. Ta da! Yay! Uh, no, I think the hardest part was, so we all come from slightly different backgrounds. I have quite a bit of knowledge of both back end and front end. David had front end, and then Tori and Jazz, who couldn't be here, they're kind of new. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what made that so great is that we all got to kind of learn off each other and see what works for the team and how to overcome those challenges. Yes. When we tried to push the 180, 180, 1,800 um, chambers, it didn't help. Yeah, that was kind of my fault. <laughs> <laughs> we did it, though. We did it. Very well done. Um, but yeah, thank you, guys. Thank Yay. you. So up next we have uh, the recreation of the Google Chrome offline dino game and if the alarm app can get ready. Thank you. Take a few seconds. There you go. Hey. Is that good? Right. Mm -hmm. If you hold the microphone up the top, it will, otherwise it will block the receiver. So hold it up near the top. Yeah. All right. All right. This. Is this good? Yep. Okay. Cool. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Behind if you. All right. Let me know. Yeah, it's no. good. Go ahead. All yeah. right. Um, hello. Um, so, a little bit of context to this project. So originally, I was working on a. Um, I was working on a Pong game in Python, but I contacted Josh about it, and I told him that the fact that um, I did create code before the hackathon, and I realized that uh, he told me that it was uh, not a good idea to use it. Like it was a bit risky. So it, this was about six. It was about six p.m., and I was kind of panicking. Um, I just had to think of an idea, and if any, if I think all of you know about the dino offline dinosaur game by Google Chrome. Um, so I'll just play it for you. <laughs> this works. You gotta keep going now. Yeah, I gotta keep going. Um, yeah, so as you can see, the point system doesn't work. <laughs> and um, instead of the dinosaurs and the cacti, I've used Pokemon instead. Um, just, I like Pokemon. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I apologize if this isn't very good. There's not really much to it. I had to just work with how much time I had left. And yeah, game over. Um, thank you for listening. <laughs> uh, any questions? Any questions? Um, so I had a I had a bit of help from a tutorial, yes, because I'll be honest, my programming skills weren't the best, so I just had to kind of adapt it. Um, these images I kind of just um, I kind of I kind of took from the internet. I didn't have time to make my own, but at the 
uh, I mean, I, I'll give credit to like you know the Pokemon company, of course, if they ever like try to sue me. Um, but yeah, uh, just pretty much. <laughs> um, I would say just a li just a little bit of help, but not everything. I would say, yeah. Any other questions? No. Well. Um, I learned how to make a game. Um, uh, I I learned about collision detection, which was quite interesting. So I could, like, kind of learn about how you know if there's like certain frames, like between images, if they if they cont if they touch each other, then like I could I could use that and say uh, it's like it's like how it works with when I touch this diglet, and if I touch it. It will it will say game over, just like how the dinosaur, when it's in contact with the cactus, it will mean game over as well. well very well done. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, so up next we have alarm app, and if analog automata could get ready. All right, hello everyone. So uh, I have a quick question. How many of you have missed a 9 a.m. lecture because you slept through your alarm? All right, that's a lot of people, honestly kind of expected. So I kind of created this app for myself because I wanted to stop skipping 9 a.m. lectures. So um, uh, I made this app with Android Studio and basically you can choose a.m. and p.m. Um, let's see what the time now is. 3.31, so that's, um, all right, so it should ring right now. Uh, let's see, all right, <laughs> wait, give me a second. Let's try. Ah, PM, right. So that's going to guarantee that you wake up on time every single morning and go to your lectures. So um, this actually wasn't like, um, I kind of wanted to uh, develop this a bit further. Um, originally I wanted to like set the alarm and then it'll make you like wake up and do like a, a tiny math quiz before you can actually switch it off so that you'll kind of get your brain running uh, and yeah, that, that's kind of my whole pitch. Or, I mean, demo. Any questions? So, uh, I've actually never made an Android app before, and I always wanted to, like, um, get into, like, Android app development. And I kind of uh, found out that you can actually create Android apps using Java, which I kind of already know um, through the course and stuff. So yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, um, that I'm not ex uh, really sure, but um, I, th uh, I think I kind of tested it and it works through the lock screen. Not exactly sure what would happen if you just like close the app though. So I'm still kind of working on that. Any more questions? No? Okay, well, very well done.
So next we have Analog Automata. And if, uh, and if Cracked FM could uh, get ready, you're next. Right, I'm just going to let Dowdy get everything set up by logging into my computer. Right, so my name is Adrian, this is Dowdy. I'm far too energetic for how little sleep I've had and how late it is, um, but we're presenting our uh, little project, Analog Automata, so I'm just going to once Dowdy is all ready to go, I'm going to help him come some wires and I'll hand him the mic. No, you're going to, okay. Hardware projects. Well, the cables are all tangled, but I'm sure it's still working because that little light is on. Oh, fuck. Um, Warning, everyone. So... This is a cassette quarter. Specifically, it's a TCM737. Um, if you've never used one, um, I've never used one. Uh, I had to call my dad yesterday to try and figure out how to use it. Um, but essentially, <coughs> you can both read and write to a cassette from here. And we thought, you know what? A, a, a tape that you can read and write from and move along a, like a sort of path sort of like a Turing machine. So we've basically come here uh, to show off a Turing machine-esque idea. Um, if you don't know what a Turing machine is, it is the simplest component of computer programming. It is the ultimate computer. Uh, anything, can run on, anything can run on a Turing machine, and any Turing machine can simulate any other Turing machine. Um, this is the fundamental rule of Turing machines, and they're really cool. Right, well, while Dowdy gets ready to do a little demo of a Turing machine, I'm going to do a little rundown of the amazing time we had getting this thing to work, because this is quite possibly the most janky product, product project we've ever taken. First of all, you will notice the headset speaker that's um, nicely held up. That is because the speaker that came with the cassette broke. You will also notice, I didn't actually bring them with me, but they're on the table, multiple broken um, parts, which we... Um, blew up because we don't do electronic engineering, we don't know how electricity works, we look on Google, we say, this is our problem, how do I build a circuit to fix it, and hope it works. So, really quickly, before while Daddy sets up the demo, I've got some little cards to kind of show off what's happening here. So, we are encoding very simple state machines onto the uh, Arduino here, and that Arduino is then going to run the Turing machine on the cassette. So I have a really simple two um, state machines here that you can have a look at. This one just loads two plus three in unary form. And this one adds two unary numbers. Oh, it's backwards. Oh, well. That is what we'll be running on the cassette today. You'll notice that it's not automatic because it turns out that the tiny little servers I have are not enough to push 80s-sized giant heavy buttons. So. We have my lovely assistant, Alan, a.k.a. Dowdy, who has been given some instructions which the computer is given him. So, he is going to assist the um, Turing machine as it runs. Would you like to... There you go. See if it works. <laughs> Morning. Um, let's see what we've got on here. What do we have on here, actually? I think that's the uh, wrong. <laughs> that's the wrong disc. <laughs> that's the music we kind of actually want. Let's check it out. Great stuff, though. 
You'll be surprised. Like when you buy blank seed, uh, blank cassettes off of eBay, they're not actually blank. And they have good music on them. Yeah, except like half of the half the music is like recorded in the 1980s, so uh, audio quality can vary. So uh, first, we start in record mode, just so we can get our initial state set up. Can you please just get a reset here? But I swear it is not garbage. That is a audio tone that we've put on the on the cassette here, and it's basically encoding a unary number. Uh, the problem with unary numbers is that they're either one or nothing. So it's all just a long stream of ones right now. So here I'm going to go back, and we're going to write a unary ad here. after the music. There we go. That's a suitable position. And now we can start our program. So uh, if you'll bring up the program. Yep. Right. So I'll quickly explain what Dowdy is going to see. So the program is running on this Arduino. And sadly, because we can't press those buttons automatically, Dowdy is going to have to press the buttons for the machine. So. Uh, we have the maybe the world's first collaborative Turing machine that introduces human error. Nice. So each one of these little lights you see on the desk represents a different button that Dowdy has to press and how he has to press them. So if he goes ahead, I'll kind of explain what he's doing. So he has got two unary numbers. So basically, one 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 means three, with a space between them, and he is going to add them. And this is quite possibly the easiest uh, thing to encode on a Turing machine, because all we're going to do is get rid of the one at the start and put it in the middle where the space is. And that way, we add the two numbers. So if Dowdy goes ahead and presses the record button, he can start it going. And the noises you hear coming out of this are what is being read and written to the cassette. Um, obviously, awful tones. We couldn't make it work with nice notes because it's not exact enough because 1980s technology. A lovely tone. So, as Daddy just mentioned, unfortunately, because uh, there's a human that has to press the button to operate the Turing machine, and Dowdy cannot press a button for exactly a thousand milliseconds, it means that he may slightly go under or slightly go over. Therefore, we're introducing a small amount of human error, or what we like to call little slices of music that we get while we run our program. And I consider those a feature. I think that having a little bit of music while you're running um, this incredibly tedious computer, a good, um, a good energizer. Now, the, yes, okay. <laughs> It worked, more or less. Yes. Well, it does work. It would, but you know, we would have to sit here and press buttons for quite a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. It, it it does work, just very slow. Um, Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Yes, go ahead. What? Uh, in theory, yes. So, as we said, Turing Machine can technically run anything. Um, I do challenge you, Zach, to get Doom running on a cassette recorder. Oh, Lambda Calculus, here we go again. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Thank you very much. So up next we've got Cracked FM, and n uh, if down there can prepare there, that'd be great. <laughs> Are you guys plugging in a laptop? Yes. 
Whoever's plugging in. I apologize for my six feet down the road. Move your um Sorry, go ahead. Nice. And when you're when you're holding the microphone, guys, hold it up the top, not the bottom. Otherwise, it'll lose its name. Who's stolen? Right. Hi there. So it's Cracked FM. It's an AI-powered pirate radio. So um, I'll let Leo explain our brilliant tech stack. Well, it's uh, we have an R we have a hack RF1 to transmit our radio. So if you've noticed in the hack room that massive antenna, that was that was us. We were actually broadcasting on FM radio from our, from Danny's uh, laptop. Um, we had a uh, speech synthesis, which was using Eleven's Labs, a uh, brilliant speech uh, text-based like synthesis. It was amazing, and we were using GP3, GPT three to um, well generate text from BBC News, like uh, BBC News articles, as well as uh, uh, texts from a uh, not Twilio integration. Let's just say that. Um, so. The back end, it was using Postgres. We were storing our, like our recorded synthesized speeches as MP3s, as blobs in our database. And the, well, we had like a program constantly watching a table in the database w acting as a queue. And as terrible as that sounds, it actually worked really well, surprisingly, and very fast. So go ahead, Postgres, eh? Um, yeah, so the Hack RF1, it was the big radio. Um, we had a big antenna on it, although if I had to power up too high, it would kill my laptop's USB ports again. So uh, we had a range of about five meters. And then the small radio, which we used to test, it was just like a little walkie-talkie that received FM. That's about it for our sophisticated setup. <coughs> and then um, that's, <laughs> it's all AI. That's one of our working machines. It does AI stuff. Yeah. Very exciting. Uh, okay, so to get the um, news from the BBC, uh, I use Beautiful s uh, Soup in Python, and I use the uh, RSS BBC site, which just made it a lot easier to scrape the uh, latest titles, descriptions, and links. Uh, we then combine the title and description just to make it so that there's a few sentences to use um, and summarize, uh, though I did spend a lot a lot of time scraping every article's body when we just really needed the title and description. Uh, and then we used the open I uh, AI uh, API, uh, which we fed the scraped data um, into. Uh, this reworded the data into a radio show format. Uh, and then, which was also used for the AI voice debate. Uh, and that's it for our presentation. We've got our little demo video. Yeah. Um, it's a bit weird, but it does it does show us what we got. I'm assuming you've got some sort of audio. Yeah. Is there no audio? Because you 
said it's a Linux based, right? They both would run <laughs> Linux and all the rest of it. How is it different? So yeah, Apple is a little bit different in that it's not central proprietary system. It's controlled by hardware. So we probably haven't got time to go through all this. Okay. So. It yep. just goes on waffling, basically, <laughs> <laughs> to sum it up. So now, any questions? Yep. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have any available, because it's all on a Postgres database. Oh. And it's all on Danny's laptop. So... I spent, I must have spent three hours trying to get FIFO files to work so I could do the audio properly. Then I realised I could just make it play audio and add a janky like desktop monitor to use that as an audio input, which was just cursed, but it worked. Any other questions? Calls. Yep, over here. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things I'd do differently. Um, probably, probably not using um, I don't know my laptop as its USB ports would not handle the amount of IO I had on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't use a microservice architecture as well. That was really not necessary. Maybe um, if I wanted text, I wouldn't have used um, not Twilio. Because that was really jank. It's used like ten percent of my battery in four hours. Also, what do you think you learned in this? Well, for me, the one thing I learned from this is how unpredictable AI could be. Um, it funny, but it's not very usable in a professional environment. Um, yeah, you see like chat GPT and you go like, wow. And then you just use plain GPT and you're like, wow. And you go, oh my God, they've, they've refined this a lot. <laughs> Ooh. That's yeah. great. Well done, guys. <laughs> so up next, we've got down there. And if uh, energy consumption of home appliances could get ready, that'd be great. Wonderful, right. Oh, can we have the next team down here as well, which is uh, energy consumption of home appliances, if you come down here, just so we can speed things up. Thank you. Hey, guys. Uh, does it? Oh, uh, meant to be HDMI. Um, you might need to do some Linux it stuff It'll there. take a few right. seconds I'll to I'll just connect. introduce things. Uh, so, hey, guys. Um, We've just gone for a bit of a chill one. We decided to make a, a, a video game at Hackathon, if you can believe it. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, we decided to be a bit different. We couldn't be bothered with Unity in that. So we actually, we did it in uh, a terminal-based uh, terminal based UI game, uh, written in C from scratch. Uh, the only library used for this was NCurses, just as a bit of a challenge to ourselves. Um, not maybe a very prudent challenge. Uh, we, we, we do technically have a, uh, uh, a terminal UI, which we will demonstrate uh, very shortly, hopefully, if, if this works. Um, but whether or not you can call it a game, uh, I'll have to leave to you guys. Uh, but but it, it is still cool. The, 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 the vague premise is uh, you're exploring an underwater world. Uh, we're not going for any categories of this, so you don't throw anything or whatever. Uh, but you're exploring an underwater water world, and you scroll through, and you uh, discover new things like sea creatures and uh, uh, other such things that we may one day hope to add. Um, is this still not working? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, that is basically as much of a pitch I can do until this works. Um, okay.
Are you good? No, <laughs> I just want to show it. <laughs> oh, <come on> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the you can see the mouse, so then. Sorry about this, everyone. Oh my god. <laughs> hey, do you want to just skip the PowerPoint and just the. Okay, yeah. okay. <sighs> Should be here momentarily. Uh, this is pretty tragic, I I'll admit. Um, but <laughs> uh, I, I don't think this is going to work, unfortunately. Uh, no, it's coming! Oh, okay, okay, all right. Uh, hold on, hold on. We just need it. Terminal. Wait, uh, we're in question time. Like, right. Just go for the terminal here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, full, sc full screen it, full screen it. Out. You can actually see the bit. No, okay. Oh, yeah, whatever. Okay. Hey! All right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we got sea creatures uh, and also Hasuna Miku uh, for some reason. Uh, <laughs> features right now um, is that you could read these elements which could be sea creatures or whatever from any number of text files and just put it in the in the in the screen and the background is um, um, randomly generated and it goes like uh, you know it just goes infinitely up and down and stuff um, the, 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 the very center O is the player um, and then the, the the whole interface is like uh, the, the player moves, but then um, you could go up to the NPCs that you can interact with them, and uh, boom, this should be like a dialogue box, but we haven't written the plot yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another thing is the the, uh, the the player cannot move into the uh, yeah. The the objects. <laughs> okay. Questions. Thanks. Uh, energy consumption of home appliances here. No. Right. We'll be moving on next to Dreamwise, and then after that, if. Uh, Minecraft subsystem for Linux can come down here and get ready. That'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> Our, um, Minecraft subsystem here, just to check. Yep, okay. If you can come around. Yeah. Hello. If you can come down and get ready with your stuff just so we can try and get through it, that'd be great. Right, go ahead. Cool, hi. So we took inspiration from a book called Stolen Focus, which um, explores how humans are unable to remain focused, especially in today's age with all this technology. So we decided to create an app to help humans um, focus, basically. And we're covering five key metrics 
using primar primarily data from Google Fit. Um, and we're using this to sort of track how focused people are being and giving them a score, a percentage score. And we've also created a WhatsApp bot which sends a summary to the person every night. Um, okay, just to go through our tech stack, our main uh, component is a React native mobile application. Um, initially, we assumed that the, the user coming every night and actually like manually input how much time they spent on their phone, how much time they spent reading. But we realized that like if you actually want to build habits, that won't work. We have we realized we have to integrate it into the phone's screen time, into the phone's uh, health app. So we decided to, well that was quite difficult, but we eventually managed to get that working with Google uh, Health data. Um, th the rest part, oh, so we moved it to an Android app. The rest of our um, stack includes a, a Node.js server, which runs the Twilio WhatsApp bot. That means we can schedule WhatsApps, which we'll talk about later. Um, yeah, it's Twilio. We also have a NoSQL database, um, all through Firebase. We do Firebase authentication and registration. These are some screenshots of our app. Um, and that is how our tech stack works. Yeah, so our idea with the WhatsApp bot was to try and make it as easy as possible for our users to track their habits and make it quite low effort. And the way we decided to do that was to keep them, to give them daily updates on their progress on their habits, um, to keep them motivated. And we'd also send them nightly reminders of when when they should go to bed based on their desired wake up time. Um, and so hopefully our plans to develop it further would be to incorporate some kind of machine learning in that we could tailor it better to each user individually based on their data and it, we'd give them surveys to get a better idea of how they're improving in terms of their habits. Cool. Um, so I kind of had something to do with the graphic design. I was originally intending to work with um, SVG files, but um, unfortunately, Adobe um, Illustrator is the worst app ever to exist. Um, so I just made this nice presentation. Thank you all for listening. Any questions? No? OK. That's quick and easy. Well done, guys. Thank you. So up next, we have a uh, Minecraft subsystem for Linux. And if Shark Gambit can make your way down and get ready, that'd be great. All right. Hello. Minecraft subsystem for Linux. Everyone, I heard people laugh at the name. So thank you for that. Um, before I start, before it comes up, can I have a show of hands of who uses Windows subsystems for Linux? Say half the room. All right, there's the actual PowerPoint. Excellent. Where's my mouse? There it is. So Minecraft subsystems for Linux is Linux Docker containers in Minecraft, which means if I can click through the presentation and it lets me, you can. I accidentally broke that block. Ignore that. You can run Linux within your Minecraft worlds. So, about, let's say, if we had, like, how many people put their hands up? Like, like 100 ish? Oh, let's just say, maximum 100. So, 100 people use Windows Subsystems for Linux. 238,000 people have Minecraft. So, I think we're reaching for a greater demographic here. And with such an install base, we need such software to help people administer their, mi their servers, their Minecraft servers, their production servers. So, what do you do with Minecraft servers? What have I made? Minecraft Subsystems for Linux. So it's a new command for the ComputerCraft uh, mod, which allows you to run any Docker container that provides a bin bash prompt. And um, so here's how it works. You have multiple Minecraft clients. If you wanted to, you can have one, which communicates to a Minecraft server. Minecraft server then communicates it, um, the terminal to a Microsoft Azure, which hosts the, which runs the actual Docker containers itself, which then pulls the Docker containers from Docker Hub or other Docker registries. All right, um, why is Docker, why is Minecraft Sausage for Linux great? It's engaging. You love Minecraft. Does everyone like Minecraft? Yeah. Wee. So, more engaging. And also, because I am running it on a puny Steam Deck, oh, I can run it remotely, so I do not need to run Linux on my Steam Deck. Although it does run Linux. 
I can run it remotely on Microsoft Azure. Um, and also, so see, Windows Software for Linux, all the disadvantages, big problem in Minecraft Software for Linux, your creepers could blow up your computers. So Docker containers, if you do not have the Docker container already, it will automatically download it. Um, some other thing, VT100 emulation. Computercraft does not support VT100 out of the box. So therefore, I had to pass all those instructions, such as scrolling up and down, move the cursor, such that it works in Computercraft. Here's a demo. I haven't loaded the world. That's very silly of me. The screen's gone. That's very silly of me as well. Well, I guess I could start a question. Um, what Docker container do people like me to run? Arch Linux, Postgres, what do you, what? Arch Linux, let's go Arch Linux. After, after this display works for some reason, um, duplicate please. Come on, yes, all right. So, walk over to the computer, micro, Minecraft Software for Linux, Arch Linux, and hopefully it will notice that Arch Linux is downloaded. It will download it from Docker. And hopefully, if I am still connected to Wi Fi, there you go. Linux in Minecraft. Thank you. Hello, one over there. Oh, okay. Well, funny you say that. No, um, what's it? There is Linux blinking a Minecraft light. Uh, well, obviously, you may have saw me last week at um, Hack Knots. So last week, I made a Minecraft, a same computer craft, but not not this. It was a computer craft plugin that 3D printed whatever you built in Minecraft. Now you can run Linux. So actually, if we combine those two projects together, not only can you real just of 3D models in Minecraft, you can also send it to a Minecraft Linux computer to slice and 3D print as well if you wanted to. There's one over there. Hey, what's your question? Can your Minecraft Linux server run a Minecraft server from inside Minecraft? That is untested. Um, uh, I have not got, okay, you can run it, but there's no port forwarding yet, unfortunately. So that's not a feature yet. So up next we've got Shark's Gambit, and if uh, SMS karaoke thing can get ready, please. Who likes sharks? A a anyone? So, um, we. Try toasting it. Yeah, it did this. So, um, yeah. So if everyone goes to that domain or IP address. Or the QR code. It'll still work because. Ah. <laughs> Just. Just say it. Okay. Those. What is it? Well. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Right, what is it? It is a, um, the Django backend, right, in an AWS container, communicating with another AWS container that stores static files that everyone now can now connect to. So if everyone's got that, you should have something to do with that, that you can submit, um, uh, 
so you can select a weapon, give the weapon a buff, and then give that weapon to a shark. And uh, this shark will then be your shark, kind of. And uh, once we start the game, the sharks will battle each other. That's it. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a real time input. <laughs> nice bit of interaction with the audience there. I'll wait and see who wins. Wait and see who wins, yeah. Not enough weapons on the stand. Get weapons again. Get weapons again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so everything there, part part of the background was draw by hand there as well, yeah. All the Minecraft sauce. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is our first time to uh, pressure test. It's also the last time to do pressure test. Yep, that is. <laughs> Questions? Anything? Um, don't separate front end and back end um, in Django. Just don't. Cause cause tokens. That's what uh, killed us. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that as well. And um, just just local host it really. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully AWS just dealt with that. So, you know, it's just a load of debt requests, so or post requests, rather. So up next we have SMS karaoke thing. Uh, and after that is string theory, a management cat cat catastrophe. Um, so if you can get ready. Hello everyone. Um, so I wasn't uh, really expecting the name of this to be read out. Uh, it was more of a placeholder name, so let me elaborate. Um, over the past 24 hours, I have been making a karaoke bot um, that sends instrumental audio through phone calls and uh, sends lyrics through text messages using Twillo. Um, has anyone here been using Twillo over the hackathon? What do you think of Twilio? Like, yeah, um, I didn't find it very easy to work with, um, and I spent about five hours trying to figure out how to use dial codes to um, select options within a Python interface. But whatever, let's move on from that. Um, what I have made is a. Will this show? I've made a very basic UI with uh, two songs. Uh, well, three songs, but um, we're not going to bother with tequila. Uh, we have Never Gonna Give You Up and All Star. So uh, who would like Never Gonna Give You Up? Yeah. Yep. OK. So just wait. at any time by upgrading to a full account. Press any key to execute your code. I'll never give you up.
Anyways, we could go on for the next three minutes, but... Uh, <laughs> I will do a full demonstration later on when this lecture theatre isn't full. Um, is there any questions? Yes? Uh, I sat down, listened to the song with a stopwatch and just kept <laughs> pressing the lap, recording it, and I have a Python array with about 50 elements of just di like floats ranging from about two seconds to four seconds. It's very, very janky and it's like my ugly little baby, and I love it. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I don't like Twillow. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I spent a lot of time trying to learn Twilio's like own XML type. Li I don't even know what it is. I don't know if it's a language. I've never used XML before. It's just a lot to learn, and... It sucked, but I ended up getting it working through just various Google searches, and this is the result. I'm very happy with it. <laughs> uh, one more question over here. Yes? Uh, how much variance did you find in the timing when you extended the SMS packages? It depended on the signal strength. Um, it could be anywhere from, like, basically about half a second delay to, like, 20 seconds if I was in the wrong space. I, before coming here, I was, like, in here, I'm just praying that the SMS strength will uh, SMS strength will be fine. Yes. Twelve percent. Okay, well, very well done. Thank you. <laughs> so up next we have string theory, a management catastrophe. Um, and if wicks for busy people could get ready. Uh, and if wicks could come down here and be ready for when we go, just so we can speed things up. A wicks here? No? Uh, Wobble Pong, are you here? Right, if you guys could make your way down here just to get ready, thank you. Um, it's this one. Don't cover the bottom, otherwise it won't hear you. Come, sir. Put your hand up a bit. Come, sir. As in your hand on the microphone. Yeah, don't cover that, otherwise it won't hear you. All right. You're fine. Okay. Looking good? Okay, we ready? Yep, go ahead. Okay. So, for our project, we decided to go with a simple little mini game, kind of inspired of the like Flash games of old. Uh, uh, similar to your like ticket games where orders come in, and also in uh, kind of inspired by the idea of like little testing mini games, and how when you're given a seemingly simple task, but just a little bit of your control is taken away, it can very quickly spiral out of control if you're not careful. So, basic premise: it's factory for a ball of string. Uh, your main character is meant to be a cat. It's not a cat. Ignore that. We'll get to it. Uh, you have no control over the cat's movement. The cat does its own thing. The only thing you can do is shine a laser pointer, which, as Aaron demonstrates, cat pounces towards. Order comes in for a ball of string of a specific color. You need to pull the lever to get a string in, and you then need to maneuver it in front of the paint gun. And then you need to press the right button to get it colored the right way, and you then need to maneuver the string back through to the gate. So as we're seeing now, String in, carefully. The collision's a bit janky, so it might take a little bit of time. No pressure, Aaron. Hold on, hold on. Oh, come on, don't do this to us. Those 24 hours were for nothing. <laughs> it was all a lie. <laughs> Whatever, it'll work eventually. If I don't, if I don't watch it, it'll work. So yeah, uh, we did this all we originally planned to use Pi Game. Uh, we then realized that that was a mistake. Do not use Pi Game, people. Um, so we instead used Godot, which is an open source engine, which is, or Godot, sorry, wait, waiting for Godot, yeah. um, which is becoming more and more popular all the time. Uh, we 
yeah, we were a very reduced team size. We came up with our brainstorming idea very quickly, but it was, yeah, it was a bit of a panic to get it in the like a minimum viable product state. There we go! <laughs> Way! Yes! Beautiful. All right. So that's it. Uh, Aaron, you got anything to say? Um, I say something that um, we could have improved upon was like getting a more clear idea of what was building. So then, because um, we started off with um, using Python, but not everyone had like a clear idea of how to use that, and uh, some people left half like halfway through. So we kind of had to restart, kind of. So. Yeah. Very good. Any questions? Anyone? Yep. Okay. So there's actually a fair few things we wanted to implement. Uh, we wanted a clearer system of what the orders actually look like. We wanted a big queue of orders rather than just order pink, uh, as you can see. We wanted a proper score system. Right now, Nothing actually happens, <laughs> what, w depending on what color you put it in. It's all, it's, all, it's all in your head. So we wanted a proper scoring system, and we also wanted an energy system. The idea behind the laser pointer was uh, you expend energy by getting your cat to move somewhere. You kind of just have to let it wander into an optimal spot and then wait for the right moment to trigger its moments. But we didn't get that far either. But that is, those are the ideas that we had. Those are where we wanted to go forwards. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, so you gave some code saying that you could put together a request. Uh, why did you put that as something that was like easy or like Because it is the one that I had experience with. And I didn't feel like spending a good chunk of my 24 hours frantically digging through Unity tutorials. Well done. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now, lastly, we have Wobble Pong. Is there anyone here who hasn't presented their hack? No? Wonderful. Oh, is it on? Nice. Hello. Um, welcome to Wobble Pong, uh, a game that makes you go wee. Um, right. So, easy. Oh, lovely transition. Um, uncovering the crucial problem we had to solve. This was our God given mission. Um, we are from Royal Holloway's Computing Society, um, and we had we need to come up with drunk games for drunk people to play. Admittedly, this was James' idea. Um, I'll let him take over from here. Um, yeah, so we want games for drunk people to play. Um, I was thinking, you know, balance games would be quite fun, and specifically Wii boards uh, and just Wii games in general, like the theme. Uh, would be pretty good. Uh, they're three pounds from CEX used, which is quite nice. Um, but yeah, so our disruptive innovation, three pounds each. Uh, they're not going to e-waste anymore. They have Bluetooth as well. Doesn't work most of the time, but they do, you know? Uh, yeah, innovation. Wow. Almost as innovative as our sides. So here we go. We have Two balance boards with two e ESP32 microcontrollers. Most of that uh, didn't work. Um, yeah, so that all kind of went out the window. And now we are not using any of that at all. But that was the plan. That's what I spent all of my hack time, hackathon time doing. Uh, yeah, so every kind of C, no holy C. Uh, yeah, but all the rest. We got C, uh, C++ and C Sharp, Unity and um, JavaScripts, although we're not using JavaScript because, again, that didn't work. That was all of the stuff that I did. <laughs> um, yes, I have Asian Laura boards. It shouldn't really matter too much. It's just I spent hours messing around with it because I was told that they were European and they work on different frequencies. Uh, I squared C bus. It just didn't want to work. I thought it would. Uh, yeah, no, didn't want to work. 
and that was pretty annoying. Um, yeah, went on strike. Uh, it's not great. And then you are did work, and then everything broke, so that didn't matter anyway. Uh, and then chips overheating, just quite a few problems. Um, yeah, this was my hackathon experience. Yeah. Uh, uh, James worked very hard on this, so he does deserve credit, um, very much so. Although we're gonna we're gonna play the game, um, we have it hooked up. So we need a volunteer. You can play, but you have to be both people at the same time. So there's a lot to think about. Um, yes, we have some enthusiastic people. Do you want to both both come down? Um, yeah, let's do it quick because they're gonna yeah, they're quickly. gonna need they're gonna need space. Right. Okay. This is the point where it stops working. Okay, how do I make that full screen? I don't actually know. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. All right, you'll notice it makes the wee sound when it hits things. Um, so, yeah. Um, unfortunately, this is what we were talking about. Only one works. So, left and right. If you lean left and right, it does one paddle, and you do forwards and backwards for the other paddle. Oh. Um, so good luck. Shall I start again, or are you good? Yeah. Forward. I think it would be backwards. Oh no, it is forwards. I'm sorry. I don't know how to play my own game. The back, the back little screens are supposed to light up when someone wins a point. Um, all right, let me start again. So we've got a minute left. So any questions while you're playing this? Any questions? Questions? Oh god, yeah, you're right. Um, we, we, we're going to continue making this afterwards, definitely, and definitely take it to our thing. Oh, yes. If What would we do differently if we were to do this again? Do you have any? Um, I would say probably not use Unity. Uh, yeah, just have everything done. Um, yeah. <laughs> Probably, yeah, I don't know what I would have done with the Wii boards. Um, I think I should have learnt more about them before I started this. But I didn't want to start before the hackathon, so, yeah, everything went to shit. There we go. Very good. Very good, guys. Thank you. Okay, so we will resume back here for the closing ceremony at five o'clock. Um, if you can all go and sort of clear your stuff up, put any rubbish away, get everything packed up, um, and then we'll, we'll be back here for five o'clock. Thank you.
Right, another one on this side. Oh God, these presenters get work out, <laughs> don't they? When uh, after hours of our parallax background breaking everything, we finally got the damn rock rendering properly. Any other one? Anyone else? I see another hand. Oh God, can you not like all do it at the same place at the same time? <laughs> the answer will be no. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, I saw a lot of crazy uh, projects. I didn't attend. Uh, I wasn't a hacker myself, but like, I saw a lot of crazy, crazy projects. But like, like the craziest stuff happened is in the midnight. Uh, there was some crazy photos going inside a. Uh, um, the chat and <laughs> that was like rituals and everything. I have no clue what's going on anymore. And oh, oh, the photos. Oh, I, I, mm, the, the, I don't know what team this is, but like there is a team of them just standing on a staircase in a line, and <laughs> it's it's one of the best photos I've seen. Like I absolutely love it because it's so cryptic and also so beautiful. Because it's just like it's a perfect like thing happens at four in the morning. Like there is no other explanation. <laughs> um, anyone else have uh, the hands up? Oh, oh wait, yeah, okay. What? You could. I d it's not connected to a computer. No. Right. Just let's let's experience this together. Shall I come up there? <laughs> oh yeah, I can, I can right. come up there. Come on. Sorry, Joseph. What some opening ceremony ones? Among us. Among us. There is a strange amount of like the same like like pictures for like a while <laughs> um, of just Josh. Oh, there! Oh, oh gosh! Yeah, that's a oh. strange amount. It's all just the oh look, there's me. <laughs> <laughs> Some sharks. Yeah, I love the people with the sharks. Okay, can we have a shark lift? <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is this is nice. This is cute. Bit of fajita going on there. The keyboard. Some uh, strange goings on in the outside underneath the undercroft. <laughs> I it's, these are these are actually amazing. It's very cute. Very very, very it is cute. cute. <laughs> A blahaj just appears on the stream. Okay, <laughs> that is another one of it. Oh, this is the, um, that one. The Turing machine. The Turing machine. Like. I was honestly worried you were going to, like, electrocute yourself the whole time. I mean, uh, like, Josh. Do you think you did? Uh, Josh said a so story to us. like toasting. <laughs> no. Okay. Like, Josh said a, to a story to us. Right? Apparently, you guys just came up to him and said, like, do you have a lighter? And then Josh said, yeah, sure. And then you just said, oh, but what are you going to use the lighter for? We're going to set a fire. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, <laughs> please don't Where set a fire. Where is this? And why are you up a tree? It's <laughs> the tree. <laughs> Did you all have a go driving up here? Some more, like, sketchy. Oh, you've got the, uh, the safety gloves on. Is that a soldering iron? No, no, no. Uh, that, yeah, uh, that's a heat gun. That's a heat gun. Oh, God. From <laughs> pointing at his face, yeah. I am so glad there was no fire as this uh, hackathon. I am so glad. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, this is... Oh, I like it's got a light bulb on the top of it. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, nice. GIF. Oh, here I just it love comes. how there's just pictures of all of you, <laughs> like just outside looking sketchy. Yeah. yeah we really and there's a, there's a, what is the going, why are you climbing? Who is that? <laughs> is that you? No. 
That's it's you. I've got uh, Piers Morgan, and it, apparently it's safe to work. Uh, it's can you play it? <laughs> uh, yeah, you can play it. Try to try to play it through the microphone. Yeah. One of I trust, I trust that man, I trust that man. You've been very, it's been, it, honestly, it's a really good hack, but it's just very sketchy occasionally. <laughs> no, it's not as bad. About the music, I was thinking about the fact that we do different music and that I am not sure if we can still be friends. I still care about you, but... I am not sure if we are on the same page anymore. I mean, you have been doing this for a while, right? I will no longer be able to accept you to come over to my house and play your music. I will not be able to accept you as a friend. <laughs> that was really emotional. Does anyone else have anything they want to share with the crowd about highlights that they had this yeah, weekend? Any highlights? It's fine if not. I know you all don't like talking to each other. Should we carry on with the photos? Yep. Really bad looking photos on here. I'm so sorry. Does anyone have a laptop or anything? Oh. Yeah, that worked, didn't it? It's very dark now. Um, I don't like the fact that I'm on the main point for like a while. Um, this one here. That's yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I can't read it due, due to uh, like like. It terms, the terms and conditions, like it cannot be read out loud. <laughs> what joke? Okay, okay. Don't boo at me after this. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Guys, 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 guys. Listen up, listen up, listen up, listen up. Okay. Why did the skeleton not go to the party? Because he has no body to go with. All right, all right, all right, all right. You know, that, that might have... Um oh, my God. Oh, God. <laughs> all right, while they're going... Um all right. What? What? I can't think of a joke. Um... Oh. Right. Oh. Where did we get to? <laughs> lower, lower, lower. <laughs> better viewing experience. Right. So, we got. <laughs> yeah, um. Oh. <laughs> different angle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just more. Why are you just climbing on everything? No, that's that's the oh picture I'm talking about. Oh my god, look at this. That's a, that's a cryptic one I'm talking about. I feel like they're like, like summoning something this in there. This is so good. <laughs> oh. oh look, there's me me lighting things on fire. <laughs> oh my, too much fire. <laughs> Who bought a hammock? Anton. Yeah. Committee hammock. I'm actually jealous of a hammock. That's a great dinosaur. A lot Honestly, of I've really enjoyed looking at the doodles that you've done on the wall. Coded until his death. <laughs> Oopsie. Oh. Oh, do you know, like between like five and seven in the morning is the best because everyone's just passed out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the amount of Red Bulls and like amount of energy drinks that was consumed today is uh, unethical. Um, unethical. <laughs> so, oh, oh, look at that. There's one al already up there. <laughs> Oh god. I Why hope is guys there just the ground? Touching grass. Touching um. grass, of course. I mean I did tell someone to touch grass, so 
So, good job. Good job, people, for touching You've grass. It's gone really for like the artistic kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Uh, what's your guys' uh, album name? There's what? another one. Cringe? Cringe? Malcolm's Lair. Did you get a picture of Josh asleep? Oh, bless him. Oh. Yep. Tyranny. <laughs> Look, I was on the point where I literally could just sleep on the floor and just like pass out. <laughs> Oh yeah, the trash. <laughs> oh yeah, the the dinosaur one. Yeah, the guy that failed like after like this is the first Peter, one. My poor boy. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm so glad they're not here anymore to see this. Oh, they're there to the Discord channel, don't they? Oh, Fajita's here. Sorry, Fajita. Okay. Wait. This is really meta now. Nice. Oh, my God. Everyone's just taking pictures and descending on it. Does anyone else have any pictures on their camera roll this weekend that they wish to share? <laughs> oh my god. Nice. <laughs> That's a pretty photo. Just a comb. At least someone brought a comb with them. <laughs> oh my god. Is that your be real? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a really nice one of your team. Well, you. <laughs> we are getting there. Wait, who is that? Is that me? Is that Hack Not? Hackaway. Oh. <laughs> Hiding. face right now like that. <laughs> of yourself just so you're like combining all the images. Oh my 
my god. What? Sorry? <laughs> okay. Right. Here's a, here's a bit of I worry about you a lot sometimes. Please <laughs> work. Awesome. Cool. Right. Well done! You've done it! Yes! Oh. Oh, I'm very sorry for the delay. My slides for this got killed during the, pres the presentation, so we've just rebuilt this from scratch. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Particularly, of course, the, the lovely people on my committee that have been doing this with me for months. Our volunteers, dotted around the crowd, stand. Yes, go on. <laughs> oh. And, of course, where on... Sushrika and Holly are somewhere. There's Sushrika. Holly is somewhere. And these guys, of course, as well. And our lovely sponsors from EDF. Unfortunately, Daniel had to go home earlier. And of course, Ian for helping us from the University of Sussex. Yeah, just, just thank all of you. This is this has been amazing. Like, I honestly, I swear, I did not imagine it being anywhere near this. I'm so happy. Now. I got rid of all of the preamble, well I didn't, Windows got rid of all of the preamble when we remade this, so let's go straight to the prizes. So, for the best in-person hack, drum roll please. Cracked FM! Yes! And... Each one of you guys is walking home with an Ender 3 3D printer, a winner's badge from MLH, a fast track to, the fast track to interview for the MLH fellowship scheme. Um, yeah. Do you want to say anything? It's a long walk. <laughs> it's going to be uh, quite a long walk, a few days at least. <laughs> Fantastic. Do you want to grab your printers? Yeah, yeah. Go on. And can we get... Can we get everyone in a line facing our man with the camera? A little bit. Yeah, we can grab those after. Make sure you come to the MLH booth after. Cool. Happy moment to print forever. Uh, right. Oh, that's totally fair. Drop it down there. Yeah, totally. Cool. Now, we also have a runner-up prize for our best in-person hack. Can I get another drum roll? And our runner-up for best in-person hack is... Knuckles! Where are Knuckles? Cool. Now, your prize, you also... Also get the fast track. No. You guys also get a winner's pin. And you will get 50 pound gift vouchers each to wherever on earth you want the gift voucher for. Um, we don't have anything physical to give you because you need to choose them. So, but we would love to have you standing up in a line facing our man with the camera. Maybe cheering, doing a jig. <laughs> stuff like that. I'm just going to... Cool, thank you guys. And now for something that none of you will have seen so far, the people in this room anyway, our best online hack, someone took Game of Life. Oh, oh, mood lighting. Hack Sussex after dark. Oh, we'll live with it. Um, our best online hack, 
we have our life, which is game of life, implemented in R, a language in which you should never play the game. Can we get the applause loud enough for them to hear from? <laughs> We are going to contact you separately to get you your winner's pin, your uh, and your £50 pound gift vouchers each to your team. Now, we also want to have a special mention for something that's very close to a really dear person hat, which is Analog Automata. We have nothing for you, but oh my god, really a, a Turing machine out of a tape recorder? What? Why? Who hurt you? Is that better? Cool. One day I'll learn to hold a mic. Uh, <laughs> now, yeah, applause for Analog Automata. Where are you guys? There you are. Cool. And now, I'll pass over to our guys from EDF here so they can talk about their prize. Let you announce it. Da -dum -dum -dum. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Josh. I'll try to keep up to your energy levels. I do just very quickly want to say a, a massive thank you to the committee for organising the volunteers and, and for having us involved. The, the energy and creativity, it blew our minds, actually. It was really, really amazing. So we're thr thrilled to be associated. Can I, can I thank David, Adrian, Kate, and graduates had to go home as well for, uh, for coming for, for the weekend. Um, for those who entered our, our track, re really, really loved them all. It, it was a difficult choice, but in the end, for, for, sort of for, the, for the creativity and the core of the idea, um, we've chosen coding down with the ship. Um, so, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Gavin, and everyone from EDF. It's been fantastic having you here. Also, I really should have mentioned this. Um, two of the EDF people were also on the judging panel for the main ones that I mentioned. I should have mentioned that before I gave those out. Um, I'm sorry, I've had two and a half non-consecutive hours of sleep over this weekend. Um, so, anyway, <laughs> next, if we have Holly up here to announce Hackiest Hack for the Hackathons UK. Hello. I think when we were, well, we had a discussion about who was going to win this one, and I think we all agreed together that this one should definitely get something. It is... Flip <laughs> Analytica! <laughs> Come grab your blahages. And he walks onto the stage to then immediately... Oh, no, I really forgot we had another one. Cool. We also want to have thanks to the lovely Ian Mackey, who, for those of you who don't know, he is so spectacular in his field that he edits books on the field. We've set aside two for the two teams that we think put the most effort into learning during the hack. These are teams where they have clearly gone out of their way to make sure they left with more knowledge than they came in with. And please don't be too offended by that statement. If, if you did already know the stuff you did, I, I was just wrong. But pretty sure you learned stuff. So, these two teams are Studio Eater and the Trash Playing Yeater. <laughs> Come on down. We do only have two copies, so it's lucky you're solo, because you get one. You guys will have to share. Unfortunately, as Ian did point out, it is made of paper. You can rip it at the seam and just have a third of a book each. And treat it. Or, oh, of course, Eli, yeah. Cool. 
Awesome. Cool. And can we get you guys all together? <laughs> Holding the books up. And say learning. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, guys. And we also have, don't get too comfortable, because I, I know who sent this photo in, the best photo of the hack, which was chosen by Rie and Louis. And Louis, yes. Can I get a drum roll, please, for the best photo in our photos channel? This was fairly early on, but we had to pick it. It's the Blore Hages. And she's gone! <laughs> Can one of you come down and collect in her, in her stead? We couldn't find a big, nice presentation box for a Roche, so we bought like 18 small ones. <laughs> that worked well, because five of us actually took it together. Oh, fantastic. Very nice. That doesn't quite divide, but yes. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And now... Unfortunately, Daniel Greenhead from uh, Electric Square had to leave almost immediately after the people he was judging presented. So I'm doing his prize. The Joy of the Throw from Electric Square, the, the, the game that was, he felt, he really struggled with this one. He was discussing, at one point I feel like he was trying to make me pick for him. This was such a difficult decision. Um, can I get a drum roll for our winner for Joy of the Throw? Flip Analytica, again, yes. You can come down again, but it's another digital e-card prize, so there's nothing to hand you. Um, but you can get your picture in front of the joy of the throw, if you want. Uh, <laughs> Go free. Wait. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I think, I think in the end, it's hard, it's hard to beat a game that actually involves throwing something physically in real life. Um, he also wanted to mention three special mentions on this because in his track description, he had bonus points. He awarded those bonus points to individual teams. You get nothing for this, but he wanted you to know that the cutest mascot was Studio Eater because of course it was. Uh, <laughs> the... Biggest surprise was the trash plane e eater, because of course it was. And you guys were also the most satisfying throw, funnily enough. Um, we are, at some point in the next week, we're gonna try and get Daniel in touch with everyone who was on this track, because he wants to give more detailed feedback to each person that went for this track. Um, and we'll be past contacting you soon about that. One day I'll learn. Well, I'm about to give it away now. Shashrika, who can hold a microphone, is up next with the MLH Sponsor Prizes. This is where you clap. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. It was an awesome weekend. We saw so many interesting hacks. As you can see, there were many prizes, and it was tough to pick the best one. So I'm just going to jump right into the tracks and give you the sponsor prizes for MLH. So we have the first one, which is best domain registered with domain.com. And this particular uh, hack actually got a lot of claps for their domain. So without much ado, I'm just going to tell you what that was. It's website name.tech. <laughs> and the learning that they have was think about a website name before you submit your, like, before your end of submission hack. But even then, I believe this is the most innovative hack uh, a domain name that I've seen. So congratulations. What you get is domain.com backpacks for your team. I know that your team is not entirely present here, but I suppose you have five members, right? So I'm just going to give you two backpacks now, and then just ask them to contact me later. There you go. Congratulations. Awesome. Uh, all right. Next up, we have the most creative use of GitHub. 
And earlier, someone asked me this question that how can you use GitHub more creatively? I mean, it's just a version control system where you're just uploading your code. No, there are multiple ways. And frankly speaking, one project stood out. And that project was Our Life. Now, I know that this is an online project, but we'll give a huge round and cheer for them. So congratulations, Our Life, for winning the most creative use of GitHub. Next, we have the best use of Microsoft Cloud for your community. This particular hack was, uh, and it was a lot of discussion that happened behind this hack because I believe that this particular hack had a lot of ideas that they brought to life, and there were a lot of fun questions that you asked. Now, when I announced this category, you would know what I mean. The winner of best use of Microsoft Cloud for your community is Minecraft Subsystem for Linux. <laughs> Congratulations, you win a LinkedIn premium subscription for 12 months and also an Xbox Game Pass. You can click a picture, but that's something we contact you online for. Yes. <laughs> awesome, congratulations. Next, we have the most creative use of Twilio. It's not the end of all the prizes yet. The most creative use of Twilio is using Twilio APIs to actually create your hacks. And you, got, you folks had so many innovative ways of using this particular hack. So the winner of most creative use of Twilio is SMS Karaoke Thing. <laughs> Congratulations. I have your prize right here. All right. There you go. Congratulations. What you get is a scrunchy. <laughs> and a sticker, but there's also a Game Go console if you like that. Awesome, congratulations. <laughs> Next up, we have the best use of Auth O, and that's uh, one of the most toughest prizes that I have to give out because there were so many great projects again. But the best use of Auth O, is, and the winner of the best use of Auth O is Code Closet. Now, they also are an online uh, online hack that's submitted, so we'll just cheer for them. Congratulations, team, and we'll reach out to you for your prizes. Thank you. I'll give it back to Josh for the rest of the presentation. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sushrika. Cool. So, thank, thank you, and congratulations to all of the people who have won stuff, yeah. even the people that left their what? hand up. There? Are you happy now? Please, 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 yes? Okay, cool, cool, there, okay, I, I did it, I did it. Congratulations to everyone that won prizes or something. Give yourselves and each other a big round of applause. Come on, more than that. Where are the whoops? Woo! Oh. As I said, this has been a fantastic weekend. Wouldn't have happened at all without our lovely sponsors, such as the wonderful EDF. Round of applause for them. And even though they're not here, Electric Square, can we get a round of applause for them? And of course, this lovely university that we are standing in right now, which has also helped us run things, fund things, everything. Ian up there, can we get him a round of applause? And of course, the MTL who are going to be watching this back later to look at how well the footage came through, who will be very annoyed if they can't hear your round of applause. <laughs> Give me a round of applause for eight, did I? Nah. Oh well, I've started, so I'll carry on. And BCS, I, oh, I, 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 and BCS, who, as I mentioned before, if you've not, if you're not a member of BCS. Very good for your career if you become one. I strongly recommend it. Um, round of applause for them as well. <laughs> and of course, we have the lovely Holly and Sashrika from MLH and Hackathons UK. Come on. <laughs> I want to make your hands bleed. <laughs> and of course, one more time, all of you lovely people that have been here, that are sleep deprived, that are barely functioning and alive, that will see this as some fever dream tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for coming along. Thank you to all our volunteers, all of the people who've helped us. Yeah, just thank all of you very much. And that's it. No, it's not. I'm forgetting something. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
and that's when he remembers he has one more slide. Uh, <laughs> first, also, we do all sorts of stuff all throughout the year. We have a CTF team, we do cybersecurity workshops, we have leak coding workshops, which we would love to see you all come along to. And of course, every single Wednesday, we are in the FTL, which many of you will now better know as the social space. Uh, every Wednesday, 6 till 8 for our code socials. We would love to see more of you coming along to that, even if you're not from here, we'd love to see you come. Go on, come down every week from Royal Holloway or from Nottingham, <laughs> just for our socials, I dare you. Um, and, well, you know, if you do, I will go to your Cody Cafe if you come to our socials. Do we have a deal? <laughs> Wednesday, six to eight. Cool, okay, and of course, we will be doing all of this again next year. Thank you all very much. That is the end. I will release you now <laughs> into the wild, I think. Yeah? Cool. Thank you. Yes. Oh. And to all the people on stream. What's that? No. <laughs> oh, we've got to clear up now. Oh, hold it, hold it.